Hey guys, it's Fictions here. What if Naruto was was adopted by Athena and Artemis and became harem god? Movie. It was your usual early morning at Central Park in New York. Nymphs spend the morning preparing their gardens, trees and lake for another day, since they know once the mortals wakes up, most of them will mess up their hard work. At first everything seemed calm well as calm as it can get at night. Then the calmness was interrupted as a snarl ripped out scaring away the night critters of New York. Wood nymphs squeaked as they dropped what they were doing and dove back into the safety of their trees. Lumbering through Central Park was a hellhound the size of a truck, with eyes that looked like holes, and lava dripping out of its mouth and snout. Its tail was slightly wagging behind it, and its claws were burying themselves in the earth from the slightest moment they touched the dirt. It was sniffing the area, looking for its next meal while being on constant alert. It eventually found a young wood nymph looking no younger than a teenager, working on a flower garden around her tree. She didn't pay attention to the hellhound coming closer to her. But did notice when her friends disappeared. Where did everyone go? She asked in a small yet almost squeaky voice. Her pale green eyes flickered around the area searching for her kinsman, but found nothing. That's when she heard a low snarl and froze from her spot. Her eyes widened and bit her lip as the beast came closer to her. The rest of the nymphs watch helplessly, unable to help their friend against the truck size hellhound. Many turned away, not wanting to see the poor nymph's death. At the same time the young scared girl shook with fear as she felt the hellhound's breath over her when it got close enough. She waited for her death from the monster and prayed to her lost god Pan, asking him to protect her flowers. Just then, a figure jumped from a tree down with a six-foot-long celestial bronze katana out as he landed on the hellhound and sliced through the hellhound's neck. The hellhound froze into place as the figure twisted his katana and dug it out. The figure jumped off before the monster disintegrated into monster dust. The wood nymph finally looked in curiosity and stumbled to see the figure as he butted his sword's hilt in his hand and it shrunk down to pen form. The person in front of her looked about 14 wearing a grey-blue sleeveless hoodie with a red whirlpool on the back over a flaming orange t-shirt, grey cargo pants, and black combat boots. He had a pouch full of weapons strapped to his belt and on his neck were two necklaces. One looked like your average necklace with a stone tied to it and the other contained a single bead with a symbol like on his headband in the center with a trident, an owl, and a staff with two snakes wrapped around it around the symbol like a triangle. When the person removed his hood, he revealed to have blonde spiky hair, grey-blue eyes, three lines on each cheek, tanned skin, sharp features, and a blue cloth headband with a celestial bronze plate over his forehead, containing a symbol that looked like a leaf tied around his head. It was Naruto Uzumaki. Grandson of Athena and Hermes, Shinobi from originally from the Elemental Nations, and as of last summer champion of Hestia. You okay? Naruto asked. The nymph was too shocked to answer as she passed out. Naruto caught her before she fell. He scooped her up and carried her to the tree next to the garden the nymph was working on. Naruto saw another nymph watching. Make sure she get back in her tree safe. The nymph nodded. Naruto brushed off some of the dirt. Stupid hellhound. That's the fifth one I found this week, he muttered. Truth was, the hellhounds were only a small portion to what he fought. Lately Naruto fought hellhounds, humanoid cannibals with a single eye called Cyclops, even skeleton warriors. He came to make it his duty to spend every early morning on patrol. If anything good came out of it, Naruto found out the secret to how to use ninjutsu to kill monsters. Like Celestial Bronze, Naruto learned he had to use his jutsus with the right way by knowing where to hit the monster where to hit it. Most importantly Naruto had to know how much chakra and power he had to put behind his jutsus. Stronger the monster the harder it is to kill with a simple jutsus. But it also gave Naruto time to develop his own jutsus. For his 14th birthday, his grandmother Athena sent him copies of scrolls containing some of his father. Minato Namek is also known as the fourth Hokage most powerful jutsu. Naruto also started trying to make small amounts of the Nine Tails Chakra into his Rasengan. Most importantly, he did learn one thing from the monsters. Every monster he faced seemed to be working for the Titan Lord. The last rogue Cyclops Naruto killed was proof of that. All they yell about is how the Crooked One will rise and Search Olympus will fall. It started with Luke, Naruto thought with anger. Last summer he found out his uncle had betrayed Search Olympus including his father and Naruto's grandfather. Hermes, all to work for Kronos. He would have killed Percy too if Naruto wasn't faster than a pit scorpion. Luke's betrayal impacted everyone in camp, but most importantly on Naruto's aunt from his father's side. Annabeth Chase daughter of Athena. Luke and Annabeth used to travel together with a daughter of Zeus. Thalia Grace and was this small happy family. When Thalia sacrificed herself to save them and a satyr named Grover and was turned into a tree, it had an impact on them and not in a good way for Luke. Naruto noticed the sun rising and decided to go home. As much as Naruto liked to patrol for monsters. He had to get ready for school. Naruto jumped from tree to tree until he reached out of the, then started jumping buildings. He wasn't worried about anyone noticing. 
The mystical veil known as the mist covers up anything mortals find strange and abnormal. Naruto landed on the balcony of his apartment, unlocked the sliding door and entered his apartment. Most would find it odd that someone would lock the door to their balcony when they're several floors up. But Naruto didn't want to risk any flying monster from breaking in. Honestly, Naruto didn't even have to worry about forgetting his keys. Being the grandson of Hermes. God of Thieves, Naruto had the ability to manipulate locks and unlock them just by touching them and concentrating. The ability was actually a rare gift among children of Hermes, but for Naruto to have it meant it was possible his mom who was the daughter of Hermes had the same ability. Once inside he Naruto started to gather his school supplies. After he came home Sally helped him get a spot in the same school as Percy at some college prep school called Meriwether. Honestly, Naruto could go to any school in New York. Unlike his friend, Naruto hasn't been kicked out of every school since preschool although he was transferred through so many classes back at the Ninja Academy, but his record in the elemental nations don't count in this world. But Naruto promised Chiron he would keep an eye on Percy and thus attended Meriwether Prep. The thing was, if Naruto's grandmother Athena knew what kind of school that place was, chances were she would have him transfer out of there. Naruto met his grandmother so he knows what Hess talking about. Naruto gathered it in his backpack and slung it to his back. He looked at the clock and found he had time before he had to go to school. Soon after Naruto has his books collected, he fixed himself a bowl of cereal and a breakfast. Naruto stopped when he had a strong sense someone was watching him. Naruto pulled out a celestial bronze kunai he had hidden under the kitchen and turned to throw it when he saw it was Chiron. The activities director and trainer of heroes at Camp Half-Blood and Naruto's former Latin teacher. From the waist down Chiron was a white stallion, but instead of a head and neck, there was a the upper body of a middle-aged man. Tyron, Naruto said putting away his kunai. You scared me. Naruto, my boy. I'm sorry about that. It's good to see you though, Chiron said, I hope you are doing well. I heard from the Council of Cloven Elders of your little antiques the past year. Naruto smiled shyly as he rubbed the back of the head. I was just making sure no monsters cause any harms. Either way, well done, Chiron said. Thanks, Naruto said. So I take it by the look on your face that this is not a social call. You are correct, Naruto. I must ask a difficult task of you, Chiron said. Naruto raised an eyebrow. What is it? I must ask you to keep Percy away from Camp Half-Blood this year, Chiron said. Naruto expected this to be some kind of joke, but judging from Chiron's expression it wasn't. Listen Naruto, this is for Percy's best interest to stay away from camp this year. Things have not been right at camp in the last few months, and I fear it won't be safe for much longer. Chiron what is it? Naruto asked. Chiron sighed deeply and ran a hand through his shaggy hair. That's when Naruto noticed the bags under Chiron's eyes, a few cuts and scrapes, and overall just plain exhaustion. It's Thalia's tree. I fear it been poisoned, Chiron said. Naruto's stomach dropped when he heard that. Even he was aware of the tale of the daughter of Zeus and the tree powered by her spirit that protect the camp. Was it Luke? Naruto asked. Uncertain. But what I do know is that the poison came straight from Tartarus itself, Chiron said. Listen Naruto, I can't tell you too much without stirring up trouble, but please do what I ask. Naruto sighed and rubbed the back of his head. Percy might not go with this you know. He sees the camp as his home. But Naruto sighed, it'll do what I can. That's all I can ask, Chiron said. It'll be sending someone to yours and Percy's school to help keep an eye on things. A sadder. All I can say is she volunteered to do it, Chiron said. Naruto thought for a bit and one person came to his mind. Then Naruto looked at the clock. Ah dang. Sorry Chiron, but I got to cut this message short. I need to go to school, Naruto said. Chiron nodded very well. Naruto said his goodbye and swiped at the iris message, destroying it. Naruto took his backpack and left, but that didn't mean Naruto hasn't considered what Chiron said. In fact, he was angry that someone would do that to Thalia. But right now, if Chiron is concerned about Percy's safety, it means Naruto need to keep his guard up around his friend. Naruto said this once, and hell say it again, if Athena knew what kind of school Meriwether College Prep was, she would have him transfer. It was a progressive school in downtown Manhattan, which means students sit on beanbag chairs instead of a desk, and they don't get grades, and the teachers wear jeans and rock concert t-shirts to work. It's not a bad school for a demigod like Percy as long as they can behave. After all, most demigods were dyslexic and or ADHD, which it makes it hard for them to fit in regular school. But if you were a child of Athena who has expectations from her kids to be wise and hopefully in the future be architects, the school may help them live up to Athena's expectations. The worst part was they had no search control over bullies. They feel the students should be free-spirited, which means, if you want to pick on someone, you most likely can get away from it. Their first class of the day was English. The whole middle school were supposed to read a book called Lord of the Flies, where all these kids get marooned on an island and go psycho. 
For their final exam, Percy's and Naruto's teachers sent them along with the other classes into the breakyard to spend an hour with no adult supervision to see what happened. The difference was that kids in the book at least tried to create order, while the kids in Meriwether started a massive wedgie contest between the 7th and 8th graders, two pebble fight, and a full tackle basketball game led by the school bully Matt Sloan. Sloan wasn't big or strong, but he acted like he was. He had eyes like a pit bull and shaggy black hair and he always dressed in expensive but sloppy clothes, like he wanted everyone to see how little he cared about his family's money. One of his front teeth was chipped from the time he had taken his daddy's Porsche for a joyride and run into a please slow down for children's sign. While Sloan was tormenting students, Naruto and Percy talked about what Chiron told him. Naruto and Percy practically grew close as friends over the two years, especially they found out they were demigods and went on a quest, they always look after each other. Even when Sally grounded Percy from using any weapons in their apartment after destroying a china cabinet with a javelin, Naruto arranged with Sally to let Percy train at his place since it's bad for a demigod to let their skills dulled. It turned out that Sally was already informed and told Percy about it just didn't fill him in the details. Alias tree is poisoned. Percy reacted. SHH. Naruto shushed his friend. Yes, but it might be a good idea to blab it for the whole world to know. Right, sorry it's just why would someone do it? Was it Luke? It looks like it, Naruto said. But it seems without proof, even if Zeus believes us, he will pass it off as Luke acting on his own. Great, first Grover gets kidnapped now this, Percy said. Wait, what about Grover? Naruto asked. Percy didn't have time to respond as they heard Sloane screamed and turned to see what happened. Apparently, Sloane made a mistake of trying to give their friend Tyson a wedgie. Tyson was a homeless big kid standing at six foot with a mop of dirty brown hair, yellow crooked teeth and specks of dirt under his fingernails. Despite how old he looked, Tyson spoke childlike, as if he was still a child at heart and mind. He joined after Christmas due to a sponsorship program that helps the less fortunate. When he first arrived, Tyson immediately took a liking to Percy and Naruto. However, Naruto knew what Tyson was the day he met. Tyson wasn't human, but rather a baby cyclops, from what Naruto could guess, with a single calf brown eye in the center of his head. At first Naruto was cautious, but over time Naruto came to accept that Tyson wasn't like the Cyclops he had to kill, but rather a friendly kid who is skilled with his hands. Naruto would think Tyson could make it as a forger in the forges of the Cyclops. The problem was that Percy has yet realized it. Percy was still fooled by the mist into thinking Tyson was your basic childlike teenager. At first Percy's mom, Sally who as it turns out was one of the few mortals who could see through the mist wanted to tell Percy, but Naruto told her not to, that Percy really need to start recognizing this kind of stuff. Instead, Sally decided to take Tyson in after not being able to get someone to help him. Anyway, from what Percy and Naruto could guess, Matt Sloan snuck up behind Tyson and tried to give him a wedgie. Tyson must have panicked and swatted Sloan a little too hard cause Sloan was tangled in the little kid's tire swing. You freak. Sloan yelled. Why don't you go back to your cardboard box? Tyson started sobbing. He sat down on the jungle gym so hard he bent the bar and buried his head in his hands. Take it back Sloan. Naruto yelled. Sloan just sneered at Naruto. Why do you and Jackson even bother, Yuzumaki? You two might have friends if you weren't always sticking up for that freak. Hess not a freak, Percy yelled, Hess just different. Sloan wasn't listening. He and his big ugly friends were too busy laughing. The oddest part was that Naruto sworn Sloan had more goons hanging around him than usual like a dozen more. Just wait till P. Jackson, Sloan called. You are so dead. Of course Sloan didn't direct the threat to Naruto. If there was one class Naruto excelled at most in Meriwether, it was P. Even on dodgeball day, Naruto always find a way to humiliate Sloan. Most people were scared of Sloan in the schoolyard, but in the gym, most with common sense won't go against Naruto. When first period ended, their English teacher, Mr. DeMilo, came outside to inspect the carnage. He pronounced that they'd understood Lord of the Flies perfectly and passed everyone, saying they should never grow up to be violent people. If you don't want us to be violent, then you should enforce rules against bullies, Naruto thought. Percy had to promise to buy Tyson an extra peanut butter sandwich at lunch to get him sobbing. I am a freak. Tyson asked. No, Percy promised. Matt Sloan is the freak. Yeah, a freak with a big ego, Naruto said. Tyson sniffled. You guys are a good friend. Percy, you think your mom will let me stay even if I can't attend next year? His voice trembled. Percy and Naruto look at each other and had the same thought. Tyson didn't know if he'd be invited next year for the community service project. Or if the Olympians would accept him, Naruto thought. Don't worry, big guy, Percy managed. I'm sure mom would be happy to accept you. Tyson gave Percy a grateful look. Their next exam was science. Mrs. Tesla told them that they had to mix chemicals until they succeeded in making something explode. 
Percy and Tyson, who were partnered up, were the first to succeed when Tyson accidentally knocked a tray of chemicals off the counter and made an orange mushroom cloud in the trash can. After Mrs. Tesla evacuated the lab and called the hazardous waste removal squad, she praised Percy and Tyson for being natural chemists. They were the first ones who ever aced their exam in 30 seconds. Once the hazardous waste removal squad was done and the exam continued, Naruto was the second one by taking advantage of the exam, make a homemade smoke bomb. After he was done, Naruto made notes of the stuff he used and wanted to check with Annabeth or Beckendorf back at camp to contain it in a jar. Next exams as social studies, where they had to draw latitudes and longitudes maps. Naruto noticed that Percy opened his notebook and smirked. It was no secret that Percy kept a photo of their friend in Naruto's paternal aunt, Annabeth during her vacation in Washington, D.C. From what Naruto heard it was the trip reward for making it past the winter break with her dad. Most might not think Naruto and Annabeth were related unless you look at the two of them together. Both Naruto and Annabeth had blonde hair, although Annabeth's is curly at the end like a princess, and both have matching tanned skin. Percy Walden admitted, but he had a crush on Annabeth, and Naruto know Annabeth possibly feels the same. Naruto remembered what Percy said about Grover being kidnapped or, rather what he didn't say. Percy and Naruto were both Grover's second chance after what happened Thalia, and they became friends. They even worked together with Annabeth to stop a three-way World War III. Last July Grover left to follow his dream to find Lord Pan. Lord of the Wild. Lord Pan disappeared years ago, and Satter's been looking for him since. However, no Satter has ever come back from the mission. So to hear Grover was kidnapped made Naruto worried for the half-goat friend. Maybe Percy saw it in a dream, Naruto thought, it won't be the first time our dreams took different routes. Ever since Percy and Naruto found out they were demigods, they would have the same dreams. However, every now and then, Naruto's dreams either starts or ends differently than Percy's. Hey. Naruto heard Percy protested. Naruto turned to see that Matt Sloan had taken Percy's picture out of his notebook. Sloan checked out the picture and his eyes got wide. No way Jackson. Who is that? She is not your. Sloan handed the photo to his buddies. Naruto noticed the new ones were wearing those high. My name is. Name tags from the office and guessed they were new kids visiting. Although Naruto found it odd with some of the names. Mero Sucker, Skull Eater, and Joe Bob. These guys are moving here next year, Sloan bragged. I bet they can pay tuition, too, unlike your retard friend. Hess not retarded. Percy argued. It was true. Even for a baby Cyclops Naruto knew Tyson was actually pretty smart. They are such a loser Jackson. I don't care if Yuzumaki is on your team, with these guys, we can beat you guys and put you out your misery once next period, Sloan bragged. One of Sloan's buddies shoot up Percy's photo. The bell rang and Percy and Tyson got ready to leave. Naruto was about to leave with his friends when he saw a shimmer of air at the window next to Percy's seat. To a normal person, someone might think it was some weird heat wave in one spot and part of their imagination, but Naruto remember what Chiron said about backup. So she did come here, Naruto thought with a smirk. Everyone headed to gym though before Naruto could react. Everyone was excited since their coach promised a free for all dodgeball game, which means the annual Team Naruto vs Team Sloan, since those two always ended up team captains. The gym uniform at Meriwether is sky blue shorts and tie dye t shirts that make them look like hippies. Naruto waited back until he, Percy, and Tyson were the only ones. The reason was that Naruto decided to use a bit of transformation to make his clothes match the Meriwether's uniform. After figuring out how to use the transformation jutsu to change minor physical features, Naruto started developing a transformation jutsu that disguises his own clothes, that way if he ever need his gear, he can just reverse the gear. Naruto been using gym class as an excuse to try out his new jutsu, and so far Percy was the only one who knew about it. Percy Walden admitted, but he was now jealous of his friend because now Naruto all have to do is reverse the jutsu, and he was back to wearing his normal clothes. Percy was keeping watch out for Tyson as he changed in the weight room. Tyson been self-conscious about how people see him, and he had scars on his back that looked like a monster tried to take a chunk of him. Naruto knew most monsters were scared of Cyclops, since most of them are half-gods and half-nature spirits and are powerful, but there are monsters out there that would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a baby Cyclops and kill one. Anyways, after Tyson was dressed they got into the gym. Coach Nunley was sitting at his little desk reading Sports Illustrated. Nunley was old enough that he should be retired years ago. He had bifocals on and no teeth and greasy wave of gray hair and needs a hearing aid at full blast to hear, and that's when he wanted to hear. Coach, can I be captain? Matt Sloan asked. Me too. Naruto requested. Naruto learned a long time ago if he didn't volunteer to be captain, Matt would pick some nerdy, geeky, or least popular student to be the other team captain. But if Naruto was team captain then at least his team would get some decent players, since no one wants to play against a kid who once lasted a whole game without getting out and took out the other team. Eh? Coach Nunley looked up from his magazine. Yeah, he mumbled. 
mm -hmm. It ended up being a power struggle between who gets what. Naruto managed to get half of the jocks and the popular kids on his team, as well as Percy Tyson, Corey Baylor, the computer geek, Raj Mandali the calculator and a bunch of other kids that were always teased by Sloane. Sloane got all of the other half along with the visitors. Each of the visitors were almost as tall and strong looking as Tyson, and there were six of them. Matt Sloane spilled a cage full of balls in the middle of the gym. Scared, Tyson mumbled. Smell funny. Percy and Naruto looked at him. What smells funny? Percy asked. Them? Tyson pointed at Sloane's new friends. Smell funny. A shiver went down Naruto's back. Naruto knew Cyclops had super sense of smell, Tyson was no exception. The visitors were cracking their knuckles, eyeing them like it was slaughter time, and it didn't ease Naruto one bit. Sloane blew the coach's whistle and the game began. Naruto lead the jocks to the balls, and each grabbed two balls each to pass to the popular kids on their team, while Sloane's team went all in. The geeks and nerds hit as expected. Raj Mandali yelled something in Urdu and ran for the exit. Corey Baylor tried to crawl behind a wall mat and hide. Percy wasn't so lucky as a ball hit him in the gut so hard it sent him skidding back. Naruto took his ball through it and hit a jock hard that it almost knocked the wind out of him. Naruto ducked and rolled as a dodgeball whistled past his head at the speed of sound. Percy dodged his ball as well as both hit the wall mat, and Corey Baylor yelped, Hey. Percy yelled at Sloane's team. You could kill somebody. I think that's the point, Naruto said. What? The visitor named Joe Bob grinned evilly as he seemed to grow bigger and taller. His biceps bulged beneath his t-shirt. I hope so Perseus Jackson. I hope so. That's when it dawned to Percy what Naruto meant. All the visitors were growing in size. They were no longer the size of kids. They were eight-foot-tall giants with wild eyes, pointy teeth, and hairy arms tattooed with snakes and hula women and valentine hearts. Matt Sloan dropped his ball. Whoa. You're not from Detroit. Who? Soon enough all the students from both teams started screaming and backing toward the exit, but the giant named Marrow Sucker threw a ball with deadly accuracy. It streaked past Raj Mandali just as he was about to leave and hit the door, slamming it shut. Raj and some other kids banged on it desperately, but the doors won't budge. Let them go. Percy yelled. Though Bob growled. And lose our tasty morsels. No, son of the sea god. We Lastergonians are and just playing for your death. We want lunch. What? Lastergonian giants, Naruto said. They're northern cannibalistic giants. Though Bob waved his hand, and a new batch of dodgeballs appeared on the center line but they weren't made of red rubber. They were bronze the size of cannonballs, perforated like wiffle balls with fire bubbling out the holes, but the giants didn't seem affected by it. While this was going on, Nunley wasn't even paying attention. Shoot. Percy, get back. Naruto yelled as he made the hand sign and reverse his jutsu. In a puff of smoke Naruto was wearing his normal clothes. The giant named Skull Eater threw the ball. Percy dodged it, but it came at Cory at the mat wall. Thankfully Tyson saved him from what would have been a fatal blow. Meanwhile the class was running for the locker room, but with another wave of Joe Bob's hand, that door also slammed shut. No one leaves unless you are out. Joe Bob roared. And you are not out until we eat you. He launched his own fireballs, but Naruto caught the ball barehanded without feeling the flames. Then Naruto took aim, focus wind charka into the ball, causing the flames to grow as he threw it at one of the giants. It hit and exploded causing the giant to disintegrate it. No. My search brother. Joe Bob yelled. Yar dead Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto, how Percy said. Lady Hestia blessing apparently came with immunity to fire, Naruto explained. Naruto took out his pen Yuzushio no Larashi and clicked the button. His katana grew out in full length. The other giant started going after Percy, who was unarmed due the school gym uniform didn't have pockets. Tyson jumped in the way and caught both of them and sent them hurtling back toward their surprised owners, who screamed, buy it. As the bronze spheres exploded against their chest and they disintegrated into two twin columns of flame. You will pay for their destruction. Joe Bob yelled. You will all pay. Tyson. Look out. Percy said. Another comet came hurtled toward them. Tyson just had time to swat it aside. It flew straight over Coach Nunley's head then landed in the bleachers with a huge kaboom. Kids were running all over the place trying to find a way out of there. Sloane himself stood petrified in the middle of the court, watching in disbelief as balls of death flew around them. Coach Nunley still wasn't seeing anything. He tapped his hearing aid like the explosions were giving him interference, but he kept his eyes on his magazine. Seriously? How is this guy still a teacher? Naruto thought. Victory will be ours. Roared Joe Bob the cannibal. We will feast on your bones. He hefted another ball along with three other giants who followed his lead. At this point Percy started running toward the gym doors, yelling at the kids to get out of the way. Percy what Naruto didn't have time to ask as the three remaining giants threw their balls at them. Naruto duck and dodge one that was aimed at him, causing the ball to hit the ground and exploded. 
the second one came at Percy, who dodged at the last minute causing the fiery sphere to demolish the locker room door followed by a huge wooom. The wall blew apart. Locker doors, socks, athletic supporters, and other various nasty personal belongings rained all over the gym. Meanwhile Tyson took out the third one by swatting a blazing ball at the third giant, destroying it. Naruto made the hand sign and shouted, multi-shadow clone jutsu. Multiple shadow clones appeared, and they all moved in with their katanas sharpened with wind chakra and ready. Each clone slashed at the giant called Skull Eater all over its body while shouting, Naruto. Naruto moved in for the final strike. Uzumaki wind sharp katana barrage. Naruto sliced through the neck of the giant's neck area. The giant dropped to his knees before disintegrating it, leaving the giant called Joe Bob, who summoned a new bowl ready to throw at Naruto. Naruto, look out. Percy yelled. Naruto look up, but Joe Bob didn't attack. Instead, his body went rigid as his expression was now surprise. Right where his belly button should have been, his t-shirt ripped open by a glowing tip of a blade. The ball dropped out of his hand. The monster stared down at the tip of the knife and muttered, ow, before bursting into a cloud of green flame. Standing in the smoke was no other than Annabeth. Her face was grimy and scratched. She had a ragged backpack slung over her shoulder, her baseball cap tucked in her pocket, a bronze knife in her hand, and a wild look in her stormy gray eyes. Matt Sloan was still standing there dumbfounded finally came to his senses. He blinked at Annabeth, recognizing her from Percy's picture. That's the girl that's the girl. Annabeth punched him in the nose and knocked him flat. And you, she told him, lay off my friend and my nephew. Him getting this feeling she'd been wanting to do that for hours, Naruto thought with a smirk as he butted his sword's hit in his hand, causing it to shrink down to a pen. The gym was in flames. Kids were still running around screaming. Sirens were wailing and a garbled voice came on in the intercom. Through the glass windows of the exit doors, the headmaster, Mr. Bonsai, was wrestling with a lock, a crowd of teachers piling up behind him. Annabeth how did you how long have you Percy stammered. Pretty much all morning. She sheathed her bronze knife. I've been trying to find a good time to talk to you or Naruto, but you two are always around people. I thought that shimmer of air outside the lab was you, Naruto said. So that means you were the one Chiron told me was coming to help us. Annabeth nodded. By the way, Naruto, nice move there. Thanks. I had a lot of practice this year, you know, Naruto said rubbing the back of his head. When Naruto said that, Annabeth cold and helped but stared at Tyson who was still alive and doing well. How is that alive? Annabeth thought. Wait a second. Percy said in realization, the shadow I saw this morning that was Percy starting to turn red. Oh my gods, you were looking in my bedroom to explain. Annabeth looked red in the face herself. Oh wow, Annabeth, I didn't think you have it in you, Naruto laughed. Shut up. Annabeth snapped. I just didn't want to, there. A woman screamed. The doors burst open and the adults came pouring in. Meet me outside, Annabeth told them. And him. She pointed at Tyson while giving him a distasteful look. You better bring him. What? No time. She said. Hurry. She put on her Yankees baseball cap that turned her invisible, leaving Naruto Percy and Tyson standing in confusion in the middle of the gymnasium when their headmaster came charging in with half of the faculty and a couple of police officers. Percy Jackson. Naruto Uzumaki. Mr. Bonsai said. What how? At this point Matt Sloan was coming around, too. He focused on Naruto and Percy in terror. Percy and Naruto did it, Mr. Bonsai. Both of them set the whole building on fire. Coach Nunley will tell you. He saw it all. Coach Nunley had been dutifully reading his magazine, but he chose that moment to look up with Sloan said his name. A. Yeah. Mm hmm. Seriously, how is that guy still a teacher? Naruto thought. The other adults turned to the two boys. Naruto knew they need an opening, so he did the one thing that came natural. He picked up a dodgeball a normal one that wasn't destroyed and threw it with all his might. It hit Matt square in the face, causing a disturbing crunch noise as he was knocked out yet again. Suddenly the adults turned to Sloane who was on the ground unconscious with a bloody nose that was far off worse than when Annabeth punched him. Let's go. Naruto told Percy. Percy didn't need to be told twice as he ran to his ruined jeans, told Tyson come on. And the three of them left through the gapping hole caused by the explosion earlier. Annabeth was waiting for them in an alley down Church Street. She pulled Tyson and Percy off the sidewalk while Naruto hit as a fire truck streamed past, heading for Meriwether Prep. Where'd you find him? She demanded as she pointed at Tyson. That's my friend, Percy told her while gritting his teeth. Annabeth stared at him in disbelief before turning to Naruto. How could you let this happen? I thought you were supposed to be watching over Percy. I have been. Naruto argued, believe it, Tyson won't be here if he was a threat. Annabeth muttered in ancient Greek which Naruto understood as her complaining about him being too trusting and not trusting Cyclops. Over the past few months, Naruto didn't only work on his ninja and hero training, but also had his shadow clones studied up on speaking Greek. Is he homeless? 
Annabeth finally asked in English. What does that have to do with anything? Percy asked. He can hear you, you know. Why don't you ask him? She looked surprised. He can talk. I talk, Tyson admitted. You're pretty. Ah. Gross. Annabeth stepped away from him. Naruto decided to bring this conversation to Greek while Percy examined Tyson. Annabeth, Tyson isn't like the others. He's kind and gentle, Naruto said. Gentle? You mean like how he swatted that bully into a swing set? Annabeth asked or caused that chemical explosion in your lab class. Okay so Tyson doesn't know his own strength yet, but he's still young, Naruto stated. But he hasn't killed any mortals or demigods and he means no harm. That doesn't mean he won't when he's older, Annabeth said. Naruto sighed. I really was hoping to not use this card, Annabeth, but forced my hand. You shouldn't go judging people for what they are. Especially not in front of a Jinchuriki like me who went through what you're putting Tyson through. And the only reason I turned out okay was because I found people who cared for me long before Athena and Hermes brought me to this world. Annabeth was taken back by what Naruto said. She knew Naruto didn't like to talk about being a Jinchuriki. Last summer she and Percy managed to break through Naruto's wall with the subject and they found out the Fine, it'll give him a chance. That's all I ask, Naruto said. Meanwhile Percy was staring at the two like he just got caught between an argument. Why are you two speaking about Tyson and me in ancient Greek like we're not here? Percy asked. And what do you mean by others? Don't worry about it, Naruto said. Honestly, I'm surprised the Lacedagonians had the guys to attack you with him around, Annabeth said while smacking Tyson's hand away as he tried to touch her hair. Annabeth Naruto warned. Lastry what? Percy interrupted. Lacedagonians, Percy. I told you that name back in the gym, Naruto stated. Okay Percy said still loss. Annabeth took over. They're a race of giant cannibals who live in the far north. Odysseus ran into them once, but I've never seen them as far south as New York before. Lastry I can't even say that. What do you call them in English? Annabeth thought about it for a moment. Canadians, she said. Wow. I bet the Canadian mortal locals won't like that. Naruto said. Come on, Annabeth said. We have to get out of here. The policel be after me, Percy said. That's the least of our problems, she said. Have you been having the dreams? The dreams about Grover? Percy asked. Their face turned pale. Grover. No, what about Grover? Percy told her his dream. Annabeth frowned and turned to Naruto, and you haven't had the same dream? Nope. I was as shocked to hear it at first as you are now, Naruto said. Does this have to do with Thalia's tree? Percy asked. I don't know, Annabeth said trying to hide the worriedness in her voice. But we have to get to camp right away. Monsters have been chasing me all the way from Virginia, trying to stop me. Have you had any attacks? Percy shook his head. Today was the first for me. Not me. I've been slaying monsters every morning before school, Naruto said. Just this morning I interrupted a hellhound that was about to have a dried for breakfast. Tyson raised his hand. Canadians in the gym called Percy something son of the sea god. Annabeth Percy and Naruto exchange looks. Big guy, Percy said. You ever hear those old stories about the Greek gods? Like Zeus, Poseidon, Athena, Hermes. Yes, Tyson said. Well those gods are still alive. They kind of follow western civilization around living in the strongest countries, so like now they're in the US. And sometimes they have kids with mortals. Kids called half-bloods. Yes, Tyson said. Uh, well, Annabeth and I are half-bloods, Percy said. We're like heroes in training. And whenever monsters pick up our scent, they attack us. That's what those giants were in the gym. Monsters. What about Naruto? Tyson asked. I'm a special breed of demigod, my friend, Naruto said. See my dad and mom were both half-bloods, dad being the son of Athena, mom being a daughter of Hermes, and they had me, their legacy. Im also just so happened to be the chosen champion of Hestia too, which gives me other powers. Like those copies of you, Tyson said. Ah yes, well those are different. Naruto ended up telling Tyson about the elemental nations and how he was raised there before being brought to this world. Needless to say, Tyson was excited. Is that why you can create copies of yourself? Yes. And how you change your clothes so quickly. Naruto cleared his throat. Uh, yeah, that was actually a result of a jutsu I've been working on. So Percy interrupted. You believe us? Tyson nodded. But you are son of the sea god. Yeah, Percy admitted. My dad is Poseidon. Tyson frowned as he was now confused. But then. A siren wailed. A police car raced past their alley. We don't have time for this, Annabeth said. Well talk in the taxi. The taxi all the way to camp. Percy said. You know how much that would cost. And I bet Naruto's trust fund would be under investigation again. That's right, Naruto said. Just trust me, Annabeth said. What about Tyson? Percy asked. We can't just leave him. He'll be in trouble, too. That's right. Naruto agreed. Well take him, Annabeth said grimly, now come on. 
Naruto, Percy and Tyson followed her down the alleyway, through the side streets of downtown, while a huge column of smoke billowed behind them from the school's gymnasium. Here. Annabeth stopped at the corner of Thomas and Trimble. She fished around her backpack. Too bad the authorities will most likely search for us out our apartments, Naruto said. You and Tyson need to change clothes. Don't remind me, Percy muttered. Pound one. Thank the gods. Annabeth pulled out a gold coin Percy and Naruto recognized as a drachma, the currency of Mount Search Olympus. It had Zeus likeness stamped on one side and the Empire State Building on the other. Annabeth, Percy said, New York taxi drivers won't take that. Stethi, she shouted in ancient Greek. Oh Harma Diabols. As expected Percy and Naruto understood it immediately as. Stop, chariot of damnation. That didn't make Percy feel better about this. Annabeth threw her coin into the street, but instead of clattering on the asphalt, the drachma sank right through and disappeared. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, where the coin had melted, the asphalt darkened. It melted into a rectangular pool about the size of a parking space bubbling red liquid like blood. THN a car erupted from the ooze. It was a smoky gray taxi that literally looked like it was woven out of smoke, like you could walk right through it. There were words printed on the door that looked like to Percy and Naruto. Gyre ssires due to their dyslexia. The passenger window rolled down, and an old woman stuck her head out. She had a mop of grizzled hair covering her eyes, and she spoke in a weird mumbling way, like she had just had a shot of Novocaine. Passage. Passage. Port to Camp Half-Blood, Annabeth said. She opened the cab's back door and waved Percy and Naruto to get in as if it was perfectly normal. Atch. The old woman screeched. We don't take his kind. She pointed a bony finger at Tyson. I got this, Naruto said. He reached into the pocket of his hoodie where he kept a basic seal holding his drachmas. Naruto unsealed it and took out three drachma. He handed them to the lady. Here, extra pay to give Tyson a ride. Done. The woman screamed. The four of them managed to squeeze into the cab, which grew inside to fit all four of them without changing the shape of the cab from the outside. The interior was also smoky gray and yet solid enough to hold all of them. The seat was cracked and lumpy, which wasn't much different than most taxis. There was no plexiglass screen separating them from the driver. And instead of one old lady driving up front there were three, all crammed in the front seat, each with stringy hair covering their eyes, bony hands, and a charcoal-colored sackcloth dress. The one driving said, Long Island out of Metro Fair bonus. Ha. She floored the accelerator and Percy's and Naruto's head slammed against a backrest. A pre-recorded voice came on over the speaker. Hi, this is Ganymed, cupbearer to Zeus, and when I'm not buying wine for the Lord of the Skies, I always buckle up. Naruto noticed that the seat belts were black chains and decided to use Chakra instead to keep him in place. The cab sped around the corner of West Broadway and the gray lady sitting in the middle screeched, look out. Go left. Well, if you'd give me the eye, Tempest, I could see that. The driver complained. The driver swerved to avoid an oncoming delivery truck, ran over the curb with a jaw rattling thump and flew into the next block. Wasp. The third lady said to the driver. Give me the coins. I want to bite it. You bit it last time, anger said the driver named Wasp. It's my turn. Is not. Yelled Anger. The middle one named Tempest screamed, red light. Break. Yelled Anger. Instead, Wasp floored the accelerator and rode up on the curb, screeching around another corner and knocking over a newspaper box. Around then, Naruto recognized the name. Anger, Wasp, Tempest Yar the Grey Sisters. Boo. Percy asked jumping up and down on his seat with each bump. Three wise old ladies they once helped your namesake with his quest and served Jason of the Argonauts for his, Naruto said between each thump. But the taxi cab? Percy asked. Not always, Anger said. Can you see? No. Screamed Wasp. No screamed Tempest. Of course. Screamed Anger. They share one eye, Naruto remembered. Next to Percy, Tyson groaned and grabbed the seat. Not feeling so good. Not good, Naruto said as he and Percy seen Tyson get carsick on school field trips and it wasn't a pleasant experience. Hang in there, big guy, Percy said. Anybody got a garbage bag or something? The Grey sisters were too busy squabbling to pay Percy much attention. Percy looked over at Annabeth, who decided to use Naruto to hold onto, since he was sitting next to her and using Chakra to stick to his seat. Percy gave her a why did you do this to me look. Hey, she said, Grey sisters taxi is the fastest way to camp. Then why didn't you take it from Virginia? Or use them to go to LA last summer? Percy asked. Those are outside their service area, Annabeth said, as if it should be obviously. They only serve greater New York and surrounding communities. Give me the tooth. Anger tried to grab at Wasp's mouth, but Wasp swatted her hand away. Only if Tempest gives me the eye. No. Tempest screeched. You had it yesterday. But I'm driving, you old hag. Why don't the one with the eye drive? Naruto asked. Because she drove yesterday. Said Wasp. Excuses. Turn. 
that was your turn. Boss swerved hard onto Delancey Street, squishing them together. She punched the gas and they shot up the Williamsburg Bridge at 70 miles an hour. The three sisters were now fighting for real as they kept slapping and grabbing at each other. At that point Percy noticed that Wasp was the only one with a tooth and most of the sisters' eyelids were sunken and closed, except for Anger who had a bloodshot green eye. Finally Anger, who had the advantage of sight, managed to yank the tooth out of her sister Wasp's mouth. This made Wasp so mad she swerved toward the edge of the Williamsburg Bridge, yelling, I've it back. I've it back. Tyson groaned and clutched his stomach. Uh, if anybody's interested, Percy said, we're going to die. Don't worry, Annabeth told him, the Grey sisters know what they're doing. They're very wise. It was hard for Percy to believe at this point, since they were now skimming along the edge of 130 feet above the East River. Yes, wise. Anger grinned in the rearview mirror, showing off her newly acquired tooth. We know things. Every street in Manhattan. Wasp bragged, still hitting her sister. The capital of Naples. The name of an old female friend of that male blonde there who's waiting for him back in camp, Anger continued. Wait what? Naruto responded. And the location you seek. Tempest added. Immediately Anger and Wasp started pummeling Tempest from either side, screaming, be quiet. Be quiet. He didn't even ask yet. What? Percy said. What location? I'm not seeking any. Nothing. Tempest said. You're right, boy. It's nothing. Tell me. No. They all screamed. The last time we told, it was horrible. Tempest said. I tossed in the lake. Anger agreed. Beers to find it again. Wasp moaned. And speaking of that give it back. No. Yelled Anger. I. Wasp yelled. Gim. She whacked her sister Anger on the back. There was a sickening pop and something flew out of Anger's face. Anger fumbled for it, trying to catch it, but she only managed to bat it with the back of her hand. The slimy green orb sailed over her shoulder, into the back seat, and straight into Percy's lap. Percy jumped so hard, he hit his head on the ceiling as the eyeball rolled away. I can't see. All three sisters yelled. Give me the eye. Wasp wailed. Give her the eye. Annabeth screamed. I don't have it. Percy said. There, by your foot, Annabeth said. Don't step on it. Get it. I'm not picking that up. The taxi slammed against the guardrail and skidded along with a horrible grinding noise. The whole car shuddered, billowing gray smoke as if it were about to dissolve from the strain. Going to be sick. Annabeth, Percy yelled. Let Tyson use your backpack. Are you crazy? Get the eye. He'll get it. Naruto responded. Just make sure Tyson doesn't puke on me. Naruto kneeled down for the eyeball. However, Wasp made a difficulty when she yanked the wheel, and the taxi swerved away from the rail, sending Naruto face first into the floorboard without squishing the eye. They hurtled down the bridge toward Brooklyn, going faster than any human taxi. The Grey sisters started screeching and pummeling each other again, this time crying out for their eye. That it boy. All three cried. Naruto groaned as he tried to raise himself up mumbling about stupid magical taxi cabs. Naruto managed to pick up the eye, trying to ignore the grossness of it. Nice boy. Anger cried, as if she somehow knew Naruto had her missing peeper. Give it back. Naruto realized this might be their chance to find out what they need to know. Not unless you tell Percy what you mean. Naruto asked. What were you talking about, the location he seek? No time. Tempest cried. Accelerating. Sure enough they accelerated out of Brooklyn into Long Island. Naruto, Annabeth warned, they can't find our destination without the eye. They'll just keep accelerating until we break into a million pieces. But Naruto is right, Percy said. Now tell us. No. Then how about I toss your eye into oncoming traffic? Naruto asked reaching to open the window. Wait. The Grey sisters screamed. 30, 31, 75, 12. What do you mean? Percy asked. That makes no sense. 30, 31, 75, 12. Anger wailed. That's all we can tell you. What about what you said about a friend of mine? Naruto asked. The owl find out when you get to camp. Anger said, now give us the eye. Almost to camp. They were off the highway now, zipping through the countryside of northern Long Island. Naruto natural sense of directions told him that the Grey sisters were right, they were near the road next to Half Blood Hill. Fine. Naruto tossed the eye into Wasp's lap. The old lady snatched it up and pushed it into her eye socket like it was contact lens. She then slammed on the brakes. The taxi spun four or five times in a cloud of smoke and squealed to a halt in the middle of the farm road at the base of Half Blood Hill. Hold on, I still need to know what those numbers mean, Percy said. No time. Annabeth opened her door. We have to get out now. Percy and Naruto looked out the window and saw why. At the crest of the hill a group of campers were fighting two bronze robotic bulls. Even after a year since their battle with the Minotaur, Naruto and Percy haven't quite gotten over their anger toward mythical bull-based creatures. So to find two mechanical bronze fire-breathing bulls the size of elephants, attacking a group of campers, was naturally worse for them. 
As soon as they exited the taxi, the Gray sisters peeled out, heading back to New York, where life was safer, leaving the four of them at the side of the road with nothing. But what they came with which for Naruto, Percy and Tyson, was just the clothes on their back and Percy's and Naruto's weapons. Oh, man, Annabeth said, looking at the battle raging on the hill. The bulls were fighting ten heroes in full battle armor, who were getting their bronze-plated booties whooped. But the worst part was that some of the bulls were able to pass the pine tree that held Thalia's spirit, that should have been empowering magical barriers that normally keep monsters out. One of the heroes shouted, Border Patrol, to me. A girl's voice gruff and familiar. That's Clarice, Annabeth said. Come on, we have to help her. Right, Naruto said. Percy looked like he wanted to protest against helping Clarice, but nodded in agreement. Naruto cold blamed Percy for wanting to disagree though. Clarice was the camp bully. First time she met Percy, she tried to dunk his head into a toilet. Heck, she was about to do the same to Naruto when they met, but Naruto proven too much of a fighter to let Clarice catch him off guard to do so. Plus, there was the fact that Clarice was the daughter of Percy's and Naruto's least favorite god Ares. After their battle over the search god of war, most of Ares' kids hated them for humiliating their dad. But right now wasn't the time to be picky. Clarice was in trouble. Her fellow warriors were scattering, running in panic as the bulls charged. The grass was burning in huge swathes around Thalia's tree. One hero screamed and waved his arms as he ran in circles with his horsehair plume on his helmet on fire. Clarice's own armor was charred. She was fighting with a broken spear shaft, the other end embedded uselessly in the metal joint of one bull's joint shoulder. Percy uncapped his pen, causing it to grow longer and heavier, until he held the bronze sword Anaclusmos in his hands. Tyson, stay here. I don't want you taking any more chances. No. Annabeth said. We need him. That's mortal. He got lucky with dodgeballs, but he can't. Percy, we don't have time to argue about this, Naruto reminded him. Those are Colchis bulls, made by Hephaestus himself. That's right, Annabeth said. We can't fight them without Medea's sunscreen SPF 50,000. Not me, Naruto said charging into battle. Wait Naruto. Annabeth said. Dang it. What does he even mean by not me? Percy shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. At this point nothing about him surprises me. Patrol, phalanx formation. Clarice ordered. Six of her soldiers that were listening lined up shoulder to shoulder, locking their shields to form an ox hide and bronze wall, their spears bristling over the top like porcupine quills. One bull unhinged its jaws to open its mouth and fired white hot column of flames at Clarice. Naruto jumped in front of it and made a series of hand signs. Fire style. Great fireball jutsu. Naruto took a deep breath and made a pinching gesture with his fingers and blew through his fingers his fireball into the flames. Too most the heat of the two fire attacks might have been too much, but one of the blessings that came with being a champion of Hestia Naruto learned over the year was that he was immune to fire. Legacy boy. Clara said when it was over. Long time no see, war girl, Naruto responded. At this point Annabeth and Percy was trying to G at the second bull's attention in order to draw it away from Naruto and Clarice. Meanwhile the first bull snorted and stomped the dirt staring at Naruto as he started back. All right, let's see how well you can turn compared to old beef breath, Naruto said. The bull charged at Naruto at top speed, and Naruto did a quick jump sideways just before it made contact. Claris used the moment to strike at the bull at one of the joints with the remains of her spear. The bull turned to Claris and was ready to strike her down. Naruto jumped onto the bull's shoulders, using chakra to stay on it. Naruto managed to form the Rasengan while using his other hand to focus wind chakra into it, causing a ball of spinning wind and chakra. Wind style Rasengan. Naruto yelled jabbing it into bull's head. The combination of wind and chakra grind and destroyed the celestial bronze plating before hitting the interior. Once it hit the interior there was a small explosion. When the smoke cleared the ruby eyes of the bull dimmed as it shut down and Naruto stood on it successful. Well, that was not expected, Naruto said. You okay, war girl? However, Clarice was no longer with their bull. She was now heading to the second bull which Tyson had defeated. Naruto guessed that Annabeth must have gave Tyson permission, but Clarice didn't know that. Percy and Annabeth were okay. You ruin everything. Clarice yelled at Percy. I had it under search control. Good to see you too, Annabeth grumbled. Hey Clarice. Did you forget that I'm here too? Naruto yelled from the top of his bull. Shut up, legacy boy. You're lucky I still respect you as a warrior, otherwise you would be dead. Clarice yelled. Well, that's nice to know I think, Naruto said. What is that doing here? Clarice demanded while pointing at Tyson. I summoned him, Annabeth said. I had to let Tyson cross the boundary line to help us. Hey, Clarice, you got some seriously wounded here. Naruto yelled. Clarice muttered some incoherent words and left. Let him cross the boundary line. Percy asked. But, Percy, Annabeth said, have you ever looked at Tyson closely? I mean in the face. Ignore the mist and really look at him. 
It took Percy a while, but he did manage to look up at Tyson's face and noticed for the first time Tyson's one large calf brown eye right in the middle of his forehead. Tyson, Percy stammered. Yare. Cyclops, Naruto said walking up to them, a young one to be exact. You knew. Percy yelled. Why didn't you tell me? You had to figure this stuff on your own, Naruto said. Percy, Cyclops are mistakes. Children of nature spirits and gods well, one god in particular, Annabeth said. And they don't always come out right. They're normally left out on their own and are found in most big cities. Many gone rogue and started killing mortals and demigods. Although some does find their way to the forges, Naruto said. Annabeth sighed. Yes, some do, but not all. But the fire. How? Cyclops are immune to fire, Naruto said like it was no big deal. Percy was shocked, mostly because he never realized what Tyson was. Hey. Clara said coming back. If you three are done talking, how about help us carry the wounded back to the big house? We need to let Tantalus know what's happened. Tantalus? Percy and Naruto asked. The activities director, Clara said impatiently. Tyron is the activities director, Percy said. And where's Argus? Hess head of security. He should be here. Clarice made a sour face. Argus got fired. So did. You three been gone too long. Things are changing. Clarice left. What is going on around here? Percy asked. First I find out Thalia's tree is poisoned, now this. I don't know, but I don't like it, Naruto said. At first glance, Camp Half-Blood didn't look that all different. The big house was still there with its blue gabled roof and its wraparound porch. There was the strawberry field still baked in sun. There were the white column Greek buildings scattered around the valley the amphitheater, the combat arena, the dining pavilion overlooking Long Island Sound. Nestled between the woods and the creek were a crazy assortment of twelve buildings that represent each Olympian god. And yet there was an air of danger in the valley. Instead of playing volleyball in the sandpit, counselors and satyrs were stockpiling weapons in the toolshed. Dryads that were normally peaceful and less provoked were armed with bows and arrows as they talked nervously at the edge of the woods. The forest looked sickly, the grass in the meadow was pale yellow, and the fire marks on Half-Blood Hill stood out like ugly scars. Naruto Percy Annabeth and Tyson made their way to the big house. Along the way, they met a lot of the kids from last summer. However, nobody stopped to talk or say welcome back. Some did double takes when they saw Tyson, but most just walked grimly past and carried on their duties running messages, toting swords to sharpen on the grinding wheels. At the same time, Tyson was absolutely fascinated by everything he saw. Wasted. He gasped. The stables for Pugasi, Percy said. The winged horses. Wasted. Um those are the toilets. Wasted. The cabins for the campers. If they don't know who your Olympian parent is they put you in Hermes' cabin that brown one over there until you are determined. Then, once they know, they put you in your dad or mom's group. Unless you are a child of a minor god or goddess, Naruto stated, then you get to stay with my aunts and uncles at Hermes' cabin. Tyson looked at Percy and Naruto in awe. You have a cabin? Yep, I stay at Athena's cabin with Annabeth and her siblings. Naruto pointed to a grey elegant building with an owl carved on top. But at dinner I eat with Hermes kids, along with the unclaimed and minor gods kids. Annabeth shot Naruto a look that said, why did you show him our cabin? Naruto shrugged it off. What about you? Tyson asked Percy. Number 3. Percy pointed out a low grey building made of sea stone. You live with friends in the cabin? No. No, just me. Percy ended it there. They eventually made their way to the big house and found Chiron in his apartment, listening to his favorite 1960s lounge music while he packed his saddlebags. As soon as he saw him, Tyson froze. Pony. He cried. Chiron turned, looking offended. I beg your pardon. Annabeth ran up and hugged him. Chiron, what's happening? Yara not leaving. Her voice was shaky as Chiron was like a second father to her. Chiron ruffled her hair and gave her a kindly smile. Hello, child. Naruto, it's good to see you again and in person. And Percy, my goodness. You've grown over the year. Tyron, Clarice just told us the news, Naruto said. Percy said, you were you were. Fired. Chiron's eyes glinted with dark humor. Ah, well, someone had to take the blame. Lord Zeus was most upset. The tree had created from the spirit of his daughter, poisoned. Mr. D had to punish someone. Besides himself, you mean, Percy growled. But this is crazy. Annabeth cried. Chiron, you couldn't have had anything to do with poisoning Thalia's tree. Nevertheless, Chiron sighed, some in search Olympus do not trust me now, under circumstances. What circumstances? Percy asked. Chiron's face darkened. He stuffed a Latin English dictionary into his saddlebag while the Frank Sinatra music oozed from his boombox. Tyson was still staring at Chiron in amazement. He whimpered like he wanted to pat Chiron's flank but was afraid to come closer. Pony. Chiron sniffed. My dear young Cyclops. I am a centaur. 
Tyron, Naruto said, you told me that the poison used on Thalia's tree came from the underworld. Yes. Some venom I have never seen. It must have come from a monster quite deep in the pits of Tartarus. Then it had to be Luke under the Titan Lord's command, Naruto stated. Even if Zeus won't admit that the Titan Lord is rising, he can't argue against Luke. Perhaps, Chiron said. But I fear I am being held responsible because I did not prevent Luke's betrayal, and I cannot cure the tree. The tree has only a few weeks left of life unless... Unless what? Annabeth asked. No, Chiron said. A foolish thought. The whole valley is feeling the shock of the poison. The magical borders are deteriorating. The camp itself is dying. Only one source of magic would be strong enough to reverse the poison, and it was lost centuries ago. What is it? Percy asked. Well go find it. Tyron closed his saddlebag. He pressed the stop button on his boombox. Then he turned and rested his hand over Percy's shoulder, looking at him straight in the eyes. Percy, you must promise me that you will not act rashly. I told your mother and Naruto I did not want you to come here at all this summer. It's much too dangerous. But now that you are here, stay here. Train hard. Learn to fight. But do not leave. Why? Percy asked. I want to do something. I can't just let the borders fail. The whole camp will be overrun by monsters, Chiron said. Yes, I fear so. But you must not let yourself be baited into hasty action. This could be a trap of the Titan Lord to get to you and Naruto. Like I would let him get what he wants from me, Naruto muttered. I know you want Naruto, Chiron said. You're rash like Percy, but you're also cunning and strong will. That's why I trust you to keep an eye on things while I'm gone. Annabeth was trying hard not to cry. Chiron brushed a tear from her cheek. Stay with Percy, child, he told her. Keep him safe. The prophecy remember it. I will. Um, Percy said. Would this be the super dangerous prophecy that has me in it, but the gods have forbidden you to tell me about? Annabeth and Chiron didn't answer. Right, Percy muttered. Tyron Annabeth said. You told me the gods made you immortal only so long as you were needed to train heroes. If they dismiss you from camp, swear you will do your best to keep Percy from danger, he insisted. Swear upon the river Styx. I, I swear it upon the river Styx, Annabeth said. Thunder rumbled outside. Very well, Chiron said relaxing a little. Oh, that reminds me Naruto. I've been meaning to tell during our Iris message, but you were in a rush to get to school, I didn't have the chance to tell you. There is someone I think you will want to see. Someone that has been quite eager to see you since she arrived last week. Naruto furrowed his brow a little trying to think who Chiron was talking about. What do you mean? He asked. Who would want to see me? Well, ever since your grandparents brought you to this world, it seems some of the gods both Olympians and minor gods have been contemplating whether to bring their children and legacies over as well, Chiron explained. And it as it turns out, one of them has decided to come here to visit and see you. I believe she'll be staying for the summer sessions due to her duties with her clan. Naruto's eyes widened. Someone from Kanoha was here possibly one of his friends. Not to mention it could get him the answers he'd been wanting to know since the Sasuke retrieval mission. Who is it? Naruto asked excitedly, almost forgetting that it was supposed to be a sad moment. Percy and Annabeth looked at Naruto a little nervous. They heard about Naruto's friends back in the leaf, but this would be the first time they would meet one. At that moment a female figure appeared at the door timidly. Percy found himself blushing a little. H hello Naruto. Naruto turned to see it was a girl his age with dark hair blue hair that reaches down to her lower back, gentle facial features and lavender tinted pupilless eyes, wearing a lavender color open jacket over a camp half-blood t-shirt, blue jeans with a kunai holster around one of her upper pant legs, traditional ninja sandals a forehead protector that been obviously coated with celestial bronze around her neck, a quiver full of arrows strapped to her back and a bow on her shoulder. Although she had grown sign Naruto last saw her, and her hair was much longer than he remembered, Naruto recognized her immediately. Hinata. Naruto shouted. Naruto rushed over and hugged Hinata with joy, which caused Hinata to blush bright red like she always did when she has that clothes with Naruto. Of course Percy and Annabeth noticed this and tried to hide their smirks. Tyson was clapping with glee with what was going on, even though he had absolutely no idea what was going on. Tyron cleared his throat, noticing that Hinata was about to pass out. Naruto released Hinata and rubbed the back of his head. Sorry, I'm just happy to see Hinata. Yeah, we noticed, Percy said getting a slap in the back of the head from Annabeth. Ow. Wait, if you are here, you are a demigod, right? So was your mom? Naruto asked, Aphrodite, Demeter, Athena or is it a minor goddess? Who is it? Ah, it's actually he, Hinata stuttered pressing her index fingers together. The goddess of youth? Naruto asked a little surprise. Last year he learned that he met the goddess of youth in the elemental nations without knowing it and had opened two Achiricus in this world one in the Lotus Casino and the other on Search Olympus. But he never imagined one of his friends would be one of her children. 
Anad nodded, my sister is also a daughter of Heeb, but since Heeb didn't have a cabin, my father is only letting me go. Oh yeah. Heeb doesn't have a cabin, so Yao will get to enjoy Hermes' cabin's hospitality Naruto remembered. Yes, well. Hinata been proven to be quite resourceful since her arrival, Chiron said, she has taken up archery, since her bloodline helps her with a bow and arrow. Her bloodline also been helping with scouting the borders, and when she's not doing that, she using her medical ointments to help the wounded. Hinata blushed even more as Naruto nodded, not so surprised. He was fully aware of the abilities of the Byakugan and those who used it. After all, he did fight and defeat Hinata's cousin Niji after all. Naruto guessed since Niji wasn't here either he wasn't a demigod or in the case that he possibly not Niji's mother, his godly mother Haven confronted him. Well, since you two are reunited, I should take my leave, Chiron said. Perhaps my name will be cleared and I shall return. Until then, I go to visit my wild kinsmen in the Everglades. It's possible they know of some cure for the poison tree that I have forgotten. In any event, I will stay in exile until this matter is resolved one way or another. Until then I must entrust your safety to Mr. D and the new activities director. Yeah, who is this tantalous guy, anyway? Percy demanded. Where does he get off taking your job? Sadly to say it was Mr. D's choice, Chiron said, if it was up to the other Olympians, he would still be in the underworld. Wait a second you don't mean Tantalus is very same Tantalus the child eater? Naruto asked. Why on earth would Mr. D hired him? I don't know, but I hope they won't destroy the camp quite as quickly as I fear, Chiron said. The conch horn blew across the valley, indicating it was time for the campers to assemble for dinner. Though, Chiron said. You will meet Tantalus at the pavilion. I will contact your mother, Percy, and let her know you are safe. No doubt she'll be worried by now. Just remember my warning. You are in grave danger. Do not think for a moment that the Titan Lord has forgotten you or Naruto. With that, he clopped out of the apartment and down the hall, Tyson calling after him, Pony don't go. But it was too late. Chiron was gone, and Tyson had started bawling. The sun was setting behind the dining pavilion as the campers came up from their cabins. Naruto Percy Tyson and Hinata stood in the shadows of a marble column and watched them file in. Naruto and Hinata stayed back to wait for Hermes' cabin to file in. Annabeth was still shaken up with Chiron leaving, but she promised to talk to them later before joining her siblings at Athena Cabin's table. At that table were a dozen boys and girls with blonde hair and grey eyes like Annabeth, who were also Naruto's aunts and uncles from his father's side. Annabeth wasn't the oldest, but she'd been a camper for six years and had six beads on her necklace to prove it. Cause of it no one questioned her right to lead the line. Next came Claris, leading Ares' cabin. She looked pretty good despite having to take on two colches bull, but someone had taped a piece of paper on her back that said, you moo, girl. But nobody in her cabin was bothering to tell her. After the Ares kids came Hephaestus' cabin six guys led by Charles Beckendorf, a big 15-year-old African-American. He had hands the size of catcher's mitts and a face that was hard and squinty from looking into a blacksmith's force all day. Hess a nice guy, but no one dare called him Charlie or Chuck or Charles. Most just called him Beckendorf. Naruto actually made good friend with Beckendorf during his first week of camp last year. He even entrusted Beckendorf to coat the metal plate of his headband with celestial bronze and asked him to make some ninja weapons he didn't received from his grandparents. That reminds me, I should see if Beckendorf have got to them and finish them, Naruto thought. Next was Katie Garden and her siblings from Demeter Cabin, a bunch of kids with brown hair and leafy green eyes. Naruto somewhat made friends with Katie last year when he took down a couple of bullies from Ari's cabin that was playing keepway with a basket of strawberries. Next came in Lee Fletcher and his siblings from Apollo Cabin the second biggest cabin in camp. Each camper had golden blonde hair that matches the sun and skills in music and archery. The next cabin that came in was Aphrodite Cabin a cabin full of what they call themselves the most beautiful and handsome campers in camp, mostly because their mother Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty. The cabin is led by a raven hair girl named Selena Borgard, who is one of the most active campers in her cabin, as she taught Pegasi ridding lessons, while most of her siblings rather get suntans. Unlike most of her siblings, Selena was the only one in the cabin that didn't act like fangirls around Naruto since he came to camp. Speaking of fangirls, Naruto noticed that many of them were looking at Hinata, glaring at her as she stood next to him. What's the deal with them? Naruto thought. The second to the last cabin of campers that came in were Dionysus, which is mostly two twin blonde hair chubby boys. Both get the privilege to sit at the head table with their father Dionysus also, known as Mr. D who was the camp director for a hundred years, for chasing an off-limit nymph. Following the Dionysus twins were the nature spirits. Naids came up from the canoe lake. Dryads melted out of the trees. From the meadow came a dozen satyrs who haven't gotten their searcher listens to search for Pan or Wasson searching for half-bloods and was stuck in camp doing odd jobs for Mr. D. After the satyrs filed into dinner, Hermes' cabin brought up the rear. 
they were the biggest cabin in camp, and those who were Hermes' kids were Naruto's maternal aunts and uncles. Last summer, it was led by Luke, but after Luke betrayed camp, Travis and Connor Stoll both led the cabin. They weren't twins, but they looked so much alike it didn't matter. They were both tall and skinny, with mops of brown hair that hung in their eyes. They wore orange camp half-blood t-shirts untucked over baggy shorts, and they had the same elfish features Naruto had. Upturned eyebrows, sarcastic smiles, a gleam in their eyes whenever they're up to no good. Although they were quite the pranksters in camps, they actually saw Naruto as the prank master for the pranks he did in Yancey Academy, the first school he attended in this world, and in the leaf village that he told him about. As soon as the last campers had filed in, Percy led Tyson into the middle of the pavilion, with Naruto and Hinata following. Conversations faltered. Heads turned. Who invited that? Somebody at the Apollo table murmured just to be shot a glare by Naruto. From the head table they heard a familiar voice drawled, well, well, if it isn't Peter Johnson. My millennium is complete. And if it wasn't Nagato Yumizaki. I see you've been reacquainted with your friend from the Elemental Nations Himawaki. Good for you. Percy gritted his teeth. Percy Jackson sir. Mr. D sipped his Diet Coke. Yes. Well, as you young people say these days. Whatever. Nice to see you too, Mr. D, Naruto said. Mr. D was wearing his usual leopard pattern Hawaiian shirt, walking shorts, and tennis shoes with black socks. He had a pudgy belly and a blotchy red face that told you he was still silver and not happy. Behind him, a nervous-looking satyr was peeling the skins off grapes and handing them to Mr. D one at a time. Next to him, where Chirin usually sat or stood in centaur form, was someone neither Percy and Naruto saw before. It was a horribly thin man in a threadbare orange prisoner's jumpsuit. The number over his pocket read 0001. He had blue shadows under his eyes, dirty fingernails, and badly cut gray hair, as if his last haircut had been done with a weed whacker. He stared at Percy and Naruto with anger, frustration and hunger. This boy, Dionysus told the man while pointing at Percy, you need to watch. Poseidon's child, you know. Ah. The prisoner said. That. His tone made it obvious that he and Dionysus had already discussed about Percy at length. I am Tantalus, the prisoner said, smiling coldly. On special assignment here until, well, until my lord Dionysus decides otherwise. And you, Perseus Jackson, I do expect you to refrain from causing any trouble, along with Mr. Uzumaki. Trouble? Naruto asked. What trouble? Dionysus snapped his fingers. A newspaper appeared on the table the front page of today's New York Post. There was Percy's and Naruto's yearbook picture from Meriwether Prep. They cold read the headline, but they had a good guess. Two student lunatics torches gymnasium. Yes, trouble, Tantala said with satisfaction. Your friend has caused plenty of trouble last year. As for you Mr. Uzumaki, I know what's sealed in you, and if you know what's good for you, I suggest you keep your fox and yourself at bay, unless you want the rest of the camp to start hearing rumors about how dangerous you really are. Naruto clenched his fist. This guy really just threatened him. He really just said that. Tantalus, Mr. D cleared his throat, I won't recommend making such threats to Nagato here. What can he do about it? Release his prisoner on me? Tantalus said. Just then a fist went flying and hit Tantalus in the nose with a nasty crunch as his seat fell backwards. Mr. D acted like nothing happened of course, as Tantalus stood up with a bloody nose. Did you see that Lord Dionysus? The kid assaulted me. You must have had a spider on your face. It's only natural for him to react that way considering who his grandmother is, Mr. D said, Mr. Yumizaki, please take your friend to table 11. You too Johnson. I believe that table over there is yours the one where no one else ever wants to sit. Anata pulled Naruto away from Tantalus as Percy was turning red with anger. Come on, Tyson. Oh, no, Tantalus said. The monster stays here. We must decide what to do with it. Em, Percy snapped. His name is Tyson. The new activities director raised an eyebrow. Tyson saved the camp, Percy insisted. He pounded one of those bronze bulls. Otherwise they will burn down this place. That's right. Naruto yelled. And what a pity that will been, Tantalus sighed as Dionysa snickered. Leave us while we decide this creature's search fate. Tyson looked at Percy scared as Percy promised the big guy that everything will be alright. Naruto was forced to sit with Hermes' cabin. Hey Naruto. Any good pranks this year? Connor asked. Nah, I've been too busy slaying monsters this year, Naruto said. But you didn't slay that one. Travis pointed at Tyson. No way. Tyson's cool, Naruto said. Connor and Travis nodded wearily. Hey Hinata, are you alright? Naruto asked Hinata who was sitting next to him turning bright search pink. You um why yeah, Hinata stuttered while thinking, I'm sitting right next to Naruto. I'm at the same table as him. Of course the other Hermes kids noticed. Hey Naruto, is the new girl your girlfriend? Travis teased. What? No. Hinata is one of my friends from the Elemental Nations, Naruto said. We used to go to the same ninja academy together. 
sure, both Stoll brothers responded sarcastically. Wood nymphs came around the table, handing everyone something to eat, including Naruto's large bowl of miso ramen. When they burned offerings, Naruto made three offerings. One to Athena, then to Hermes, and finally his patron Hestia. It only seemed right that Hestia blessed him with new abilities that he included her in his offering. Everyone sat down and had the usual talk, as well as had the hilarious entertainment of watching Tantalus try to catch his food and drinks. Apparently the punishment given to him from the fields of punishment followed him back to the living, as anything he tried to eat or drink made a run for it. No one laughed out loud, but they did struggle to hold back their smirks. Naruto was filling in Hinata on what been going on in his life. Hinata was happy to find out that Naruto learned about his parents, and glad he was happy. Naruto also learned from Hinata that Shikamaru Kibachoji Niji and Lee made it out of the retrieval mission alive. Although Niji and Choji only survived thanks to Tsunade and Shizune and Shikamaru Kiba Akamaru and Lee were lucky that the Sand siblings came in time to help them. Naruto didn't ask whether or not how much Gara changed, since it would mean bringing up how Gara was a psycho killer to Cabin 11. Naruto would still look up at the head table every once in a while to make sure Tyson was okay. Finally, Tantalus had a sadder blow the conch horn to get their attention for announcements. Yes, well, Tantalus said after the talking had died down. Another fine meal. Or so I am told. There was some coughs that hid the snickering. It didn't help that as he spoke, Tantalus inched his hand toward his refilled dinner plate, only for it to shot away down the table as soon as he got within six inches. And here on my first day of authority, he continued, I'd like to say what a pleasant form of punishment it is to be here. Over the course of the summer, I hope to torture, er, interact with each and every one of you children. You all look good enough to eat. The Onesus clapped politely, leading to some half-hearted applause from the satyrs. Tyson was still standing at the head table, looking uncomfortable, but every time he tried to scoot out of the limelight, Tantalus pulled him back. And now some changes. Tantalus gave the campers a crooked smile. We are reinstating the chariot races. A murmuring of a combination of excitement, fear and disbelief. Naruto had a gleam in his eyes. Ever since he came to this camp, he wanted to try out chariot racing. Now I know, Tantalus continued, raising his voice, that these races were discontinued some years ago due to, ah, technical problems. Three deaths and 26 mutilations, someone at the Apollo table called. Yes, yes, Tantalus said. But I know that you will all join me in welcoming the camp traditions. To add to it, you don't have to play for your own cabin if you choose. In fact, for those with minor gods, or a certain goddess of the hearth for a patron wants to race on their own accord can do so. He looked at Naruto when he said that, as if tempting Naruto to turn against his family in cabin 6 and 11 to race. Golden laurels will go to the winning charioteers each month. Teams may register in the morning. The first race will be held in three days. We will release you from most of your regular activities to prepare your chariots and choose your horses. Oh, and did I mention whatever team wins will have no chores for the month and can share it with the cabin they represent if they choose if they win. Explosion of excitement conversion. Hey Naruto, maybe you and Hinata should join for Hermes, Travis said. Yeah, you two were a team before, you should have this in the bag, Connor said, and of course well help make sure you win. The rest of Hermes' kids nodded. Uh thanks, guys, but I should check with Annabeth first since you know him living in Athena's cabin, Naruto said. Another reason was that Naruto saw the gleam in the Stole Search brothers' eyes and didn't like the idea of the help they might be talking about. But, sir. Claris interrupted. She was nervous, but she stood up to speak for Mary's table. Some of the campers snickered when they saw the Yumu girl. Sign on her back. What about patrol duty? I mean, if we drop everything to ready our chariots. Ah, the hero of the day, Tantalus exclaimed. Brave Claris, who single-handedly bested the bronze bulls. Claris blinked, then blushed. Um, I didn't, and modest, too. Tantalus grinned. Not to worry, my dear. This is a summer camp. We are here to enjoy ourselves, yes? But the tree. And now, Tantalus said, as several of Clarissa's cabin mates pulled her back to her seat, before we proceed to the campfire and sing along, one slight housekeeping issue. Percy Jackson, Naruto Uzumaki, and Annabeth Chase have seen fit, for some reason, to bring this here. Tantalus waved a hand toward Tyson. Uneasy murmuring spread among the campers. A lot of sideways looks were at Percy and Naruto. Needless to say both of them wanted to kill Tantalus. Now, of course, he said, Cyclops have a reputation for being bloodthirty monsters, only the rogue ones. Naruto yelled, there are those that joined Search Olympus and worked in the forges. There were some murmuring as it is true. Most of it came from Hephaestus' cabin who knew that all too well. Tantalus shot a glare that quiet everyone down. Under normal circumstances, I would release this beast into the woods and have you hunted down with torches and pointed sticks. As Mr. Uzumaki he said with venom in his voice pointed out, perhaps the Cyclops can be proven useful. So until it proves worthy of destruction, we need a place to keep it. 
I've thought about the stables, but that will make the horses nervous. Hermes cabin will side with their nephew, possibly. Naruto turned to his fellow uncles, only to find Travis and Connor Stoll developed a sudden interest in tablecloth. Eyes, sorry Naruto. It's not that we don't believe you, Travis said. It's just where would we put him, Connor said. Naruto clenched his fist, wanting to punch something, but he knew they had a point. Hermes cabin was well known as the overfill cabin, for a reason, and housing a cyclops would be difficult. Especially since Tyson hasn't have full search control of his strength now. It was bad enough that Naruto had to go with the idea that Hinata might have to sleep in a sleeping bag every summer. He just didn't like how Tyson was being treated right now. Well, it seems Mr. Yuzumaki is on his own, Tantalus taunted. Perhaps no one agrees with him, then. Hinata was about to stand up for Naruto when suddenly everyone gasped. Tantalus scooted away from Tyson in surprise as a brilliant green light with a dazzling holographic green trident appeared above his head. Naruto wasn't surprised. He heard how Poseidon came to be known for having Cyclops children and guessed there was a chance Tyson was his. Heck, even Sally Jackson admitted she agreed with him. But when Naruto looked at Percy he found his dark hair friend wasn't too happy. Rather shocked, insulted and humiliated as there was a moment of awe silence. Being claimed was rare after all. Hermes cabin was proof of that. Antilus roared with laughter along with most of the pavilion. Well. I think we know where to put the beast now. By the gods, I can see the family resemblance. Only Annabeth Percy Naruto Hinata and a few others didn't laugh as Tyson tried to swat the glowing trident that was now fading over his head. At that moment, Naruto decided it was high time to bring out his old prankster self and make Tantalus stay here in camp even more miserable as possible and hell need help. Luckily, he had two uncles in mind to ask. The morning of the race was hot and humid. Fog lay low on the ground like sauna steam. Millions of birds were roosting in the trees. The birds were fat gray and white like pigeons. Only when they coo, they made a metallic screeching sound. Hephaestus' cabin had the racetrack had been built in a grassy field between the archery range and the woods, using the bronze bulls that they rebuilt and tamed. There were rows of stone steps for the spectators. The satyrs, a few dryads, all of the campers, and Mr. D was there reluctantly as two tantalous mysterious disappearance this morning. Right. Mr. D said announced as the teams began to assemble. And they had brought him a big platter of grapes. You all know the rules. A quarter mile track. Twice around to win. Two horses per chariot. Each team will consist a driver and a fighter. Weapons are allowed. Dirty tricks are expected. But try not to kill anybody if you can't help yourself. Naruto and Hinata pulled their team on the track. Well, Hinata did. It turns out Hinata was a natural with horses and Pegasus as they loved her kind and gentle nature. Of course that also meant that Naruto was the fighter, and with his pouch full of new celestial bronze weapons that Beckendorf turned out to have successfully made for him, he was ready. Beckendorf led the Hephaestus team onto the track next to Naruto's. Their chariot was made out of bronze and iron including the horses, which were magical automations. Naruto won't be surprised if there were some nasty traps and mechanisms built in them. Hey Naruto. Don't think because we're friends it'll go easy on you or on Hinata, Beckendorf yelled. Hey. You stole my line. Clarice and one of her brothers. Mark, who turned out to be one of Ares' sons Naruto humiliated last summer, rode in their chariot representing Ares' cabin. The chariot was blood red and pulled by two grisly horse skeletons. Both Clarice and her search brother had a bag full of javelins, spike balls, caltrips, and a bunch of nasty toys. Well don't worry, because we're not going easy on either of you, Naruto responded. Annabeth and her second-in-command Malcolm rode up. Annabeth had a scowl on her face which meant one thing. Another argument with Percy. What did Percy do now? Naruto asked. Nothing, Annabeth said, he was just trying to distract me by telling me lies about Grover. Naruto tilted his head. Telling lies about Grover? Yeah. Percy, telling lies about Grover? Yes. Since when Percy lied about Grover that doesn't involved him being a satyr. Annabeth bit her lip as it dawned to her. When this race is over you are going to apologize to Percy, Naruto stated. Hein, Annabeth muttered. Malcolm looked at Naruto gratefully. Obviously he was worried that Annabeth was taking things too far. Hinata smiled at Naruto. Apollo's chariot rode with Lee Fletcher as driver and his search brother and second in command Michael you ready with his bow. Michael was a short kid with ferret-like traits, but he had an attitude that make up his size. Their chariot was golden and they had beautiful horses pulling them. Finally came Poseidon's chariot drive by Percy and Tyson acting as fighter. Naruto guessed Percy had to offer a lot of apples and sugar cubes, so the horses let Tyson ride in the chariot. Tyson looked like he was having the time of his life, while Percy looked like he wanted to strangle something. Geez Percy, lighten up, Naruto thought. However, Naruto couldn't help but feel sympathy for the son of Poseidon. He knew better than anyone what it was like to be an outcast. As the chariot lined up, more of those strange birds gathered in the woods. 
They were screeching so loudly the campers in the stands were starting to take notice, glancing nervously at the trees, which shivered under the weight of the birds. Only Tantalus didn't look concerned, but he did have to speak up to be heard over the noise. Jurioteers. He shouted. Attend your mark. He waved his hand, and the starting signal dropped. The chariots roared to life. Hooves thundered against the dirt and the crowd cheered. Immediately Naruto had to duck to avoid an arrow soaring over his head. Lee Fletcher and Michael Yu were coming at them as Michael notched another arrow. Michael fired and Naruto dodged another arrow. Apollo Chariot moved in close, and Naruto took advantage of it by taking out a shuriken throwing star sharpened it with wind chakra and threw it. The shuriken successfully cut the reins causing the chariot to lose search control and flip and the horses to run diagonally across the track toward Naruto and Hinata. Hinata pulled the reins and they slowed down and swerved just enough for them to dodge Apollo Cabin's horses. Great job Hinata, Naruto said before noticing that Hinata had her Byakugan active. Of course, that way we can't be caught off guard. Naruto thought. Now they were closing in on Beckendorf's chariot and Percy's with Clarissa's neck to neck with Anubis. On the turn, move around the side of Hephaestus' chariot, Naruto told Hinata who nodded. Oh okay. Hinata steered the chariot on the next turn, so they were closing in on Hephaestus' chariot, as Beckendorf was too busy with Percy and Tyson to notice it. Naruto took out another shuriken, planning to cut the reins as they raced by. However, his concentration broke when he saw something dive bombing their way or rather hundreds of something. Duck. Naruto pushed Hinata down as one of the strange birds tried to strike her. Naruto made a series of hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Naruto blew flames at the birds that scared them off, giving Hinata time to regain search control over the chariot after. Beckendorf wasn't so lucky as he and his fighter Jake Mason was mobbed by the birds as the chariot veered off course and plowed through the strawberry fields. W what are those? Hinata asked. I think they're stygian birds. Flesh-eating birds, Naruto said, Hercules had to clear a field of them for one of his labors. At that point Naruto noticed that Athena's and Poseidon's chariots made a sudden turn off the course. They must have found a way to stop these birds, Naruto thought. Which means we better buy them time and fast. The birds started recovering as they regrouped around Naruto's chariot. Hinata, do you know your clan's defensive jutsu? Naruto asked. And no, Hinata responded, B, but I have something in mind that might help. Then give me the reins, Naruto said. Hinata obeyed as Naruto took over. Hinata applied chakra to her feet to stick on the chariot as she took her stance with her hand stretched out as an invisible trigram with a yin yang symbol appeared below the chariot. Protecting a trigram 60 palms, Hinata yelled. She started swipping her arms around and emits a constant and emits a sharp blade form of chakra from her hands, and she kept doing that while moving around until it formed a barrier. When the Stygian birds tried to attack they hit the barrier and disintegrated from impact. Meanwhile Naruto swerved off the track and had the horses circled them around the stands, as Hinata started making her chakra blades thinner, so she could simply cutting through them, only making them thicker when the birds attacked. Clarice and Mark joined them after winning the race mostly by default and joined in on the fighting. At that point Annabeth and Percy pulled up to the finish line with Chiron's boom box and collection, and started to play a song that involved violins and a guy moaning in Italian. That's right, Naruto thought. Stygian birds can't stand loud annoying sounds. The demon pigeons went nuts as Hinata ended her jutsu and pulled off her bow from her shoulder and started firing arrows. Apollo Cabin soon enough followed her example and shooting down the birds. Naruto decided to help out and made the hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Naruto blew fire from his mouth and burned a good portion of the birds. Soon enough the ground was littered with dead bronze beak birds. The camp was saved, but the damage was done. Most of the chariots had been completely destroyed. Almost everyone was wounded, bleeding from bird pecks. The kids from Aphrodite's cabin were screaming because of their hairdos had been ruined and their clothes pooped on. Bravo. Tantala said walking up to them as if just arriving wearing a blonde girl's wig and a search pink dress, we have our first winner. He walked to where Clarice was at and awarded the golden laurels for the race. Clarice was stunned. Tantalus where have you been? Mr. D asked. What happened to you? Tantalus' eyes gleamed toward Naruto who was glaring at him. The mysterious prankster decided to put me in a canoe and left me stranded in the middle of the lake dressed like this. Most of the campers clamped their hands over their mouths, resisting the urge to laugh at the thought of that. Now if you excuse me, I need to change out of this find some glue remover, Tantala said as he headed toward the big house. Once he was out of sight everyone burst out laughing. Some even fell to the ground as they rolled around laughing. Naruto tried to hide his smirk, but failed to hide the gleam in his eyes. Luckily the only people who knew what that meant were too busy laughing, but they had no doubt about it was Naruto behind Tantalus' torment. Things went back to normal after the chariot race at least as normal as Camp Half-Blood could be after a monster attack. The wounded was taken to the big house infirmary to be treated. 
the track was cleared of Stygian birds for the next race that Tantalus promised will happen. The campers that were still in top condition went back to their daily training and activities. But not Naruto though. As soon as he had a chance, he practically forced Annabeth to talk to Percy, alone. Hinata agreed to keep Tyson busy, so Naruto can try to keep the conversation calm without Percy and Annabeth at each other's throats. Naruto was upset that not only Annabeth let her anger get the better of her, but still hasn't kept her promise about giving Tyson a chance. It was clear that Annabeth's grudge against Cyclops was deep, for reasons Naruto had yet to find out, but Naruto wasn't about to let Annabeth put it against Tyson. But right now, Naruto wanted to make sure Annabeth apologized for ignoring Percy earlier and find out what Percy found out. At the end of the explanation, Annabeth really was sorry for not listening earlier. If Hess really found it, Annabeth murmured, and if we could retrieve it, hold it, Percy said. You act like this whatever it is Grover found is the only thing in the world that could save the camp. What is it? It'll give you a hint, Annabeth said. What do you get when you skin a ram? Messy? Percy replied. I think she means a fleece, Percy, Naruto said before something dawned to him. Wait, wasn't there a magical fleece in the old stories? The golden fleece, Annabeth nodded. Are you too serious? Percy asked realizing where they were going. Percy, remember the Grey Sisters? Annabeth responded, they said they knew the location of the thing you seek. And they mentioned Jason. 3000 years ago, they told him how to find the Golden Fleece. You do know the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, Percy said. That old movie with the clay skeletons. Annabeth rolled her eyes. Oh my gods, Percy. You are so hopeless, Annabeth responded. Nah, he just refuses to pick up a book, Naruto responded. Not all of us can make shadow clones to help us read. Percy snapped. Just listen. The real story of the fleece. There were these two children of Zeus, Cadmus and Europa, okay. They were about to get offered as human sacrifices. That probably didn't go well with Zeus, Naruto said. Annabeth shrugged. Maybe so because when Cadmus and Europa prayed to Zeus to save them, Zeus sent this magical flying ram with golden wool, which picked them up in Greece and carried them all the way to Colchis in Asia Minor. Well, actually, it carried Cadmus. Europa fell off and died along the way, but that's not important. It was probably important to her, Percy said. The point is, when Cadmus got to Colchis, he sacrificed the golden ram to the gods and hung the fleece in a tree in the middle of the kingdom. The fleece brought prosperity to the land. Animals stopped getting sick. Plants grew better. Farmers had bumper crops. Plagues never visited. That's why Jason wanted the fleece. It can revitalize any land where it's placed. It cures sickness, strengthen nature, cleans up pollution. It could cure Thalia's tree. Percy said. Annabeth nodded. And it would totally strengthen the borders of Camp Half-Blood. But Percy, the fleece has been missing for centuries. Tons of heroes have searched for it with no luck. That's when it dawned to Naruto what Hestia meant. But Satters could. They left camp searching for Pan, but instead they find the Golden Fleece probably caught on the trail, wherever the Council of Cloven Elders send Grover to. Percy nodded. Grover said the Golden Fleece radiates nature magic. It makes sense, Annabeth. We can rescue him and save the camp at the same time. It's perfect. Annabeth hesitated. A little too perfect, don't you guys think? What if it's a trap? That thought did occur to Naruto. The Titan Lord Kronos was out to get him and Percy. He wants them to join his army Percy because he was the son of Poseidon and Naruto because of the nine-tailed fox sealed in him. What choice do we have? Percy asked. Are you going to help me rescue Grover or not? Percy, Annabeth said under her breath, we'll have to fight a Cyclops. Annabeth, no offense, but I've been fighting rogue Cyclops for a year, Naruto said. But this is not just your average Cyclops, Naruto. I'm talking about Polyphemus, the worst of the Cyclops. Naruto frowned. The Cyclops that tried to hold Odysseus and his crew captive. Yes. Annabeth responded, and there is only one place his island could be. The Sea of Monsters. Where is that? Percy asked. Annabeth stared at Percy like she thought he was playing dumb. Luckily Naruto saved him. I think Percy meant where it is now, Naruto said. I mean with the whole Western civilization movement. The Bermuda Triangle, Annabeth replied. Percy frowned. The place where planes and boats have reportedly disappeared when crossing the area. Annabeth nodded, that's what the mortals think, but in reality they were most likely destroyed by the monsters there. I guess that makes sense, Naruto said. Wait, wasn't the lair of the Lotus Eaters in the Sea of Monsters? Why was it moved in a casino in Las Vegas? Annabeth shrugged. From what I can guess, a lot mystical places that were in the Sea of Monsters were magically moved to places in the US that could attract mortals' attention or something, but most stayed in the Sea of Monsters like Sirens Island, Island of Surs, clashing rocks there remained in the Sea of Monsters. Okay Percy said, still being skeptical, so at least we know where to look. It's still a huge area, Percy. Searching for one tiny island in monster-infested waters, Naruto frowned. What about the numbers the Grey Sisters gave us? 
30, 31, 75, 12. What if they are not just numbers? Percy's eyes widened. 30 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west. Fair sailing coordinates. How? Annabeth question in shock. We learned it in Meriwether, Naruto said, one of the few things they actually taught in that school. Annabeth knit her eyebrows. We'll have to talk to Tantalus, get approval for a quest. Hell, say no. Not if we can go over his head, Naruto said. Tantalus said it himself, Hess only here, as long as Mr. D allows it. If we can get Mr. D's approval, Tantalus can't do anything about it. No offense Naruto, but I doubt Mr. D would listen to us, Percy said. Not to you, but maybe to me, Naruto said. That could work, Annabeth said, especially since Naruto seems to be the only camper in the whole camp that Mr. D can't stand other than his own two sons. We'll leave Mr. D to you then, Naruto, Percy said. Naruto nodded. Naruto headed straight to Mr. D after he was talking to Annabeth and Percy. You want me to authorize a quest instead of going to Tantalus, Mr. D said. If we gone to Tantalus, he would turn it down before we could have a chance to explain, Naruto said. We need the Golden Fleece. We got the coordinates of its location, we know who has it, we just need a quest. You realize the quest you are asking to be issue is a lot more dangerous than the quest for the lightning bolt, right? Mr. D asked. The Sea of Monsters isn't like a cross-country adventure. I understand sir, Naruto said. Mr. D had a thoughtful expression. Fine. He'll issue your quest. Really? Naruto asked. However Mr. D added, y'all still have to get Tantalus approval at tonight's campfire for the whole camp to hear. If you can do that, it'll back up your claim. At first Naruto didn't like the idea to confront Tantalus about it, but then he thought of how he could get the whole camp by his side by doing so. Plus it might give him the chance he was looking for. Sure thing, Mr. D. That night at the campfire, Apollo's cabin led the sing-along. They tried to get everyone's spirits up, but it wasn't easy after the Stygian bird attack. Everyone sat around a semicircle of stone steps, singing half-heartedly to songs Apollo guys picked out. However the spirit was obviously affecting the hearth of Hestia which was enchanted to grow and change color, based on the mood of the campfire only burned five feet with the color of lint. Dionysus looked tortured and any thought he would leave any minute, but he stayed through it all, glaring at Tantalus every now and then for doing this. When the last song was over, Tantalus said, well, that was lovely. He came forward with a toasted marshmallow on a stick and tried to pluck it off, real casual-like. But before he could touch it, the marshmallow flew off the stick. As Tantalus chazzed after the marshmallow Naruto turned to Annabeth Percy and Hinata, who nodded knowing Naruto's plan. Finally, after the marshmallow committed suicide by diving into the flames, Tantalus turned to the group, smiling coldly. Now then. Some announcements about tomorrow's schedule. Sir. Naruto stood up. Tantalus' eye twitched. Our legacy boy has something to say. Everyone turned to Naruto who didn't falter as he stared at Mr. D who stood next to Tantalus. My friends and I came up with an idea on how to save the camp, Naruto said. We know where to find the Golden Fleece. There was dead silence, but the campfire flared orange, indicating everyone wanted to hear what Naruto had to say. With Percy's and Annabeth's help, Naruto was able to tell the camp about the idea of retrieving the Golden Fleece. The fleece can't save the camp, Naruto said. Nonsense, Tantalus said. We don't need saving. Everyone turned at him until Tantalus started looking uncomfortable. Besides, he said. You won't even know where to find Polyphemus. 30 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west, Percy said. That's the location of Polyphemus Island. We checked it ourselves. That's the location within the Sea of Monsters, Naruto said. We need a quest. Wait just a minute, Tantalus said. But the campers took up the chant. We need a quest. We need a quest. The flames rose higher. It isn't necessary. Tantalus insisted. We need a quest. We need a quest. Tantalus, old chum, as much as I hate to say this, but I think you've been outspoken, Mr. D said looking at Naruto with pride. Very well, Mr. Yumizaki, you got your quest. As for quest leader, I think I speak for everyone that you should lead it. There was a loud cheer of approval, mostly from Hermes and Athena cabin. Naruto blinked in surprise. He didn't expect to be named quest leader. Heck, Naruto never even lead a mission before. As for who should come with you, Mr. D continued, I think after your display on the race track this morning, it's only fair that your partner in the race. Hinata Hayuga should go with you. As for who the third companion, it'll leave that up to you. There was a louder cheer. Now hold on a second. Tantalus said. You have something to say, Tantalus. Mr. D asked. Yes, Lord Dionysus. I don't think we should trust the choice of the third companion to Naruto, Tantalus said. He would probably pick someone who would mess up the quest. More like destroy your chance to destroy the camp, Naruto thought. Instead, I shall authorize the third companion for this quest. Someone who will make sure the fleece is returned or die trying Clarus. The fire flickered a thousand different colors. 
The Aries cabin started stomping and cheering, Claris. Claris. Claris stood up, looking stunned. Then she swallowed, and her chest swelled with pride. If Naruto will take me, then I would accept it. Naruto was still caught in confusion. He had hopes to bring Annabeth or Percy on this quest, but he had no way around Tantalus' decision. It was obvious that Tantalus had hopes that Naruto's anger toward Ares would cause conflict in the quest with Claris, but Naruto did trust Claris enough to help them. He then turned to his friends who were confused and upset by the news. I promise, it'll make sure Grover and the Fleece makes it back to camp. Annabeth nodded trusting Naruto to keep his word, but Percy still looked like he wanted to pick a fight. Then Naruto cleared his throat. I accept the idea to have Claris on my team. Ares cheered in approval. Well, if you have nothing else to say Tantala said. Actually, I do have something else, Naruto said. I have a story to tell before I face the oracle. Naruto walked up and faced the crowd. First off, as many of you know, my dad was the fourth Hokage who died protecting the leaf, Naruto said. Many nodded as they heard the tale. Well, the truth is, that's not the full story, Naruto said. He did die protecting the leaf, but he wasn't killed by another human. The flames turned bright yellow as there was a sudden interest. You see, the elemental nations are ran completely monster-free as you might think it is. They have what we call tailed beast demons made out of chakra that take form of an animal the size of a New York City skyscraper, each having a different number of tails from one to nine tails, each being powerful and each being dangerous. The flames turned bright orange and showed different beast. Two Naruto recognized as the Shukaku and the nine-tailed fox, but the other seven he didn't, but he would guess were the other tailed beast. Many campers gasped at the terrible sight. Fourteen years ago, one of these tailed beasts attacked my home village the village hidden in the leaves. It was beast in the form of a fox with nine tails that had the power to create earthquakes and tsunamis with one swipe. Many ninjas died trying to fight it. The flames showed a fox attacking a city-like village. Now, as the story goes, my dad appeared sometime during the attack on a giant toad he summoned using the summoning jutsus. For those who don't know, summoning jutsu is a type of teleportation judas that can summon talking animals that can be from your average size animals to the size of a skyscraper, and like many shinobi of the elemental nations, some summonings can use jutsus, Naruto said. However even with the help of one my dad summonings, all the jutsus he learned and created, the strategic mind he inherited from Athena, and the help of his fellow shinobis, even my dad was no match in a long-standing battle against a tailed beast. But he did know of one way to stop the beast. The flames turned scary purple. You see, years before my dad was even Hokage, shinobis learned of a way to harness the tailed beast's power so that not only they can prevent such attacks, but so that person can learn how to use that power to fight for their village, Naruto said. They did so by using what was called a sealing jutsus to seal the tailed beasts into a human being. They even had a name for a human that holds a tailed beast a Jinchuriki. My dad he knew a sealing jutsu that can do just that. Now, my dad couldn't ask just anyone to offer themselves to be the fox's Jinchuriki. Mostly because whenever someone becomes a Jinchuriki, those around them grows fear and hatred toward the Jinchuriki as search fate all Jinchurikas faced. You see, most Jinchurikas can't search control the beast sealed in them and can lose search control if their seal is weakened to a point and people fear that possibility. But my dad he knew if he didn't do something the fox would destroy the village. So instead of asking someone to offer themselves as the Jinchuriki, he decided to seal the beast into his newborn son, Woe's chakra coils were incompletely developed, thus have some chance to learn how to control the Nine Tails' power. That child was me. There was many collective gasped. The jutsu my dad used to seal the Nine Tails in me. It's a risky jutsu. It requires a sacrifice of the user who performs the jutsu, so even if my dad did pull the jutsu off, he would die. But he did just that, sealing the fox in me, having high hopes that I could search control the fox's power. He even made the seal where if any of the fox's chakra leaked out, it would mix with my own chakra, as long as it's a steady amount and I don't tapped in too much at once. But I only done that in times of emergencies. I even used it against Ares in order to survive the battle, and I can tell you it wasn't an easy choice. Why didn't you tell us earlier? Someone yelled from Apollo's cabin. Didn't you hear him? Annabeth said. Naruto basically told you himself. A Jinchurika search fate is one of fear and hatred of others. Obviously Naruto went through it growing up in the leaf. Just right. Hinata said, before Naruto became a genin, he was an outcast by most of our fellow villagers. Even when he had friends, he was still shunned out. I didn't tell you guys, because I fear that if I do I carry the Jinchurika search fate with me to this world, Naruto said. I've been planning for some time to come out, but it wasn't an easy decision, especially after seeing how some of you guys treated Tyson when he first came to camp. Most of the campers fell silent, realizing where Naruto was going. How could Naruto trust them to treat him fairly if they can't even treat a Cyclops who hasn't done anything to harm a single camper fairly? Well, I say screw the Jinchurika search fate. 
everyone turned to Claris. You done nothing but help the camp and search Olympus the past two summers. If anyone has anything to say against it are fools to think so. Claris walked up to Naruto and punched him in the shoulder. You may have used that fox's power to defeat my dad, but you're still the best fighter I've met. There was a moment of silence, but then most of the campers stood up and walked over to Naruto to give him a pat of the shoulder, letting him know they still trust him and saw him as one of them. Most were from Athena's and Hermes' cabin, but there were many others. Beckendorf, Selina Borgard, Katie Gardner, Lee Fletcher every camper Naruto befriended or helped out during the two summers he'd been at camp, as well as many nature spirits. Percy and Annabeth also stood by Naruto's side. Even Tyson stood up and joined the group. There were some that were still sitting, but with Athena and Hermes' cabins backing Naruto up along with nature spirits, they were outnumbered three to one. Pantala stared in total shock. He had hoped that he could hold Naruto's secret over him longer than this at least until he can confirm that Naruto was the mysterious prankster. But now it's out, Tantalus was hoping everyone started hating the boy, but backing him up. Meanwhile, Mr. T was hiding a smile on his face as he thought, maybe these campers aren't as bad as I thought. He wasn't the only one. No one noticed it at first, but when Naruto looked at the flames, he saw a flickering image of a woman smiling and Naruto knew Hestia was listening in. It made Naruto wonder if Athena and Hermes were aware of what he did and if they were proud of his decision. Well, now that that's over, Mr. D said. Naruto, I think it's time you go see the Oracle. Naruto nodded, not even realizing that Mr. D just called him by his real name. Naruto straightened up and headed to the big house. It was labeled last year. Naruto guessed Annabeth and Percy found it on the boat at the Tunnel of Love when they went down to retrieve Ares' shield while he fiddled around the controls. Naruto decided to search for the Oracle and leave the scarf alone. If it was up in the attic, Naruto didn't want to mess with it. Fortunately it didn't take long to find the oracle. Mostly because Percy did a good job describing her to Naruto. By the window, sitting on a wooden tripod stool was a mummified human female body that was shriveled to a husk. She wore a tie-dyed sundress, lots of beaded necklaces, and a headband over long black hair. The skin of her face was thin and leathery over her skull, and her eyes were glassy white slits, as if the real eyes were replaced by marbles. Naruto could tell she'd been dead for a long, long time. Naruto remembered how he was grateful of not being scared of ghosts when he visited the underworld with his friends, but seeing this mummy gave him a whole brand new gratefulness about it. Suddenly, the oracle sat up on her stool and opened her mouth. A green mist poured from the mummy's mouth, coiling over the floor in thick tendrils, hissing like 20,000 snakes. Inside Naruto's head, he heard a voice, slithering into one ear and coiling inside his brain. I am the spirit of Delphi, speaker of the prophecies of Phobos Apollo, slayer of the mighty python. Approach, seeker, and ask. Naruto took a deep breath. Before coming to this world, Naruto was always skeptical about the idea of everyone's fates being chosen for them. But after last summer after Naruto met the fates and that the oracle even predicted Luke's betrayal, Naruto found it hard to be skeptical. He still doubt Niji was right about him always being weak though. Him going on a quest to save my friend from a cyclops and retrieve the golden fleece that would save Thalia's tree. What's my search destiny? Naruto asked, the mist swirled more thickly, collecting right in front of Naruto and a table of pickled monster part jars. Suddenly Grover appeared in the mist wearing a wedding dress while being locked in a cave. Grover opened his mouth to speak, but when he did, it wasn't Grover's voice, but rather a raspy voice of the oracle. You shall sail the iron ship with warriors of bone. You shall despair for two friends while one entombed in stone. The demon's power shall reach its limit. When you fight your greatest opponent, united you will retrieve what you seek, but only the daughter of war can't succeed. Grover dissolved as the mist retreated, coiling into a huge green serpent and slithering back into the mouth of the mummy. Then the oracle's mouth closed tight, as if it hadn't been opened a hundred years. Naruto was stunned and scared. He now understood why Percy kept the prophecy a secret last year. The way the oracle told it, Naruto was scared of what was ahead of him. Naruto decided to sleep at the beach of Long Island Sound, hidden in one of the tribes. It wasn't too hard, he just packed his bag before heading to the beach. He mostly did this though because he didn't want to face his friends and family after the quest. It gave him ideas of how the Greek ships worked, since chances were he might be borrowing one. Sadly. To say, even camping out on a Greek ship didn't help him sleep a wink. Naruto spent the whole night thinking of his prophecy. It didn't help that he overheard some harpies screeching and what he thought was horses neighing. Finally, after a while Naruto decided to risk it and climbed on deck after, making sure no harpy was still around. You should be asleep at your own cabin. Naruto turned to see a middle-aged man who was slim and fit like an athletic runner, with salt and pepper hair, wearing a nylon running shorts and a New York City Marathon t-shirt. What caught Naruto's attention was that the man had a familiar blue eyes and elfish features, and when he grinned, he had a sly look. A hello Naruto said, do I know you? The man had an offended look. Do you know me? You should. 
after all him, he was interrupted by a cell phone ringing in his pocket. The man sighed and pulled out a bluish glowing cell phone. He extended the antenna and two green snakes no bigger than earthworms. The jogger didn't seem to notice. He checked his LCD display and cursed. Hold on Naruto. I got to take this. Then into his phone. Hello. Naruto stood there totally confused and in shock as the mini snakes writhed up and down the antenna right next to his ear. Now listen I will say this once again. Refer Prometheus to Eris for customer service. I don't care what he says. Now if you excuse me, I got a long-waited appointment with my grandson about the quest test leading. The man hung up as Naruto's eyes widened as he couldn't believe what he heard. The man just said he was his grandfather, and now that he said that, Naruto recognized the elfish traits and the sly smile, as Naruto sees it in Cabin 11 and at times it himself. As I was saying, you should know me, Naruto. At least from the stories about me, he said. Im Hermes, your, the man known as Hermes didn't, have a chance to finish as Naruto ran over and hugged his grandfather. When Athena said you were a hugger, she wasn't kidding. Hermes chuckled. Grandpa I can't believe you are here, Naruto said breaking the hug, I've been anxious to finally meet you after I saw Grandma Athena last year and Naruto stopped for a bit. Why are you here? What? Can't I visit my favorite grandson? Hermes asked. That's your only living grandson. One of the snakes said. Quiet George. The other snake said. Did those snakes just talk? Naruto asked. Hermes chuckled. Sure do. Say hello, George and Martha. Hello, George and Martha, one of the snakes George said. Didn't I told you before with the other one not to be sarcastic, Martha said. Other one? Naruto asked. Don't mind them? Hermes asked stuffing the cell phone in his pocket. But to answer your question, I was in the neighborhood and a bird told me that you were going on your first quest as quest leader, so I thought I'd come and give you advice before Athena jumps for the opportunity. Ah uh, thanks, Naruto responded. Well to be honest, I'm not so nervous about the quest, but rather the prophecy I got. Martha's voice muffled out of Hermes' pocket. Poor dear, the first prophecy is always the hardest on them. Martha's right, Naruto. Prophecies are hard on everyone, but the first one is the toughest, Hermes said, as for your first quest as leader, all I can tell you is trust your instincts. Thanks I think, Naruto said. Hermes laughed, sorry, I can't give you in better advice, but I can't say anything that would interfere with your search destiny. Grandma Athena said almost the same thing last year, Naruto said. Normally I complain, but your grandmother is right, Hermes said with a sigh, but considering what happened to your uncle, I thought I'd give it a try. You mean Luke? Naruto asked. Hermes didn't say anything, but Naruto took it as a yeah. Look Naruto, I try to help my kids when I can when I'm allowed, but we Olympians can't interfere with your destinies too much. You have to choose how to follow it, Hermes said. Otherwise I would have done something to help Luke a long time ago, or made sure your mother stayed alive. My mom Naruto said. How did my mom die? I can't tell you, not yet at least, Hermes said. But I can tell you she died as much as a hero as your father did. Despite how much I hate the fact that he sealed the fox in you. Okay, either way, I'm sure you can complete this quest, Hermes said. You're my grandson. You got my talent in stealing, handling money, and gift over locks. And with what you inherit from Athena through your dad well, Polyphemus is going to wish he never met you. Which reminds me I got something for you. Martha the package please. There was a light from Hermes' pocket and he stuck his hand in it. Naruto half expected it to be winged shoes. He heard how Hermes gave Luke a pair of winged shoes for his first quest. However Hermes pulled out what looked like an old-fashioned pocket watch. But when Naruto opened it, he found it was actually a compass with cardinal directions, only the needle wasn't pointing north, but rather south. That compass will point you to the place of your destination as long as it's a destination at sea, Hermes said. So then it's pointing at the direction of the Sea of Monsters, yes. Polyphemus Island to be exact, Hermes said. I would have given you winged shoes, but your grandmother keeps advising against it. She thinks if you get winged shoes y'all slack off on improving your chakra training. I'm good with this, Naruto stuffed the compass in his pocket. Good, Hermes said getting up. Well, I better get going. I had to put Demeter on hold again to speak to you and Shes not happy. Only because it's the fourth time tonight, Martha said. Oh and Naruto, Hermes said ignoring Martha. Our grandmother and I are proud of the decision you made tonight. That took a lot of courage. A lot is an understatement, George said. Shush, George, Martha said. Just remember what I said, Naruto. You have good instincts, use them, Hermes said. Also Naruto, you and your friends have a shorter deadline than you realize, so you should try to make the quest as quick as possible. Maya. His running shoes sprouted wings, and Hermes flew off into the sky and disappeared. Naruto stood there watching the night sky. Olympus. That night after Hermes let Naruto, the Olympians were having yet another emergency meeting to deal with the situation in camp. Hermes showed up acting like he didn't know anything, knowing Mr. D will show up bringing news about the quest. 
although most Olympians were aware of it by now. Sure enough, the doors opened and Dionysus came in. Much to the Olympian's surprise, Dionysus seemed to be in a good mood for once, instead of his grumpy usual self. Dionysus, what word do you bring on my daughter's tree's condition, Zeus asked. She's still dying and the barrier is fading, father, Dionysus said, however, there is new hope. A quest been issued for the search of the Golden Fleece. The woman next to Zeus with black long hair frowned. The Golden Fleece. But that's been missing for centuries. That's what we thought too, Hera, Dionysus said, but it turned out one of my satyrs Grover Underwood have created an empathy link to Peter Johnson I mean Percy Jackson and alerted him that he has found the Golden Fleece while searching for Pan. The Sidon had a sudden worry look on his face. He knew that his two sons had left for the quest, but he wasn't aware of the empathy link on older son Percy. So woes on this quest? Ares asked. Leading the quest is Naruto Uzumaki, Dionysus said. Ares sneered at the thought that the Jinchuriki that outbested him was leading such a quest. Athena swelled with pride when she heard Naruto was leading the quest. As for his two companions I picked the daughter of Hebe from the elemental nations, Himawaki, Dionysus said. Anada Hayuga, Athena corrected. The daughter of a minor god. Hephaestus asked. Dionysus shrugged. The third companion was chosen by Tantalus Clare something. Clarus. Ares responded. A child of mine is working with that demon. Suddenly Ares found himself being glared down by Hermes and Athena with so much killer intent he backed down. It's a risky move, Artemis said. Tantalus choice, Dionysus said. I still don't like that boy, Zeus grumbled, but if he can save the tree holding my daughter's spirit, he'll let it be. Now if there is nothing else, meeting adjourned. No arguments there, Ares sneered, I got some business to take care of. No one argued as there were several bright lights and the Olympians left the throne room. Naruto did finally get some sleep after talking with Hermes, but not much. By dawn Naruto left the ship and waited at the beach for his comrades. Anada and Claris showed up with their packs ready for a long quest. Hey Uzumaki. Where were you? Claris asked. Malcolm said you never came back to cabin 6. I needed to clear my head after hearing the prophecy, so I decided to camp out, Naruto said. Wait, why were you talking to Malcolm? What happened to Annabeth? Aunt no. She wasn't there, Clara said. Naruto frowned. That was weird. So what was the prophecy? Claris asked. Naruto sighed and recited the prophecy. Claris seemed rather shocked, but slightly pleased about her getting to succeed in this quest, but did seem concerned about two friends being imprisoned in stone. They are all prophecies like that. Hinata asked. If I had to guess from Percy's prophecy and the one I got, I would say pretty much, Naruto said. So how do we get to the Sea of Monsters? I got something, Claris dug through her pocket and took out an old coin. My dad visited me in a dream last night. I think he heard your prophecy because he wanted me to humiliate you during the quest in return of giving me this. Sounds like Ares, Naruto sighed. Well what do you do? Claris cleared her throat and started speaking in ancient Greek. Kalo ton of mata ton strashotin pu exakolathe na exapirate ton pateramu ton ari. Naruto automatically translated as. I call on the spirits of soldiers that still serves my father Ares. Claris tossed the coin into the ocean and it dissolved into the sea. At first nothing happened, but then a huge dark spot appeared under the water. Then a large ship with the height of 20 meters high from the top of the beam. It had three beams to it and the main body was colored black, while well it was black underneath. There were manholes and ports on the side of it where Naruto guessed had cannons stored. On the side in white writing it read CSS Birmingham. What's the CSS Birmingham? Naruto asked. The Civil War ironclad, Clara said. It served the Confederates during the American Civil War. How on earth did Ares get his hands on this? Naruto asked. Any soldier that died on the losing side of war still serves under my father, Clara said. Children of Ares can command them too. W we better get on board, Hinata said. Naruto nodded. They climbed a ladder to the deck where they were in for a surprise. In front of them was a large group of skeletons, all wearing Confederate uniforms. They were either cleaning or checking things over before setting sail. One skeleton with a captain's medal on his hat was giving out orders. Claris took charge and walked up to the captain. Captain. The captain turned and stared at her. At least they could guess he was staring at her as he didn't have eyes. Well, the first line of the prophecy makes sense now, Naruto thought. The captain looked Claris over, as if he was trying to decide whether or not she was worthy enough to command the ship. Claris looked as if she was beginning to lose her patience. I guess you will do, the skeleton said in a gruff southern accent. Not much to you. I was expecting someone a little bigger and manlier, but beggars cannot be choosers I suppose, he said before he turned around. I suppose a woman will have to do. He managed to walk away in time for Naruto to create shadow clones to help hold back Claris from ripping the skeleton captain's skull clean off his body as she screamed and protested. It took a while, but Claris did calm down. 
By that time the captain showed up with two skeleton soldiers with classic old muskets in their hands. These two soldiers will take you down to your quarters. You should have what you need in there. They nodded and Naruto gave the captain his compass to give to the navigator. He explained what it did. The captain nodded and headed off to give it to the navigator. Where did you get that? Claris asked. The are not the only one who got gifts last night, Naruto said, my grandfather paid me a visit last night. Hermes? The same. The two soldiers led the down into the ship where they showed the group the kitchen area, where the cannons or weapons were stored, the brig where they kept prisoners, and their rooms. There were two rooms, one for Hinata and Claris to stay in, and one that Naruto got all to himself, since he was the only male demigod on this quest. Well now what? Claris asked Naruto. What do you mean? Naruto asked. Claris rolled her eyes. I may have command over this ship, but you're still quest leader legacy boy. Alright Naruto scratched the back of his head, sorry, I'm still new to actually being quest leader. Claris snorted. Obviously. Why you will be fine, Naruto, Hinata assured Naruto. Thanks, Naruto responded, well, I guess since we'll be setting sail soon, the best thing to do is get our bearings together. Claris and Hinata nodded and they split up into their rooms. Underneath the earth of the sea floor on the edges of the Sea of Monsters and leading out towards the Atlantic Ocean, there lay a giant's undersea cavern. There stood four towering iron rock pillars with celestial bronze chains wrapped around each of the pillars' midsection. Each pillar was located at the far edges of the cavern. Stood in the center of the underground cavern was a creature that stood as high as the pillars. Anyone that saw it would see it was the size of a skyscraper. The creature had a humanoid-like figure with a fish-like head, an upper body and arms that looked like tentacles, while the bottom half of it had eight more tentacles. On its back was a dorsal fin and rows upon rows of sharp teeth. All six of its eyes were shut as it breathed deeply like an airplane flying bee. The chains wrapped around its arms and tentacles thrummed with energy as the chains glowed a slight turquoise color. A color of the sea. Then suddenly there was an explosion in the cavern. Massive rocks and rubble began to part before the whole of the cavern became visible. Floating through was a figure that stayed hidden from the light, but it showed having a human-like body, but with a fish tail instead of legs. Holding up a pointed spear towards one of the chains and blasted a purple beam of energy at it. It hit the chains and destroyed them. When the chains broke, the giant creature opened all six eyes. Its body spasmed a little and creaked loudly from staying in its stand-up position for so long before it gave a mighty roar that shook the entire cavern. It started pulling at the other chains until it broke free. The figure that freed the beast quickly disappeared into deep waters before the beast shot out of there and swam away from the cavern, causing havoc everywhere it goes. Nearby a dolphin wearing armor and an Atlantic-like helmet was patrolling the area when the beast swam off over him, narrowly avoiding him by pure luck. The dolphin found himself shaking with fear as he recognized the beast. He quickly turned around and headed back to Atlantis screaming, the kraken is free. After hours of sailing Naruto got really, really bored. It got to the point Naruto started adventuring around the ship asking the soldiers either about the civil war they fought in, or about how the CSS Birmingham worked, or about their families they once had. He never pushed it when he reached a private matter. At first the Confederates didn't mind as they actually found it amusing that Naruto didn't know a thing about the civil war. But after a few hours Naruto started losing track of which Confederate soldier he already interviewed, considering most looked the same being skeletons in Confederate uniforms, and started asking the same Confederates over and over and over, and it got annoying. Finally, Claris had to pull Naruto away from the Confederates so they could get back to work and banned him from asking any of the soldiers questions that don't relate to the quest. Now he was at the front of the ship bored out of his mind again. Hey are you okay, Naruto? Hinata asked. Yeah, just bored, Naruto said, it doesn't help that I'm now banned from asking the Confederate soldiers questions that's not related to our quest. W well, maybe we can train together, Hinata said. I mean I don't know how effective my gentle fist would be against a monster and you have enough experience to help me. Naruto grinned, sure. So where do you want to start? I mean, I don't know any technique that might work with your clan jutsus. W well, how about we start with a spar, Hinata said. Sure, Naruto responded. Hinata took her fighting stance as Naruto took his. You make the first move, Naruto advised. Hinata nodded and charged at Naruto. Naruto quickly sidestepped. Naruto caught Hinata's arm and threw her over her shoulder. Hinata barely managed to regain balance and land on the ground, but monsters will always try to take you down, so it's important to stay on your feet, Naruto said. But you can't let a monster get hold of you either. If they do, they won't just knock you down, they will kill you, right? Hinata said as she kept charging. This went on as Naruto continued giving Hinata advice. At one time Claris came to check on them and after seeing them spar, she decided to train as well. Finally Hinata dodged one of Naruto's roundhouse kicks and struck him in the side. Naruto groaned. Eh sorry. Hinata apologized. It's okay, Naruto groaned. 
I'm just glad you weren't really using your clan's gentle fist. Let's call it for now. Anata nodded. Maybe we can work on some ninjutsus. Maybe Naruto looked thoughtfully. Oh. I know. Naruto took out a scroll from his seal pocket and opened it revealing further seals. I got these from the camp store in case I needed them for training. Naruto unsealed a bucket of water balloons. Water balloons? Claris asked. Are you sure you didn't get them for pranks? Naruto rolled his eyes and took out a water balloon and held it with one hand. Suddenly the layer of the water balloon started poking out like something inside was trying to break out until the balloon burst sending water everywhere. Never mind, Clara said. This is the first step of mastering the Rasengan. Rotation, Naruto said. The task is that you must spin your chakra within the balloon until it burst. So wait, you're teaching Hinata one of your jutsus? Clara asked. Yep, Naruto said. My dad invented the jutsu and taught it to his sensei, who taught it to me, and now I would teach it to Hinata. I would teach it to you, but I don't know if you could you know. I get it, Clara said. You keep your techniques to yourself. Clara stormed off. I said something wrong, didn't I? Naruto asked. No one dared to answer, not even the confederates. After a while Hinata wasn't able to burst a balloon, but she did manage to get the water and the balloon to rotate. Naruto called it after Hinata started breathing heavily, signs that she was running low on chakra. Naruto decided to go after Claris to apologize for whatever he said wrong. From what he and Hinata could guess, Claris was jealous, probably because of the fact that two out of three of them can use jutsus, which makes her feel like she was the weakest of the three and thinking themselves as weak doesn't exactly fit well with children of Ares. Sadly, Naruto didn't find her in the captain's quarters, or the kitchen, or the armory. Where could Claris run off to? Naruto asked. Lost your comrade already? A grumpy voice said. Naruto looked over to see Mr. D standing there leaning against the wall with a Diet Coke in his hand. Mr. D? What brings you here? Naruto asked. Mr. D shrugged. I won't stay long. I'm simply here to ask whether Peter and Annabelle are here. He asked in a bored manner as he took a sip from his drink while tapping his foot. Naruto was confused. No. We've been at sea since we left. The only company we had were dead Confederate soldiers. That's a pity. They must have gone another way, Mr. D responded. What do you mean, gone another way? Has something happened? Naruto asked urgently. Mr. D glanced at Naruto. It seems your aunt and best friend along with their Cyclops friend has decided to take matters into their own hands and have left the camp in order to retrieve the fleece and Grover. What? Naruto yelled so loud Mr. D rubbed his ear. What were they thinking? I don't know, Mr. D stated. Going on a quest they were not chosen to go on along with leaving the camp without the permission of the camp or the activities director is strictly against the rules and they must be punished for them. If you, Himawaki, and Clary come across them which I have a feeling you will, tell them that they have been kicked out of camp and are not to return again. Pick out. Naruto responded. That's a bit extreme for just leaving camp without permission. Mr. D snorted a little. No, it's not. It is a fitting punishment for them. The rules are there for a reason. If they are not going to follow them then punishment must be give. But some rules are meant to be broken, Naruto said. There must be some other punishment you can give them. Mr. D raised an eyebrow curiously. Like what? Naruto sighed deeply. He knew it would have to be something Mr. D would no doubt enjoy and Annabeth and Percy will hate. And as much as he hates the fact of Annabeth and Percy getting kicked out of Camp Half-Blood, he does agree that they should be punished for leaving the camp. How about Percy and Annabeth have to help the Harpies clean up after dinner for the rest of the summer for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Mr. D had a thoughtful expression, like the idea amused him. They would also have to be my personal servants and have to do what I have to say or else be kicked out. It was still pushing it, but Naruto nodded. Deal. If I see them, which I hope I do, I will inform them of their punishment. Is there anything else? Mr. D rubbed his chin a little before shrugging. None that I am aware of. I better head back to camp and see if Tantalus doesn't have any more problems. Apparently the mystery prankster didn't stop when you left. Have fun and don't die. Mr. D clicked his fingers and disappeared in a purple mist that smelled like grapevines and wine. Naruto sighed. He couldn't believe Annabeth and Percy did that. Well actually, he can believe Percy doing something this stupid, but he had hopes that at least Annabeth would at least stop him. Then he remember how Hermes suddenly showed up on the Greek ship as if he'd been there for a while. Grandpa, you didn't have something to do with this, would you? Naruto thought. Then another thought occurred to Naruto, Hell have to break the news to Claris, and if she was mad before she'll be furious when she finds out about Percy and Annabeth. Claris never got along with either one, and the fact Percy and Annabeth left camp to take part of this quest behind their back's chances were Claris is going to take it the wrong way. Gods of Search Olympus help me, Naruto muttered. Well it turned out Claris was in the engine room. Naruto don't know why she was there, but she looked a bit shaken up. Naruto called a team meeting in the captain's corridor to discuss what he learned from Mr. D. 
As expected, Claris didn't take it well as she threw a huge fit on how it was their quest and threw furniture and the captain's skeleton skull a few times across the room. The skeletons didn't revolt when she threw their captain's skull across the room, but they had a new sense of impression toward the daughter of Ares. We should just leave them behind to die. Clara said. Well I'm quest leader and I say we don't. Naruto said. He'll Iris message them after lunch and get their location. Since they're part of the quest, they will be our comrades. Then Naruto doesn't leave a comrade behind, Hinata explained. HMPH, fine. Claris responded. Now if this meeting is over, I'm going to my room. Naruto didn't argue as Claris left. Well, she's definitely Ares daughter rage, pride and all, Naruto joked. Hinata giggled. She never met Ares, but even she heard of Naruto's and Percy's fight with the search god of war. Naruto smirked a bit before frowning. I better go contact Annabeth and Percy. I still can't believe they left camp. Then maybe they had a good reason, Hinata said. Naruto nodded. I know Percy's reason. His fatal flaw is personal loyalty, same as mine. But I would think Annabeth tried to reason with him. Naruto sighed, well I better go on deck while Theers still lied out. You um, how does Iris messaging work? Hinata asked. Oh yeah, I forgot you never seen someone using Iris messaging before, Naruto said. Come on. He'll show you. On deck Naruto went to the bow of the ship. Iris is the goddess of rainbows as well as a messenger goddess. Not as big as my gramps, but still reliable especially to demigods, Naruto said, since we can't always ask Grandpa Hermes to send messages, we use Iris' own rainbow messaging or Iris messaging to contact each other when needed, as long as we pay Iris for her service. At least that's the way it is for demigods. I doubt Iris will charge her bosses for using her rainbow messaging. Plus, with Iris messaging, we can be more face-to-face -face with the person you're contacting. Y'all find out what I mean when we get a connection. Hinata nodded in understanding Naruto's explanation. But she was more focused on the water. You um Naruto, isn't that a rowboat? Hinata pointed out to the sea. Naruto looked out at sea and saw a rowboat. It is. But why is it out here in sea? Naruto asked. As they got closer they noticed a human arm hanging out of the boat but not moving. Naruto's eyes widened. Slow the ship down. What? The captain asked. Naruto and Hinata pointed at the sea and the captain saw it. He didn't like it but he slowed the ship down. When the captain did, Naruto jumped off the ship. Naruto. Hinata yelled. Naruto landed on top of the water and ran to the rowboat. Once he got to the boat, he rolled the person inside onto his back to get a good look at him. It was a boy maybe two to three years older than Naruto. He had blonde hair and tan skin like Naruto's. He had wounds scattered all over his body, along with his clothes being in tatters. Naruto checked for a pulse. It was faint, but it was there and awfully slow. Naruto knew immediately this kid needed immediate medical help. Naruto opened the eyelids having a sneaking suspicion what this boy was. When he did his assumptions were correct. The boy had steely grey eyes like Annabeth and the rest of his aunts and uncles of Cabin 6 Athena's cabin. The son of Grandma Athena, Naruto thought. What is he doing out in the middle of the sea? Naruto didn't ask questions as he summoned four shadow clones. Stop any sea creature or monster that tries to attack. The clones nodded as they surrounded Naruto. Naruto knew it was rare for a child of Athena to travel in Poseidon's domain. Naruto had guessed at him being good friends with Percy kept him alive, and the fact that Annabeth was traveling with Percy and Tyson probably kept her safe. But this kid was on his own, and Naruto doesn't know Poseidon well enough to know how the sea god takes to the idea of children of his rivals being in his domain. Naruto picked up the older boy and hefted him over his shoulders. However, the moment Naruto touched the water, they were attacked. Good thing Naruto used shadow clones like he did, otherwise he would have to fight shark men with an unconscious demigod on his back. That's right, shark men. They were bigger than Naruto with the body of a shark, but with arms and head like a human wearing armor. They jumped out of the water, ready to attack. However, one of Naruto's shadow clones jumped and kicked it back into the ocean. More started coming though. Run. Naruto heard Hinata yelled. Naruto did just that. Every time a shark man attacked, one of his clones blocked it. Some grew smarter and attacked as a team and destroyed Naruto's clones before one jumped at Naruto from behind. Boom. The shark man exploded in a golden dust that sprayed all over Naruto and the boy. Naruto looked up and smirked when he saw Clara standing there with one of the ship's cannons pointing at the shark men with a crazy smile on her face. Looks like you found us some fun, she said as she fired another shot that destroyed yet another shark man. Another shark tried to attack Naruto, but an arrow flew out of nowhere and hit it in the neck, causing it to dissolve. Naruto saw Hinata on the bow of the ship with her bow and arrow out and her Byakugan activated. Every time a shark came near Naruto, she shot with such precision that the arrow immediately destroyed the shark men with one blow, as if she knew where the shark men were most vulnerable. Bow and arrow really is the best weapon for Hinata, Naruto thought. Naruto climbed onto the deck of the ship. I need help. Naruto yelled. 
this guy needs a doctor. The Confederates didn't hesitate as they helped Naruto get the boy to the sick bay for emergency treatment. The shark men circled around the ship. Lord Poseidon, please do something about the shark men, Naruto prayed. Poseidon must have been in a listening mood because within minutes the shark men backed off. Howards. Get back here. Clarice yelled. Enough, Clarice. Naruto ordered. We got more urgent matters to tend to. They headed down to the medical bay but were forced out by the skeleton doctor treating the boy. Naruto told them how he had steely gray eyes and other traits of children of Athena. What was a child of Athena doing in the middle of the ocean? Clarice asked. I don't know, Naruto said. He was completely unconscious when I found him. Some of his blood must have dropped into the water and attracted the shark men. Naruto, are you okay? Hinata asked. Naruto nodded. I know I just met the guy, but if he truly is my uncle. Naruto didn't need to finish as Clarice and Hinata nodded. Then the skeleton doctor came out and they rose. How is he? Naruto asked. He is not good, the doctor said in a gruff tone. The boy must have been out here for days if not longer. Starvation is evident along with sunstroke and burns. He has cracked and broken bones all over his body and has massive internal bleeding. I'm surprised he has managed to stay alive for so long. Is there anything we can do? Naruto asked. The doctor shook his head. I've given him some morphine to help with the pain, but I doubt he will last the night. All I can do is make him comfortable, he said before he walked past them and headed away. The demigods just stood there in a little shock and now in a somber mood. It's a shame we don't have one of those Apollo kids here, Clara said. Maybe one of them could help the guy. Maybe, but here is nothing we can do now, Naruto sighed. Since Hess my uncle and I saved him, he'll stay and watch over him. Clarice, since your father gave you this ship, I'm putting you in temporary command until further notice. Clarice didn't argue as Naruto got up and headed into the sick bay. The guy was in the only occupied bed in the room. He was bandaged up around his body arms and even legs, anywhere he was injured. Naruto stayed by the boy the whole time. Hinata and Clarice would come down to check on them. By dinner time, Hinata brought Naruto his meal so he won't stave himself. During the whole time Naruto been praying questions to Athena. Why the guy was in the middle of the ocean. What kind of quest was he in? What happened to him? If Athena kept an eye on her kids and legacies, he had hoped that Athena would know the answers, but if she did, she wasn't telling as Naruto got no answers. Then Naruto's mind wandered to Annabeth. She'd been a camper for six years, maybe she knew this guy. Too bad he didn't get the chance to Iris message her. Naruto's thoughts were interrupted when he heard a groan coming from the guy. The guy's eyes looked like they were flickering wildly under his eyelids. Naruto wondered if he was having some type of nightmare. Gently moving forward, Naruto shook him a little to see if it would wake him up and perhaps he could get some answers. That's when the injured teen suddenly shot up from his bed and began to scream loudly that could be heard across the ship. Do, take it easy, Naruto said, a little surprised by the sudden scream as he placed his hands on the guy's shoulder. You are not well. If you keep this up you won't survive much longer. The guy looked at Naruto with terror filled in his eyes. Who who are you? He asked. Naruto gulped. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, I'm the grandson of Hermes and Athena. Grandson of Athena, the boy said in disbelief before he collapsed back on the bed and his body started to spasm as if it was on its last leg. Naruto tried summon shadow clones to hold the boy down, but before he could, the guy grabbed the collar of his shirt and dragged him down, so he was looking into the wide scared eyes of the boy. The guy's hand went in his pocket and pulled out a silver coin that had an owl on one side with Greek letters around it. Naruto recognized the owl as the symbol of Athena. The mark, he whispered. The mark of Athena. I failed my quest. Apologize to my mother for my foolishness. The mark of Athena remains still. He placed the coin in Naruto's hand and collapsed back onto the bed. The spasm stopped and Naruto had a sinking feeling that was it. Naruto was in total confusion. He never heard of the mark of Athena. No one in cabin 6 mentioned anything like that. The doors to the med room suddenly shot wide open and Hinata Claris and the skeleton doctor appeared in the room looking at Naruto and the motionless boy. They must have got out of bed because Hinata and Claris were in their pajamas. Naruto quickly stuffed the coin in his pocket. What happened? Claris demanded. Naruto answered the best as he could the guy having nightmares, him shooting up and screaming as Naruto tried to calm him down. He did he say anything? Hinata asked. Before Naruto could reply, he heard his grandmother's voice calling out in his head. Do not tell them anything. Naruto was caught off guard by this. He'd been praying to Athena all night for answers and now that she answer and she tell him this. Listen carefully, Naruto. What you have stumbled upon is something you weren't meant to know. No one but the chosen aunts of uncles of yours is allowed to know. Not even Annabeth knows about it, Athena warned, tell your friends, and you can stay in cabin 11 for now on. Naruto could tell from the tone of his grandmother's voice she was dead serious and mentally nodded. No, Naruto replied. He didn't say anything. 
just murmurs that I couldn't make out. My guess is that the nightmare was too much for him. Claris and Hinata nodded. They looked over at the doctor only to see that he closed the boy's eyes and covered his head with a bedsheet. The boy has passed on. May he go to Elysium, the skeleton said before leaving. Naruto walked over to the body and pulled out a scroll and some brush and ink. He opened the scroll and started writing seals in kanji on it before laying it over the body. Then Naruto made some hand signs, placed his hands on the scroll to apply chakra. There was a puff of smoke, and the body disappeared as the scroll fell onto the bed. What did you do? Claris asked. I made containment seals in the scroll so I can preserve the boy's body, Naruto said rolling up the scroll and putting it back in a pocket. That way we can return his body to camp in one piece. Claris didn't argue against that. Hinata kept quiet, but she looked at Naruto like she was seeing a different person than she knew from the Leaf Village, a more mature and responsible version of Naruto that wasn't there when she last saw him in the Leaf. Naruto laid in his bunk as the last words of the boy and the warning of his grandmother replayed in his head. Just what did I stumble on? Naruto thought. Why was Grandma Athena so dead set to keep it a secret? He heard knock on the door. Come in. Naruto called. The door opened and Hinata entered. Hinata, what are you doing here? Naruto asked. I thought I'd check on you, Hinata said. I'm fine, Naruto responded. Naruto, why you just saw your uncle die, Hinata said. I'm fine, Naruto snapped before taking a deep breath. Sorry Hinata, it's been a long day. I it's okay, Hinata responded taking a seat in the room. Why you want to talk about it? Naruto was silent trying to decide what to say. I never thought it would bother me so much. I never knew the guy, and yet the fact he turned out to be one of my uncles my own family that I'm still learning about I don't know. I feel like I wish I could know the guy before his death. It's only natural, Hinata said. I guess, Naruto said. Naruto, you're the kindest person I know, Hinata said, if the boy wasn't your uncle, would you let him die alone? Of course not, Naruto said. No one should be alone, especially when they're dying. That's when it dawned to Naruto where Hinata was going. Thanks Hinata, Naruto said. You always seem to know what to say. Hinata smiled. No problem. You better go back to your room and get some sleep, Naruto said, tomorrow we might have to fight off some kind of monster that probably would be attacking Percy Annabeth and Tyson. Hinata smiled and nodded before leaving the room. The next morning, Naruto got up at the crack of dawn in order to make an iris message. With everything that went on, Naruto forgot to contact them last night. He dressed in an orange t-shirt, gray sleeveless hoodie and blue cargo jeans with his combat boots. Naruto stood at the bow of the ship and took out one of his drachmas. Oh Iris, goddess of rainbows, accept my offering and show me Annabeth Chase. He flipped the coin in the air and sprayed a bit of water over it before a misty screen began to form. After a few seconds a screen lit up and showed him the images of Annabeth, Percy, and Tyson. Tyson and Percy looked like they were asleep while Annabeth was leaning against the base of a tree. They looked like they were hiding out in some kind of den of sorts. When Annabeth didn't notice him, Naruto coughed loudly to draw her attention. It did just that as her head whipped around to look at him. When she saw Naruto through the iris message with his arms crossed looking at her sternly, she felt as if her stomach dropped a little, and he noticed her eyes go wide. Then Naruto, she muttered still surprised to see him through the iris message. Annabeth Chase, what part of I don't go back on my word do you and Percy not understand? Naruto asked. Do you two realize how much trouble you two are in? I know you're angry, but please understand. Percy wanted to go after you guys and save Grover, and I couldn't stay behind because of my promise to Chiron, and I wanted to make sure Grover was safe too, Annabeth said. You could have stopped him. Naruto stated. How did you guys even get out of camp? Annabeth turned slightly search pink. We had a little help from your grandfather and Poseidon. Naruto blinked a little, Grandpa Hermes helped you leave camp. Well, not really, Annabeth said, more like encourage Percy. Naruto sighed. Of course he did. Wait, how did you find out we left camp? Annabeth asked. Mr. D paid me a visit. He thought you three might have hitchhike a ride with us. Naruto said. By the way, you owe me big time for making a deal with Mr. D, so he won't expel you three from camp. Annabeth looked up like the news hit her hard. He was going to expel us from camp. Yes he was, but I talked him into agreeing to a lighter punishment, Naruto said. You and Percy will have to do kitchen duty for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of the summer, as well as be Mr. D's personal servants. That's a lighter punishment. But was that her expulsion, Naruto said. Annabeth sighed. Fine. Good. Now, since you three decided to take part of this quest, we will have to pick you up, Naruto said. Where are you? The Sapiak Bay, Annabeth told Naruto of the swamp area with the tree hut she Thalia and Luke stayed at once before. She also brought up how they got there. Using horsefish-like creatures called Hippocampi, Luke's ship, and a lifeboat. Naruto nodded his head, thanking the gods that they were relatively close, but he frowned when he heard about the ship. Especially of how Krono's been gathering forces of both demigods and monsters. 
He was even surprised to hear Chris Rodriguez was among them. I see no wonder Grandpa Hermes step in like he did, Naruto said. Naruto, that's not all, Annabeth said. Beside Luke, there was a golden sarcophagus, and it had symbols all over it. Symbols of the side. The symbol of Kronos. Luke told us that Kronos was inside it at least a manifestation, anyway. Luke says the more they can convert to their side the stronger Kronos gets. Naruto muttered under his breath. We'll deal with it when we can. Meanwhile do not leave your location unless your life depended on it. We'll come and get you. Okay. And thank you Naruto. She said before the iris message disappeared. I better head to breakfast, Naruto muttered to himself. At breakfast Naruto informed Clarice and Hinata about the situation, as well as had the captain prepare a third cot in the girl's room and two more in his own. So we have to go get them, Clara said. That's right, Naruto said. Like it or not they're part of our quest now. And as the prophecy stated, only united we can get the golden fleece. Wonderful, Clarice grunted out before she began walking away. It'll go and give the navigator their coordinates. Clarice left the room. Here's something else, isn't there? Hinata asked. Naruto sighed. My gramps had a role in persuading Percy. Apparently he had hopes Luke can be redeemed and brought back to her side, which is why he had them sent to the Princess Andromeda. They failed though. Not surprised considering how much Luke hated Hermes. He hates his dad. Hinata asked. Naruto nodded. From what I've been told. I don't know why, but I do know Thalia being turned into a tree and Gramps sending Luke to complete a task only Hercules ever been able to do didn't help. And I doubt seeing all the unclaimed go well unclaimed didn't help either. He sounds like Sasuke with his hatred toward Itachi, Hinata said. Naruto opened his mouth to protest, but he realized Hinata was right. He seen personally how much Sasuke hated Itachi. Heck, the reason Orochimaru was able to warp Sasuke's mind was because of his hatred toward his older search brother. And I wanted to save Sasuke from Orochimaru, just as Hermes and Annabeth wanted to save Luke from Kronos. Naruto thought. Well we better get ready for our new comrades, Naruto said. Hinata nodded. Later that day. Naruto Hinata and Clarice were on the bow of the ship looking over the piece of land in front of them, looking for anything that would stick out as a hideout. They have to be close, Naruto said, Hinata, try to find them with your Byakugan. Hinata nodded and made the hand sign. Byakugan. The chakra network in her eyes bulged out as her bloodline activated. That creeps me out, Clarice muttered. It look as if she can see through anything. Technically she can, Naruto responded. Not helping. Then Hinata gasped. You found them? Naruto asked. Yeah, but we got to get there fast, Hinata said. They followed Hinata's direction, and soon enough they could hear the sound of fighting, shouting, and roaring through the air. They finally found the trio as well as what they were fighting. It was a giant serpent-like monster that Naruto had to admit was very ugly, and a head that looked familiar. It had front and back legs with sharp talon-like claws on its feet, and had five long necks and a familiar snake-like head with horns and rows of teeth. It was a light gray in color, and was spitting out gobs of green acid which the demigods had managed to dodge. How on earth did they attract a hydra? Naruto asked. The what? Hinata asked. A monster that grows two heads every time one cut off, Clara said. Percy no. They heard Annabeth yelled as Percy sliced off a head of a hydra. However, instead of destroying it, two more heads grew. Like that, Clara said. Percy really need to pay attention to monster fighting class, Naruto said as an idea flashed in his head. Hinata, do you have any paper bombs? Why yeah, Hinata said. Great. Attach it to one of your arrows and shoot at the Hydra, Naruto said. Hinata nodded. What are you up to? Clarice asked. Just watch. Naruto said. Hinata took out a tag with kanji seals and wrapped it around the bronze staff of her arrow. Then she notched it and fired it. The arrow successfully struck through the Hydra head but didn't seem to do anything. However the paper bombs started sizzling. Annabeth. Percy. Tyson. Get down. Naruto yelled. There is a paper bomb attached to the arrow. Percy and Tyson was confused, but fortunately Annabeth understood and knocked the two down before the Hydra exploded, sending monster dust everywhere. Clarice whistle. Destroying a Hydra with an explosive piece of paper. That's the first for me. Annabeth, Tyson and Percy finally noticed the ship that was on the bank of the island now as Naruto cast down the ladder. Unless you guys want another monster to attack you, I suggest you climb on board. Naruto yelled. It was noon at the CSS Birmingham as Naruto Hinata Clarice Annabeth Percy and Tyson sat around the table looking at a map of the Bermuda Triangle as they made preparations to enter the Sea of Monsters. Percy and Clarice managed to stay out of eye contact with each other and only talk to each other when necessary. The first day they were on the ship together, they got into a huge argument until Naruto stepped through. Also what happened their first day on the ship the Confederates befriended Annabeth with her being from Virginia. They were friendly with Percy too, since he had the same last name as a southern general, until they found out Percy was from New York. Then they started treating him like he was something they didn't like. 
So when should we arrive at the entrance? Percy asked as he examined the map. Within an hour, said Annabeth. That's if as soon as Naruto agrees to go through the clashing rocks. Correct me if I'm wrong, Annabeth, but didn't the Argo took damage trying to enter the Sea of Monsters? Naruto asked. It's that or through Charybdis and Scylla, Annabeth argued. I'm okay going through Charybdis, Clara said. My cannons can blast her. If you mind me asking, but has anyone ever destroyed Charybdis and Scylla? Naruto asked. No. They're too big and too powerful to be destroyed by any demigod weapon, Annabeth said. Who are Charybdis and Scylla anyways? Percy asked. Sea monsters who guard the well the Sea of Monsters, Naruto said. Right. Yeah, but there is more to it, Annabeth explained. Charybdis was a sea creature who was the daughter of Poseidon. And a loyal powerful one at that. She used to follow Poseidon around the seas and destroy anything he asked her to destroy until one day they crossed the line, and Zeus punished Charybdis by turning her into a real destructive monster. What's up with the gods creating monsters as a form of punishment? Naruto asked. That's only half of the story of those who guard the sea of monsters, Annabeth reminded Naruto. We also have Scylla who once was a sea nymph who was once considered very beautiful until one day she caught the eye of the fisherman god who wanted her. When she denied him he turned to Circe for help. And let me guess, this Circe made things worse, Naruto said. Way worse, Annabeth said. As it turns out, Circe had also fell in love with the god. She wooed him with her sweetest words and looks, but the sea god would have none of her, which made Circe furious with Scylla. She prepared a vial of very powerful poison and poured it in the pool where Scylla bathed. As soon as the nymph entered the water, she was transformed into a frightening monster. What about this clashing rocks you mention? Percy asked. Just some magical boulders enchanted to clash with each other at the rate that it's difficult to time correctly, said Clarice like it was no big deal. I personally prefer the former beauty nymph and Percy's cursed half-sister, Naruto said. Hey. Percy responded. Besides, judging from what Annabeth said, I think I got an idea how to distract the monsters long enough for the CSS Birmingham to get through, Naruto said. You guys remember the summoning jutsu I brought up last year. You mean toads that can go from the size of a small dog to a skyscraper? Percy asked. That's right, Naruto replied. One of them helped my dad fraught the nine-tailed fox before he sealed it in me. And the very same toad helped me fraught off the shukaku during the sand and sound invasion on the leaf. If I can get him to agree, he might be able to help us distract at least Charybdis while the CSS Birmingham crosses the border. Might? Clarice asked. This toad summoning isn't always agreeable type of person, Naruto said. He still expects me to seal a deal of me being his henchman with a drink of alcohol. Sounds like someone I would like, Clarice said. It does sound safer than the clashing rocks, Percy admitted. I want to go with the Safeta route, Tyson said. Fine, Annabeth said. But I do have one question is your toad friend at least a saltwater toad? Unaruto responded. I never found out does it matter. Even if Hess Naughty can walk on water, like myself. Annabeth sighed. Never mind. Hopefully your toad friend will help under the circumstances. You and me both, Naruto thought to himself as the lines of his prophecy involving the nine tail fox replayed in his head. Naruto shook his head mentally. Naruto called to Ford to think about the prophecy. Before Naruto came to this world, he'd been about going against the odds, proving Niji wrong about fate. Just because Naruto find out the fates or actual goddesses doesn't mean Naruto have to turn into another Niji case, following fate idly as if knowing what would happen. Tyron said himself, prophecies are never clear until it happens, Naruto thought. The fates are mysterious that way. You can't follow them idly if you never know what they have planned for you. Naruto going to reach the limit of his control over the Kyuubis power fighting his greatest enemy. Fine. Naruto still plans to deal with it under his circumstances. We better get ready, Naruto said. We got an hour until we enter the Sea of Monsters. Everyone nodded and headed down to the cabins to pack their gears. Naruto did a quick weapon check and found his kunai said shuriken safely secured in his pouch. He pressed the button of his pen and it extended to katana form before he butted it in his hand and returned into its pocket form. Naruto then strapped on his breastplate and tied on his forehead protector headband. Most demigods wear helmets with their breastplate, but Naruto always preferred his own ninja headband. Percy packed his whole bag, and Tyson only grabbed what he already came with. But when they went into the hallway they only found Hinata and Annabeth out and about. Clarice will be out soon. She told us to go ahead, Annabeth said. Seriously? Naruto asked. I would have though Clarice would be the first out. Well I'm not going to wait, Percy said. Come on Tyson. Tyson nodded and headed off with Percy. Annabeth followed shortly after, leaving Hinata and Naruto. Before Naruto could suggest they should go up there too, he felt a familiar unpleasant presence that made him want to pick a fight with anyone. Did you sense that? Naruto asked Hinata. Hinata didn't answer but worried look on her face told Naruto she did. Naruto drew out a kunai knife from his pouch and approached the girl's cabin door. 
He opened it slightly, just enough to hear what was going on. I don't want excuses, girl. A familiar growl was heard in the room. Naruto clenched his fist when he heard it. He recognized it as the voice of Ares. Why yes father, Clarice mumbled. You don't want to see me mad, do you? No, father. No, father, Ares mimicked. You're pathetic. I should let one of my sons take this quest. At least they won't let the demon spawn make them look weak. But Naruto is a shin. I don't care what that kid call himself. Ares bellowed. I don't care if this is even his quest. You wanted to be on this quest, and I expect you to succeed. But, suddenly Naruto heard a sound like someone punching another person, and Naruto had a good feeling it wasn't Clarice who was punching. Naruto kicked the door open revealing Ares in his usual clothing standing over Clarice, who was holding her stomach like she had the wind knocked out of here. Ares? Naruto growled. Didn't Hera ever teach you not to punch children? Get out of here, punk. This is none of your concern. Ares responded. It is when my own teammate is being threatened by their parents, Naruto snapped. Ares glared at Naruto, only to get the same glare back. Their glaring contest ended when there was a sound of thunder booming outside. They are lucky in being called back, punk. Otherwise I would kill you right here and now, Ares said. Then he disappeared in a blinding flash forcing Hinata Naruto and Clarice to look away. Once Ares was gone Hinata rushed to Clarice's side taking out a jar. Show me your stomach. Naruto headed out the hallway to wait for Hinata and Clarice. When they came out, Clarice wasn't holding her stomach anymore, but she still looked ruffled up. Thanks, Clarice said. Don't worry about it, Naruto said. You're one of my closest friends, Clarice, and I don't let anyone get away from hurting my friends like that not, even if they are their own family member. That's when the alarm started ranging and the sounds of officers yelling. We better go. Naruto responded. I still have a job to do. When they reached deck, they found Percy and Annabeth leaning over the railing as to see something in the water, as Tyson stayed back working on something that looked like a wristwatch. Clarice grabbed a pair of binoculars from a zombie officer and peered toward the horizon. There it is. Full steam ahead. Naruto couldn't see very much, but he trusted Clarice's words. The sky was overcast. The air was hazy and humid, like steam from an iron. Only when Naruto squinted really hard, he could make out a couple of dark fuzzy splotches in the distance. The engine groaned as they increased speed. Tyson muttered nervously, too much strain on the pistons. Not meant for deep water. All right, Naruto took a deep breath. This is where I should leap off. Keep a good distance from the entrance until you see a gigantic toad standing on the water, and even after that, try to avoid getting jumped on. Hanada, Incas the ship get too close to the cliff side, in counting you two keep your biakugan active to watch out for Sila. Right, Hanada said. Tyson, you think you can fix the engine? Naruto asked. Tyson looked up with his big calf brown eye wide. I should be able to. Great. Go down and keep the engine from blowing up on us, Naruto said. The battle might make the seas really rough. Tyson nodded and ran down to the engine room. Percy gave Naruto a skeptical look. Don't give me that look, Percy. We need everyone's help if we plan to make it to Polyphemus Island, Naruto responded, I need you, and Annabeth manned the cannons in case we need more firepower. Clarice, you are in charge of the ship until I get back. Naruto ran over to the railing and jumped overboard. He landed on the water with ease and ran a safe distance between Charybdis and CSS Birmingham, Olympus. Unaware that their son was running into a life-or-death battle, Athena and Hermes were attending an annual meeting Zeus had set up after his master bolt was stolen. Athena was going through the agenda of things still needed to be done as the gods were almost asleep. Even Ares, who took time off for personal business, threatening Clarice and dealing with Naruto, found himself immediately bored the moment he returned. The only one that wasn't there was Dionysus due to his suspension, but Hestia was there to act as Dionysus' replacement, since this meeting wasn't considered important enough to drag Dionysus out of Camp Half-Blood. But instead of sitting in Dionysus' throne, Hestia sat in front of her hearth. The meeting was interrupted when the throne room doors swung wide open, and a beautiful woman with wearing a green Greek dress with flowing black hair and little horns like claws sticking above it, representing her as Queen of the Sea. Amphitrite, what are you doing here? Poseidon asked, trying to hide his relief that Athena's speech was stopped. Most of the other gods we weren't much better, but there were a few curious looks as it was rare for a minor sea god or goddess or in this case, queen of the sea to come onto Olympus, much less disrupt a meeting. I'm sorry for disrupting your meeting, my lords, Amphitrite said, making sure Zeus knew she was talking to him as well, but I brought urgent news from the seas that impacts Olympus as well. We don't know how or who is responsible, but someone has released the kraken from its jail. As soon as she said the name of the beast, everyone gasped a little. Poseidon even almost dropped his trident in shock. How is that possible? Zeus bellowed. Poseidon, how could this happen? How am I supposed to know? Poseidon responded. I have Cyclops from the forges checking the sea stone and celestial bronze prison annually making sure it hasn't weakened. 
Well, it seems it somehow broke out, said Athena. The only ones who could break it out are gods and titans, and the titans are either imprisoned, disappeared, or on our side. We're not sure what happened exactly, Amphitrite said, our scout who reported it didn't see anyone who could have done it. This is not good, Poseidon, Zeus spoke. If the kraken is released then it will be your duty to bring it back since it is in your domain. Find it and put it back in its prison. For once I agree with you, brother, Poseidon agreed. Do we know where it currently is? Amphitrite bit her lip as she mustered the courage to speak. From what I've been told, it was heading west. The only thing that is west of its prison is the Sea of Monsters. That's where Naruto and his friends heading to, Hermes said. They'll be right in the Kraken's path. Athena's eyes widened as she realized the risk as well. The heart flared up as Hestia could sense the danger her champion was in. Poseidon was shaken to his core with fear and worried for Percy and Tyson. Most of the other gods found themselves worried about the young shinobi demigod as Naruto either earned their favoritism last year and or was worried what that mean to their world if Naruto died with the nine-tailed fox still sealed in him. The only one who wasn't worried and or scared of the news was Ares as he started laughing. Why are you laughing? Athena bellowed. Naruto and our kids might encounter the kraken. Your daughter might get killed and you're laughing. So? The girl is useless. That demon runt always showing her up not to mention a child of a minor god. The Kraken might as well do me a favor by getting rid of her. Ares said only to get a death glare by Hera. As much as Hera hated what demigods represents, she dosed like how Ares treat his daughters. Besides Ares continued slowly, we can't do anything about it if our kids encounter the Kraken because of ancient laws. Ares is right, Zeus said. We can't get involved directly with demigod business. No offense, Zeus, but you do realize if Athena's and Hermes' son fights the Kraken and dies, the Kraken might only be part of our problems, Artemis said. Or did you guys forget what is sealed in the boy? I hate to admit this, but Artemis is right, Aphrodite said. I know this, but law is law, Zeus responded. Technically, there is no law saying we can't help indirectly, Hephaestus said. We can do that much, which is better than risking doing nothing and facing the fox in three years. That's right, Athena said. Zeus sighed. Fine. But no direct help. Zeus waved his hand and made an iris window appeared in the front of them as the CSS Birmingham appeared on screen. To their surprise the ship had seemed to stop at a safe distance from Charybdis. What are they doing? Hermes asked. They're sitting ducks like that. This is strange, agreed Hera. Hey, woe's that running on the water away from the ship? Aphrodite asked. They zoomed in and saw Naruto running away from the ship toward Charybdis. What is Naruto doing? Hermes asked. Looks like Hess going to fight Charybdis one-on-one, -on -one, Ares sneered. I don't think so, Athena said as she noticed the familiar look in Naruto's eye that Minato had when he had an idea for battle entrance to the Sea of Monsters. Naruto stopped between the ship and Charybdis. At this point, Naruto could make out what looked like jagged rocks that he guessed was the monster. Also, at that point huge waves kept coming at Naruto every time Charybdis shoot out everything she sucked in as he tried to dodge them. Okay, this should be far enough, Naruto muttered to himself. Hopefully all that chakra control training I've been doing since I came to this world would make summoning Chief Toad easier. Naruto bit his thumb and made the hand signs before slamming his hand on the water summoning Jutsu. Naruto channeled as much chakra as he could, while sparing as much as hell need a seal of blood appeared around Naruto's hand and a huge puff of smoke. When the smoke cleared a gigantic reed dish brown toad roughly the size of a several-story high building with a blue cloak over his back, a sword strapped over it, and a pipe in his mouth. Olympians. Most of the Olympians' jaws dropped at the sight of the toad. Athena and Hermes cold help but smile proudly at their grandson, and Hestia grinned. The kid could summon Zeus muttered. Naruto's chakra control definitely has improved since his arrival in our world, Athena said. It used to take a lot from him just to summon the chief toad. That's wrong, Ares. Hermes asked. You didn't know Athena's and my grandson could summon. Shut up. Ares growled. This doesn't change a thing. Actually it does, Athena said. For you see, that's the very same toad Naruto's father my son summoned to assist him against the nine-tailed fox. The news of the toad Naruto summoned being the same one to help Minato Namaka's battle the nine-tailed fox caught many Olympians' attentions. CSS Birmingham. The demigods watching Naruto were shocked themselves. Although Naruto did tell them about his summoning jutsu, this was their first time seeing a toad that big. Not even the waves created by Charybdis was big enough to bother the toad. Bang it, Yuzumaki, Claris muttered. How am I supposed to compete against that? Amabunta. Naruto smirked at his accomplishment. And to top that off, thanks to two years of chakra control training and the fact Naruto hasn't used any jutsus yet, he still had plenty of reserve chakra left. However, the giant toad wasn't pleased as he looked around at his location before blowing out smoke from his pipe. What the where the heck am I? Naruto gave Gamabunta a greeting tap on the head. Hey Gamabunta, long time no see. 
The toad looked up and his eyes narrowed. Naruto. Where the heck have you been Gaki? Where am I? Why did you summon me in the middle of the sea? Sorry, Bunta, but I need your help to help create some distraction for my friends to get through Charybdis over there. Naruto pointed to the sea monster who had started forming a whirlpool. Or if you want, we could scale the cliff nearby and distract Sila. What do you say? Amabunta sighed and blew out another small plume of smoke from his mouth before looking up again at Naruto. Heck no. Naruto frowned. What the heck do you mean no? You heard me Gaki. Why should I help you when you are not even one of my subordinates? We have not had that drink yet. And I already told you I'm not old enough to drink. Naruto yelled. Everyone watching started snickering as Naruto and the giant toad started bickering. Olympus. The Olympians watched with interest as the two argued. Even Zeus found it slightly comical that the toad was giving Naruto a hard time. Charybdis fished sucking up water and blew out everything at cold digest, creating more waves. Not wanting to get caught in another wave of salty water, Gamabunta jumped over the wave, as well as the sea monster that Charybdis apparently sucked in. What was that? Gamabunta asked. I think Charybdis spit out a sea monster, Naruto respond. Gamabunta muttered some incoherent words under his breath before looking back toward Naruto. All right Gaki, I guess I do not have much of a choice now. But as soon as this is over, we will drink to you becoming my subordinate whether you like it or not. It'll have to run it past Chiron, but whatever, Naruto responded. So how do we distract Charybdis? Combined transformation. Water style jutsu. Sword to monster combat. Do you know any fire style jutsus? Gamabunta asked. Naruto was caught off guard. Yeah why? When I give you the cue, use your strongest fire style jutsu, Gamabunta said. Amabunta jumped in the air above Charybdis to get a good look at what they were up against. Needless to say Charybdis was a dentist's worst nightmare. Charybdis was basically one huge black maw with bad teeth alignment and a serious overbite. Jeez. Haven Charybdis heard of oral hygiene. Naruto responded as Gamabunta jumped to the cliff and then jumped off before hands came down to grab them. Hey boss, unless you want to fight Sila, I suggest you avoid the cliffs. I figured that. Gamabunta puffed some smoke. Okay, Gaki, on the next jump, be ready to attack, right? Naruto agreed. Gamabunta leaped high over Charybdis. Gamabunta built up a massive blast of oil and fired it from his mouth. Naruto made a quick series of hand signs. Fire style. Dragon flame jutsu. Naruto blew a direct root of fire into Gamabunta's oil, setting it on fire as it came down and hit Charybdis. Charybdis screeched in pain before sinking into the water. Did we destroy it? Naruto asked. I don't think so, Gamabunta said most likely stunned. Either way, this would be a good chance for your friends to cross. CSS Birmingham. My lady, the beast has subsided, the captain called. It's probably just stunned, Annabeth said. We should use the moment to get across. Right, Clarice agreed. Full steam ahead. Olympus. I have to admit, even I didn't see that coming, said Poseidon. Why didn't anyone tell me my daughter is in danger? Everyone looked to see a dark hair minor goddess coming through. Except for the hair color and eyes, Heeb had a slight resemblance to Hinata. Heeb, what are you doing here? Zeus asked although he had a good idea of what since her daughter Hinata was on the quest. I overheard my daughter Hinata might face the Kraken, and the Olympians were doing nothing about it, Heeb said. We want to help, but Zeus will only allow indirect help, Hermes said. Against the Kraken? Heeb responded. Father, I kept quiet for many things, but even I find this ridiculous. Laws are laws, Zeus responded. Oh don't give me that, Heeb said. We have bend the laws before for the sake of Olympus. The Kraken isn't a giant, Heeb. No, but it might as well be as dangerous, Athena agreed. So far the Kraken hasn't showed its ugly face anyways, Hermes said. In fact Naruto and his toad summoning just stunned Charybdis, giving his friends an opening to go through. Naruto did. Heeb joined Hestia next to the hearth and saw that indeed it was true as the CSS Birmingham passed by Gamabunta and Naruto, who were acting like honorary guards. How long has she been stunned? Too long, Poseidon said. Something isn't right. Amabunta noticed the same thing. That thing shouldn't take this long to surface. Maybe we did more damage than we thought, Naruto said. And by the way, Naruto. You never did tell me where have you summoned me. Gamabunta asked. Oh oh well, have you heard of the Olympians? Naruto asked. As in Athena and Hermes, yes. I'm aware of their existence, Gamabunta said. I did work with the fourth Hokage after all. Well, we're in their world. Naruto explained how his grandparents brought him to this world. Amabunta sighed and breathed out a puff of smoke. So Athena and Hermes took you to their world. Why am I not surprised? Minato figured they might pull something like this. Ad did? Naruto asked. Yes, but he had hopes that if the Leaf Village treated you like a hero at his request, your grandparents would let you stay in the elemental nations. Well, they did, until the Akatsuki situation rose up, Naruto said. Gamabunta looked down at the sea. 
that thing should have surfaced by now. Naruto looked at the cliff, expecting to see Sila waiting for them to use the cliff as a jumping board again. However not even the once beautiful sea nymph was hiding. They are right. Something's wrong, Naruto agreed. Naruto ran down to Gamabunta's lower back to look behind them. When he did he saw something moving through the water something with tentacles. Hey, boss. We have company. Naruto responded. Just then several octopus-like tentacles shot out of the water and started wrapping themselves around Gamabunta. We're in deep trouble now, Naruto responded. Percy Annabeth Hinata and Clarice watched as things quickly got out of control. Just when they thought they could pass through into the sea of monsters, gigantic tentacles wrapped around the giant toad with Naruto on it. What is that thing? Percy asked. Is that Charybdis? No. I don't know what it is, Annabeth replied. We need to do something, Hinata said. Naruto will be pulled under if we don't do something. Hard to port. Clarice ordered. Prepare the cannons. We got some tentacles to destroy. Yes, mom. The confederates yelled. No, Zeus argued. But Naruto and Gamma Bunta is caught in the Kraken's tentacles, Hermes argued. We can't get involved. Zeus, think this over, Artemis said. My decision is final. Zeus urged. We'll deal with the consequences later. Naruto and Gamma Bunta were struggling with the tentacles. Naruto had clicked his pen expanding it into Yuzushio no Orashi. He sharpened it with wind chakra as he tried to hack away the tentacles from Gamma Bunta. Not good, Gaki. Unless someone interferes, it'll have to disappear before becoming monster food, Gamabunta said. Gee, thanks for the loads of confidence. Naruto responded hacking through another tentacle. Fire. Naruto hear a familiar voice yelled. Suddenly there was a large explosion in the water next to Gamabunta, forcing the tentacles to retreat. Naruto looked to see the CSS Birmingham heading their way with their cannons loaded. What are you guys doing? Naruto asked. Giving you extra firepower, Clarice replied. That's why you told Annabeth and Percy to man the cannons, right? Just then the sea seemed to start rumbling with waves as a giant mass began to appear out of the water and ascend into the sky. It towered over the ship and even the cliff as it met Gamabunta in the eyes. The head was long with beady eyes and long teeth that struck out forward. Two long thick tentacles lay on each side that a bundle of small but still thick tentacles masked what it is bottom half. It had a thin dorsal fin on its back and bluish gray skin. Annabeth, what is that? Naruto asked. Oh my gods, Annabeth managed to say. Annabeth. Percy called. I, I have read about it in B-books. I.T. think that's the Kraken, the most feared of all the O-Ocean's monsters. W. We can't beat it, Annabeth said. We're dead. The Kraken opened its mouth and let out a deafening roar, forcing everyone to hold their ears. Then while everyone was in pain, the Kraken attacked the ship with one swipe of the ship, causing it to buckle. Anada, go get Tyson. Naruto yelled. Everyone get into the lifeboats. Everyone scrambled to obey Naruto. Gamabunta, I know this is more than what I ask for. It'll help, Gamabunta said as he drew out his katana. Gamabunta jumped and swinged his katana, cutting off two tentacles. But as quickly as Gamabunta cut them down two more tentacles attacked. Naruto drew out his katana and chopped them down. This is no good, Gamabunta said. Naruto, I take it you know wind-style jutsus. Yeah, why? Channel some of your wind chakra into me, Gamabunta said. We're going to combine your wind nature with water nature. Is that possible? Naruto asked. No offense, but you're pretty huge. Worth to try. Naruto nodded and placed his hand on Gamabunta. Naruto imagined his chakra splitting in half and grinding them together as he channeled wind chakra into Gamabunta. Gamabunta jumped as high as he could. Ninja art. Water pistol jutsu. Gamabunta fired a stream of wind-powered water jet that hit the Kraken. The Kraken roared in pain and swiped Gamabunta aside. Gamabunta barely landed on his stomach to prevent Naruto from falling off. Naruto. Hinata shouted as she and Tyson arrived on deck. Annabeth, Percy and Clarice were already on the lifeboats waiting for her. Hinata took out her bow and arrows and activated her by Akigen. She spotted what she was looking for and shot the arrow. With success the arrow managed to hit the Kraken in the eye, causing it to roar in pain before smashing the ship into pieces. As for the lifeboats, they were crashing down at the water until a sudden gust of wind fired out of nowhere and saved both of them as one of the lifeboats skidded away. Aki, are you alright? Gamabunta asked not getting an answer. Naruto. Naruto was shaking with anger. He cold believed it. Hinata and Tyson were on that ship and he doesn't know if they're alive or not. But that anger, Naruto felt a familiar surge of power that he knew came from the Nine-Tailed Fox. Olympus. He broke down when she saw the CSS Birmingham destroyed. Hera comforted her daughter as best as she could. As heartless as Hera could be, Heeb was one of the only child she had with Zeus, who wasn't disfigured or had a war-crazed attitude, although Heeb wasn't as marriage-loyal as Hera, and seeing Heeb like this even struck her. Poseidon was also horror-struck by the sight as Tyson was there as well. Something's wrong, Hestia said. Zoomed in on Naruto. 
They did and saw that red chakra had started seeping out of Naruto's body and forming into a cloak with three tails. Battlefield. The Kraken roared defiantly as it staggered toward. Naruto felt his mind slipping with anger to the fox's power before realizing that he was losing control. Yes, the Kaiubi said in his head, give in to the hatred. No. Naruto forced down the power surging in him, three tails is my limit, then that's what I'm sticking with. Naruto, are you alright? Gamabunta asked. Yeah, Naruto lied. Listen that combination earlier with water and wine does it work with toad oil and fire? Yeah. You think you can pull off a toad oil? Gamabunta thought for a second. Maybe one more shot. Then let's make a count. Naruto said as he made the hand sign. Shadow clones jutsu. A single clone appeared next to Naruto. You know what to do, Naruto said. Right. The clone said as it leaned down and focused wind chakra into Gambunta. The Kraken roared and moved in for the final strike. Amabunta. Naruto yelled. Now or never. Amabunta fired a wind-powered tote oil. Naruto quickly made a series of hand signs. Fire style. Dragon flame jutsu. Naruto blew a concentrated flames into the wind-powered oil, creating a massive wave of flames stronger than before. It hit the Kraken with so much force that it screamed in pain. Now let's get close. Naruto said, and within range. If we do this, I can't help you any further, Gamabunta said, I'm already at my limit. Just get me close. It'll do the rest. You know what to do, Naruto, Gamabunta said. Gamabunta charged forward as Naruto made a new hand sign. Transform. Both yelled. In a huge puff of smoke they turned into a gigantic fox with nine tails. They tackled the beast and butt down on the kraken's neck and holding it still. Now Naruto. Gamabunta yelled through the transformation. Gamabunta changed back to normal as Naruto jumped off Gamabunta. Naruto formed the Rasengan combining it with the three-tail power of the nine-tail fox, causing it to increase in size. Giant Rasengan. Naruto yelled as he slammed the Rasengan into the Kraken's skull. Good luck Naruto, Gamabunta said before disappearing into a puff of smoke. The Rasengan broke through the layers of skin and skull as the Kraken screeched in pain. Then it exploded in golden dust. After that, the Rasengan along with the cloak dissipated as Naruto fell to the sea. I'm sorry Hinata. I wish I could have beat it sooner, Naruto last thought as he passed out and hit the ocean. The Olympians watch in shock and amazement as Naruto crashed into the sea. For the first time ever a demigod had defeated the Kraken. I don't believe it, Amphitrite muttered. He did it. He actually did it. Hephaestus whistled in praise from his throne. Even Ares cold mustered the rage toward the boy with a confusion. That was amazing. Apollo cheered. Naruto actually done it. He done the impossible. I hate to admit it, but the bow I mean, the young man has earned my respect, Artemis said. Zeus, I know we can't interfere with demigod business, but I think Naruto earned himself some help getting somewhere safe where he can cooperate, Poseidon said. Zeus was frowning. The boy was too powerful, but Zeus didn't know what to do with him. Fine. Zeus said. Send the boy to Ajija. At least their head be out of our hair until he cooperates. But that Poseidon snapped his fingers and on the iris green, Naruto disappeared in a bluish light. Thank you Poseidon, Athena said. No problem, Poseidon said. Your grandson deserves it. Now if the meeting is over, I better go see if it's possible to retrieve the bodies of Hinata. He'd nodded as the gods disappeared. Naruto didn't remember what happened after he passed out, but he was certain the only landmass anywhere near where he fell was Silas Cliff, not an island resort. At first when Naruto woke up, he thought he was in the fields of Elysium. Then he remembered that even if he had died, due to arrangements made between the Greek gods and the death god of the elemental nations, he won't go to the underworld if he had died. He looked around and found himself in a cave with stones that glowed to the point they lighted up the room. He was in a comfortable bed still dressed, although his clothes looked like they'd been to war. Naruto groaned and covered his eyes trying to remember what happened before he passed out. Kraken. Battle. CSS Birmingham being crushed. Percy, Annabeth, and Clarice getting away. Anada and Tyson getting caught in the destruction. Crash landing into the ocean after defeating the Kraken. Odds I hope at least Annabeth, Percy, and Clarice got out okay. Naruto muttered. I'm sure they're fine. Said a soft and friendly voice. Naruto reached in for his pouch and took out a kunai knife and turned to see a girl with caramel hair and dark almond eyes. She wore a white ancient Greek chitin, and although she looked no more than a year older than him, Naruto could sense she wasn't a mere mortal. Who are you? Where am I? How did I get here? My name is Calypso. You are at my island of Ajija. As for how you got here, I think the gods send you here to recuperate. I'm surprised you are already awake. I thought you would be out a day or two. Naruto lowered his kunai, but didn't put it up. Something about the girl's name and the name of the island sounded familiar. Still, he felt he should say something. I'm a fast healer. I heal faster than even my aunts and uncles after eating ambrosia. My name is Naruto Uzumaki grandson of Hermes and Athena. I know well who you are, Naruto. 
Even on my magical island, news of your amazing victory over the Kraken has spread, Calypso said. Seriously? Naruto asked. How long was I even out? Well, on this island, you've been out for a day. But outside the magical barrier well, time is hard to tell, Calypso said. Time is hard wait, this place isn't like the Lotus Casino, is it? Naruto responded. Ah man. That's not good. I got to get back into the real world. Calypso hardened. Oh, I see. I guess this Annabeth and Claris must be special for you to want to return to. What? Naruto asked. Annabeth is my aunt, and Claris is a good friend of mine. Why do you even ask that? Oh it's just that whenever the gods send me a hero, it's always someone who's already in love with someone and leaves to meet with them, Calypso said. It's part of my punishment. Punishment? Then it dawned to Naruto where he heard the names before. Oh, Yaur that Calypso. The one who helped Odysseus after he was shipwrecked. That's right, Calypso said. I fell in love with Odysseus, but he left to save his kingdom and return to his wife. It's always been like that unfortunately. Naruto rubbed the back of his head. Ah, yeah, well, I don't have a wife to return to heck, I don't even have a girlfriend, but I really need to get back out there. I'm supposed to be leading a quest to recover the Golden Fleece and save the sadder name Grover from Polyphemus. Just then Naruto's stomach growled so loud that even Calypso could hear it. But I guess I should first get something to eat. You won't happen to have Raymond on this island do you? Calypso giggled. I don't have Raymond, but I can make something. Great. Naruto responded. After Calypso fixed dinner she tried to delay Naruto leaving by making him tell her a bit of himself while they eat. Although she quickly learned she didn't need to worry about Naruto only eating a bowl or two and leaving as he ate 20 bowels before she had to make a new batch of her stew. I have to admit, I never thought of stew being this good, Naruto said. Im stuff. Im not surprise, you ate 40 bowls, Calypso said. So I guess you have to leave now. Yeah, but it'll definitely come back for your stew one day, Naruto said. That's impossible, Calypso said. You mean because of the sea of monsters, Naruto responded. No, it's not that. Ajija is enchanted in more than one way, Calypso said. Those who leaves my island never come back. It's part of my punishment. For what? Assisting your dad in the Titan War? Naruto asked. You deserve to have visits. Well, the gods do help me, said Calypso. Including your grandfather. Well that's great for Grandpa Hermes, but do they visit you all the time? Naruto asked. Well, no. You deserve someone to keep you company more than whenever they're available. You deserve a friend to keep you company, Naruto said. I see what loneliness can do to a person, so I know what I'm talking about. Heck I experience loneliness for most of my life. Maybe so, but not seeing those who leave my island again is my punishment, my curse, and my search fate, Calypso said. Search fate again. Naruto sighed. Forget them. I've been defying the impossible for a long time now, and I will defy against the odds. He'll see to it that Yao will have visitors other than the gods. Thank you, Naruto, Calypso responded. After dinner Calypso packed Naruto some food from her garden, which Naruto found amazingly full of delicious fruits and vegetables, and some clothes before taking him to the beach. So, I guess I just walk on the water and it'll be off the island in no time, Naruto said. Calypso frowned. You can walk on water. Ah yeah I never told you where I from, did I? Naruto asked. I just figured you were from the mainland, Calypso said. Well, I am, but it's complicated. Naruto explained. I'm from another world called the Elemental Nations. The world full of ninjas and samurai who can use chakra. Calypso asked earning a confused look from Naruto. Just because the gods don't visit me at a daily basis doesn't mean they don't tell me what been going on in the outside world or in other worlds. Oh, right, Naruto said. Sorry. That's okay, Calypso said. But you don't have to worry about walking on water as I have a more simple method. Just say. I want to leave the Jija and a raft will appear. Okay. Naruto took a deep breath. I want to leave the Jija. Sure enough, a raft floated out through the mist. This raft will magically transport you to wherever you want to go, Calypso said. Sweet, Naruto responded. This will save me chakra. Thanks a lot Calypso. And don't worry about me breaking my promise. I never break my promises. That's my ninja way. Halyapso smiled and kissed Naruto on the cheek, much to his embarrassment. Just go save your camp. Naruto clambered on his boat. At first Naruto thought of saying take me to my friends, but then Naruto remembered his friends were split up when the Kraken attacked the ship, and Naruto isn't sure how that would affect the magic on the boat. Alright, since we should all be heading to the same place Naruto took a deep breath. Take me to Polyphemus Island. The raft started floating off toward the mist as Calypso watched. Typical. The only boy I ever seen in hundreds of years who turned out single, and he ended up only giving me the quickest visit, Calypso said. Yes, well, Naruto won't admit it, but has concern of his friends, said a new voice. 
Calypso jumped and turned to see Hermes standing there in a delivery man uniform. Lord Hermes, what brings you here? Calypso asked. Well, I've been watching over my dear grandson and overheard what he said about how you shouldn't be left alone, so I decided to do something about it, Hermes said as he started. It's not freedom, as Zeus still won't allow it. But maybe the fates allows it when he master his father's jutsu, Naruto will be able to return thanks to this. Hermes took out a chakra metal made kunai with three pointed prongs. What is that? Calypso asked. A three prong kunai. It belonged to Naruto's father my son-in-law which he used for a jutsu Athena and I hope Naruto master someday, Hermes handed her the kunai. Naruto hasn't mastered it yet, but he has been known to defy against the odds. That seems to be his search fate even if he doesn't realize it or accept it. Now sign here to prove you got the package and I be on my way. Calypso sighed as she signed the pad Hermes gave her to sign before he disappeared. Typical Olympians, Calypso responded. She then looked down at the kunai knife. I never go break my promises. That's my ninja way. Calypso strapped it to the strap around her waist. Well, at least I got something else to look forward to. At first, Naruto found sailing rather relaxing. Hardly any monsters attack, allowing Naruto to sit back so his raft can magically move forward. Thankfully, to Naruto's amazement, it only took an hour for the raft to make it ashore. He thought for sure it would take him a day or two to catch up to the others. The island was saddle-shaped with forested hills and white beaches and green meadows. Naruto didn't know if this was his location since he didn't have his compass on him when he fought the Kraken, but Naruto somehow sensed it was. It wasn't like whenever Naruto was on a path or road and he can sense it. It was more like a tingling sensation through his body, like something was there that was so valuable, he had the urge to go get it. Naruto docked his raft next to a lifeboat that was ashore. When Naruto checked out the lifeboat, he found the word saying. CSS Birmingham. Well, that's reassuring, but where is everyone? Naruto said. Naruto. Naruto yelled a familiar voice. Naruto turned only to get body slammed into a hug by a blonde blur. Naruto chuckled figuring who it was. Nice to see you too, Annabeth. Annabeth released Naruto just as Percy showed up and punched him on the arm hard. You idiot. We thought for sure the Kraken killed you. What happened? Naruto regaled how he and Gamabunta, along with the power of the Nine-Tail Fox, although Naruto left out how he felt himself losing search control at first, deep fright, and grind the Kraken into monster dust. Naruto, that's amazing. Annabeth responded. No demigod ever has defeated the Kraken. You have to be the first. So what happened after that, Percy said. How did you find this raft? Well as it turns out, I somehow appeared on this island called Ajija passed out. When I woke up, I met the Titanus Calypso. She fixed me a meal to eat, packed me some supplies and helped me get this raft, Naruto responded. You just left. Just like that, Annabeth said. Well, I did promise Calypso that I would find a way to visit her, Naruto said. Naruto, no one returns to Ajija, Annabeth said. Odysseus had spent his remaining life trying to return and never did. Yeah, but Odysseus isn't a trained shinobi, Naruto responded. Annabeth shook her head. Even she knew telling Naruto what was impossible just drives him to accomplish it more. So wait, you got a mini vacation after defeating the Kraken? Percy asked. That's not fair. We had to deal with Circe and the Sirens before coming here. I was even turned into a guinea pig. Naruto snorted. Seriously? Unfortunately yes, Annabeth said. If it wasn't for the vitamins your grandfather gave us, I would have been turned into a guinea pig as well, and we wouldn't be here. Did you two get any word on Hinata and Tyson? Naruto asked. Percy looked depressed at the mention of his search brother's name, which basically answered Naruto's question. Sorry Naruto. No. Annabeth said. Oh. We better go get the fleece, Percy said. Right. It's this way, Naruto said. How do you know? Annabeth asked. It's hard to explain, but I'm getting this tingling feeling through my body, like I can sense something valuable is here, and unless Polyphemus collects gold, I figured it must be a fleece. Wait, you can sense valuable objects? Percy asked. It's another power of Hermes, Annabeth said. It's the reason why children of Hermes can't tell a difference from a fake and a real deal. They can sense a value of an object, but they can't summon it. Since Naruto could sense the location of the golden fleece, they decided to search for Grover and whoever arrived on the lifeboat first. The cliff ended up being barely climbable, so Naruto decided to use a shadow clone to help him carry Annabeth and Percy up the cliff as he walked up it as if it wasn't vertical. That was fun, Naruto said. There. Bellowed a voice that made the three of them to jump a little. They looked over the ledge, which dropped off on the opposite side, where the voice was coming from right below them. The hour feisty one. The deep voice said. Challenge me. Said another voice. Give me back my sword and I'll fight you. That's Claris, Naruto said as the monster roared with laughter. I recognized that voice anywhere. They got closer to the edge and saw what was the entrance of the Cyclops cave. 
Below them stood a giant single-eye humanoid that Naruto recognized as a cyclops, he guessed was Polyphemus and Grover, who was wearing a wedding dress, which Naruto had to bite his lip to prevent himself from laughing at the sight. Clarice was tied up, hanging upside down over a pot of boiling water. Hmm? Polyphemus pondered. Eat loudmouth girl now or wait for wedding feast. What does my bride think? He turned to Grover, who backed up and almost tripped over his completed bridal train. Oh, um, I'm not hungry right now, dear. Perhaps, but you say bride. Clarice demanded. Who Grover? Shut up, Annabeth murmured. She has to shut up. Polyphemus glowered. What Grover? A satyr. Clarice yelled. Oh. Grover yelped. The poor thing's brain is boiling from that hot water. Pull her down, dear. Polyphemus' eyelids narrowed over his baleful milky eye, as if he were trying to see Clarice more clearly. Naruto noticed that Polyphemus was wearing a crude kit and shoulder strap, stitched together from baby blue tuxedos, as if head skinned an entire wedding party. What sadder? Asked Polyphemus. Satyrs are good eating. You bring me a satyr. No, you big idiot. Bellowed Clarice. That satyr. Grover. The one in the wedding dress. Clarice really needs to know when to keep her mouth shut, Naruto responded. You think? Percy responded. Polyphemus turned to Grove and ripped off his wedding veil revealing his curly hair, his scruffy adolescent beard, his tiny horns. Polyphemus breathed heavily, trying to contain his anger. I don't see very well, he growled. Not sign many years ago when the other hero stabbed me and I. But you are no lady Cyclops. The Cyclops grabbed Grover's dress and tore it away. Underneath, the old Grover reappeared in his jeans and t-shirt. He yelped and ducked as the monster swiped over his head. Stop. Grover pleaded. Don't eat me raw. I I have a good recipe. Polyphemus was hesitating, a boulder in his hand, ready to smash Grover. Recipe? He asked Grover. Oh, why yes. You don't want to eat me raw. Yowl get E. coli and botulism and all sort of horrible things. It'll taste much better grilled over a slow fire. With mango chutney. You could go get some mangoes right now, down there in the woods. It'll just wait here. Naruto winced. Grover's lying skills sure hasn't improved much since last year. True, Percy agreed. If it wasn't for Polyphemus being blind and stupid, Grover would have been eaten the moment he was captured. Would you two be quiet? Annabeth snapped. Grilled sadder with mango chutney, Polyphemus mused after pondering about it. He looked back at Claris, still hanging over the pot of boiling water. You a sadder too? No, you overgrown pile of dung. She yelled. I'm a girl. The daughter of Ares. Now untie me so I can rip your arms off. Rip my arms off, Polyphemus repeated. And stuff them down your throat. Naruto didn't say it out loud, but Clarice was starting to remind him of the nine-tailed fox the first time he talked to it back when Jiraiya threw him over the cliff. You got spunk. Let me down. Polyphemus snatched up Grover as if he were a wayward puppy. Have to graze sheep now. Wedding postponed until tonight. Then well eat sadder for the main course. But Yara's still getting married. Grover sounded hurt. Woe's the bride. Polyphemus looked toward Clarice. Clarice made a strangled sound. Oh, no. You can't be serious. Im not. Polyphemus plucked Clarice off the rope like she was a ripe search apple and tossed her and Grover into the cave. Make yourself comfortable. I come back at sundown for big event. Then the Cyclops whistled and a mixed flock of goats and sheep flooded out of the cave and passed their master. As they went to pasture, Polyphemus patted some on the back and called them by a strange assortment of names. When the last sheep had waddled out, Polyphemus rolled a boulder in front of the doorway, shutting off the sound of Clarice and Grover screaming inside. Mangoes, Polyphemus grumbled to himself. What are mangoes? He strolled off down the mountain in his baby blue groom's outfit, leaving the boulder as the only thing keeping Naruto, Annabeth, and Percy from Grover and Clarice. Naruto recommended using the Rasengan to drill his way in, but Annabeth turned it down. We can't risk letting Polyphemus know we're here until we can get to Clarice and Grover, Annabeth argued. Don't you know any Jutsus that can move Earth or something? Percy asked. If you are talking about Earth-style Jutsus, then no, Naruto replied. The only way I can think of to defeat Polyphemus and free our friends is through trickery, Annabeth said. How? Percy asked. I haven't figured that part out yet. Great. Percy said. Well we better think of something before sunset, otherwise Grover would be Polyphemus' dinner. Not to mention Polyphemus marries Clarice and since Polyphemus is your paternal half-brother she becomes your new sister-in-law, Naruto said. Gee, thanks for putting that thought in my mind, Percy grumbled. Hey. Didn't Odysseus use some kind of trick to sneak him and his men in and out of Polyphemus' cave? Naruto asked. Annabeth's eyes widened. You're right, he did and we can use it to trick Polyphemus once more. When I suggested this idea, I thought it'd be the one invisible. Annabeth argued as she and Percy was tucked under two massive sheep. Because in case the plan goes downhill, at least I have a better chance against Polyphemus than you too, Naruto said. 
I hate to admit it, but Naruto is right, Percy said. I just wish it smells better down here. Think of it like this, Percy. The natural scent of a sheep herd should mask yours and Anubis' demigod scent, Naruto said. They didn't have much time to argue as the sun started going down and the cyclops roared, oi. Goaties. Sheepies. The flock dutifully began trudging back up the slopes back to the cave including the two carrying Annabeth and Percy. All right. Time to bring our plan into action, Naruto said. Naruto stayed back as Polyphemus herded the sheep into the cave. Naruto's job was simple keep Polyphemus from closing off the cave. Simple, but not easy to survive from. Chances were Polyphemus would try to kill Naruto on the spot. But Naruto had an idea as he made the hand sign. Multi-shadow clone jutsu, Naruto thought. But that two dozen shadow clones appeared around Naruto. You know the plan. Distract, Polyphemus and refer to yourselves as nobody. Naruto ordered. Yes, sir. The clones yelled as they jumped off in different direction. Polyphemus had finished hurting the last sheep in including the ones carrying Annabeth and Percy and was about to seal the cave when Naruto's voice yelled, Hey, stupid. Polyphemus stiffened. Who said that? Nobody, stupid. Naruto's voice came from a different direction. Nobody. Polyphemus yelled back. I remember you. I doubt that. Your brain is too small to remember anything, much less nobody. Naruto yelled from another direction. Polyphemus bellowed furiously as he grabbed the nearest boulder which happened to be the one he was using as a front door and threw it toward one of the voices. Annabeth and Percy heard the rock smash into a thousand fragments. Miss me. Miss me. I hope you don't want to kiss me. Naruto teased at a random direction rephrasing the last bit of the teasing. Polyphemus howled. Where are you nobody? Come here so I can kill you. Didn't your mommy ever tell you if you tell someone to come to you to kill you, that gives the person a more of enough reasons to avoid you? Maybe she did, but you are too stupid to remember. Polyphemus barreled out of the cave to search for the source of the teasing. Once it was clear, Naruto snuck into the cave. Well, finding two dozen nobodies should keep him busy for a while, Naruto said. Naruto. He heard a familiar voice cried as someone nearly tackled Naruto into the ground with a hug. Long time no see Grover, Naruto chuckled as he turned to see his sadder friend. Thank the gods you are alive. Grover cried. Claris told me you fought the Kraken and was most likely dead. And I almost believe her until Percy and Annabeth said you survived. Naruto chuckled. Not only I survived but I defeated the Kraken. Are you kidding me? Yelled Claris as she showed up with Annabeth and Percy. I thought wise girl and Prissy was lying about that. No joke, Naruto said. I'm the first demigod ever to defeat the Kraken and live. That's great and all, Annabeth said, but our quest is only halfway over. Just right, Percy said. We still need to find the Golden Fleece. Right. We better get going while my clones have Polyphemus distracted, Naruto said. At that moment Naruto had a flashback of one of his clones being destroyed by a flying olive tree. And we better make it quick, Naruto said. By the way, Claris, how did you make it here? Naruto asked as they snuck out of the cave, did you grab the compass before you left? With this, Claris took out the pocket watch compass. The compass, Naruto said, I thought it went down with the ship. Nope. I just so happened to grab it before reaching the lifeboat, Clara said. To be honest, I don't know how I got here first. My lifeboat washed up ashore here. What about you? We got a magical raft from Calypso, Percy said. Calypso? Grover asked. Yeah, after my battle with the Kraken, I appeared on a Jija, Naruto said. I left after woke up and Calypso treat me to something to eat, she told me how to summon a raft, and soon after I was off. You just left, Clara said. You didn't stay any longer. Nope, Naruto said. But he did promise Calypso that he would return, Annabeth said. Just to visit, said Naruto as he was starting to get tired of this topic. Naruto winced as another shadow clone memory flashback occurred. What was worse was that Polyphemus was starting to get frustrated chasing multiple faces. Come on guys, I don't know how long Polyphemus keep chasing my clones. Grover and Naruto led the way to the Golden Fleece. Soon they were at a bridge that leads across to the tree. I better send a clone to see if there are any other guardians the fleece, Naruto said. Good idea, Annabeth agreed. Naruto summoned one more shadow clone. Sneak up ahead and see what is protecting the fleece. If it attacks, let it so I know what we're dealing with. Yes, sir. The clone ran across the bridge, and less than 15 minutes later Naruto received its memory of a herd of sheep surrounding the clone, trying to eat its flesh. Not good, Naruto said. Polyphemus has a whole flock of man-eating sheep guarding the fleece. Are you sure? Annabeth asked. Yeah, I'm certain, Naruto said. I can almost feel where the sheep chopped down on my clone. How are we supposed to get past that? Percy asked. At that moment, Naruto received a fresh memory of Polyphemus barreling through yet another clone and straight toward the bridge. Guys we better hurry. Polyphemus is. How long do we have until Polyphemus discovered us? Annabeth asked. Suddenly they heard Polyphemus roared as he came rushing out of the fields at him. 
I finally found nobody. Polyphemus roared. Dead across the bridge. Naruto yelled. Everyone rushed across the bridge as Polyphemus approached the bridge. Annabeth, your dagger. Naruto said as he took out his kunai knife and started cutting ropes. Annabeth nodded and took out her dagger to do the same thing, just as Polyphemus started crossing the bridge. They cut through the ropes just as Polyphemus was over quarter away across the bridge as it fell. Unfortunately, none of them took to think that the Cyclops could jump pretty good jump the rest of the way and barely landed on the ledge. Failed. Nobody failed. Polyphemus yelled with gleam. Just then something whooshed by and struck him in the eye dead center of his pupil. My eye. Nobody struck my eye again. Polyphemus cried as he covered his now bleeding eye. But before he did, Naruto noticed what struck him. At that moment, Polyphemus staggered backwards in pain and fell off the ridge. What hit him? Annabeth asked. An arrow but how? Clarice asked. Naruto had an idea as he turned to the path. Halfway down the path to the beach, standing completely unharmed in the midst of a flock of killer sheep, was Tyson, who was carrying Hinata on his shoulders away from the sheep as she had her bow out and Byakugan active. Hello search brother and friends. Tyson called waving his hand. Uh, Tyson, Hinata said as one of the sheep got too close to her shoe. No. Bad sheep. Bad. According to Hinata, hers and Tyson's survival from the Kraken was thanks to a half-fish half-horse or as Annabeth called it. A hippocampus Tyson befriended named Rainbow back when Rainbow and his friends carried Tyson Percy and Annabeth to Luke's ship. Rainbow had found Tyson and Hinata sinking beneath the wreckage of the CSS Birmingham and saved both of them and got them away from the battle. Once the battle was over, they tried to search for Naruto, figuring he was floating somewhere, but by the time they started searching, Naruto was already transported to Ajija. Unable to find Naruto, Hinata and Tyson decide to search for the rest of their friends through the Sea of Monsters until Tyson caught scent of sheep and with the help of Hinata's Byakugan, found this island in no time. So in the end each group found the island in our own way, Clara said. Probably best that way, Annabeth said. If we had stuck together I don't think even Tyson being a Cyclops be enough to scare away the monsters. Yeah, but we still need to get the fleece, Percy reminded them. Naruto got an idea. Hey Tyson. Hinata. Can you lead the sheep away from here so we can get the fleece? I think so, Hinata said as she kicked away a hungry snout. Annabeth caught onto Naruto's plan. Just give us enough time to get to the beach and meet us up there at the big pirate ship called the Queen Anne. That should be big enough to carry all of us. Tyson whistled. Come, sheepies. Follow me. He jogged off into the meadow with Hinata still on his shoulders since there was no way for her to get down without being surrounded by man-eating sheep as they started following them. Naruto ran up to the tree with a golden ram's fleece. Naruto didn't even had to ask if that was the golden fleece as he could feel its power and could sense that it was the real deal. Naruto removed the fleece from its branch, causing the tree to turn yellow. Sorry, but Thalia's tree need this more, Naruto said as he draped the fleece over his shoulders. When he did, he felt as if every bit of chakra he used on the shadow clones to distract Polyphemus returned to him immediately. In fact, Naruto felt like he could go one-on-one -on -one with Polyphema several times and win each time, as long as he had the fleece. Oh yeah. This will definitely save Thalia's tree, Naruto thought to himself. Naruto reached his friends with new energy. Before we head to the ship, does anyone need healing from the fleece? Naruto asked. I'm good, said Percy. Same here, said Annabeth. I can survive without it, said Clarice. We don't need it, Naruto, Grover said. Soon they were at the edge of the water, and Percy used his powers to bring the pirate ship he and Annabeth came in from where it was. Tell me again why he called and figure this out while we were fighting Charybdis. Naruto asked. Or against the Kraken. Because Percy is a seaweed brain, Annabeth replied. I can hear you. Percy responded. Just as a ship started turning toward them from the tip of the island, they heard someone yelled. Incoming. They turned to see Tyson and Hinata who must have found a way to get off Tyson without having sheep on her bounding toward them with the sheep following them. Shadow clone jutsu. Naruto made the hand sign. Three clones appeared around them. Pick a clone to ride on, Naruto said. We're running to the ship. Hinata, we're walking on water. Hinata nodded. Annabeth climbed on Hinata's back as Clarice Grover and Percy each took a clone, leaving Naruto with a very heavy Tyson. Okay, sorry Tyson, I'm not going to be able to carry you, Naruto said, we'll need another way to get you to the ship. Nay. At that moment a half-horse half-fish with rainbow scales came out of the water. Rainbow? Tyson yelled. That would work. Percy said. With that, Tyson joined Rainbow and they raced to the ship. However they didn't get to the ship as when they were only a few yards from it before two huge boulders flew in the air and smashed into the Queen Anne's Revenge, destroying it and sending it into the bottom of the sea. Ha ha. You may have blind me, nobody, but from the sound of it, I took out your ship. Polyphemus cheered from the edge of the beach. In a fit of anger, Percy waved his hand and summoned wave that hit Polyphemus, sending him backward. 
Great, now what? One of the clones asked. We can't carry all of you back to the mainland, said another. They're right, Naruto said. Rainbow Nate and splashed the water with his hooves. Uh, Percy Naruto responded. Rainbow is calling us help, Percy responded. Sure enough six more hippocampi showed up. That would definitely work, Naruto said. With the clones' help, everyone clambered onto their own hippocampus before sailing off. As they leave Polyphemus Island behind, they could hear Polyphemus yelling. No. Father, please help me. Curse nobody for me. Naruto chucked as he thought to himself, good luck with that. I doubt Poseidon would listen to his son to curse two more of his kids. The journey went so smoothly Naruto fell asleep on his hippocampi. Although truth be told the fleece may have restored Naruto's chakra levels, but it didn't keep him from exhaustion. Still, the gods must be grateful for what he and his friends have done, because for the first time in a long time, Naruto had a dreamless sleep. Who could blame the gods? Naruto and his friends got the golden fleece. All they had to do was make sure the fleece is returned to Camp Half-Blood, and it would be a complete quest. First quest Naruto got to complete as team leader. Not to mention, if Naruto was able to bring back honor to Cabin 11 by just taking part in a successful quest, Naruto probably bring great honor in Cabin 11 for leading a successful quest to save the camp. Not to mention the honor to Cabin 6 and to Hestia. But the one thing Naruto was looking forward to was finally getting some well-deserved sleep in his bunk at Cabin 6. Not even Tantalus can deny him of that. Then when he finally has his good night's sleep, Naruto plans to find a way to convince the gods to hire Chiron as Camp Half-Blood's activities director once more. As much as Naruto loved pranking Tantalus, Naruto started to miss the old centaur even more. And maybe with Chiron back working at Camp Half-Blood, he can help Naruto find a way to make it where Naruto can visit Ajija. Hey Naruto. Time to wake up. Grover hollered. Leave me alone. Naruto muttered. Just then a small wave hit Naruto in the face, forcing him as splutter awake. Percy? Naruto responded. I never thought I'd see the day someone had to wake you up, Yuzumaki, Claris laughed. Shut up. Naruto muttered. Why did you wake me up anyway? We're close to the mainland, Hinata replied. Naruto looked up and saw that in the distance the sun was setting behind a city skyline. Naruto could see a beachside highway lined with palm trees, storefronts glowing with red and blue neon, a harbor filled with sailboats and cruise ships. Where are we? Naruto asked. It's Miami, Grover said. I recognized it when I was being chased by Polyphemus. Yeah, but the hippocampi are acting funny, said Annabeth. Naruto noticed that Annabeth was right. Their fishy friends had slowed down and were winning and swimming in circles, sniffing the water. They didn't look happy and one of them sneezed. Percy, translation. Naruto asked. They're saying this is as far as they'll take us, Percy replied. Too many humans and too much pollution. It looks like we'll have to swim to shore on our own. I'm up for a good swim, Naruto said. Percy Annabeth Grover Claris turned to Naruto surprised. What? Naruto asked. Do you even know how to swim? Percy asked. Ah yeah. I've been swimming long before I knew how to walk on water, Naruto said. Same here, Hinata agreed. We believe you, Annabeth said. We just never seen Naruto swim. That's because I never had a good reason to, Naruto said. Most of the time I'm in the water, I'm having to stand on water to fight monsters or rescue someone or something that would be faster to be done if I run on water. True, Claris responded. They thanked Rainbow and his friends for the ride as they got off the hippocampi. Tyson cried a little as he unfastened the makeshift saddle pack head made, which Naruto noticed contained Tyson's tool kit and a couple of other things head salvaged from the Birmingham wreck. He and Hinata both hugged Rainbow, and Tyson gave him a soggy mango head picked up on the island as they said goodbye. Once the hippocampus white manes disappeared into the sea, they swam for shore. The waves pushed them forward, and in no time they were back in the mortal world. They wandered along the cruise line docks, pushing through crowds of people arriving for vacations. Porters bustled around with carts of luggage. Taxi drivers yelled at each other in Spanish and tried to cut in line for customers. If anybody noticed the group, they sure didn't let on. Now that they were back among mortals, Tyson's single eye had blurred from the mist and Grover had to put on his cap and sneakers. Even the golden fleece had transformed from a sheepskin to a red and gold high school letter jacket with a large glittery omega on the pocket around Naruto as he was still wearing the fleece. Annabeth ran to the nearest newspaper box and checked the date on the Miami Herald. She cursed. June 18th. We've been away from camp 10 days. That's impossible. Clara said. I'm afraid so, Naruto responded. Alia's tree must be almost dead, Grover wailed. We have to get the fleece back tonight. How are we supposed to do that? Claris asked. We're hundreds of miles away. No money a ride. Naruto slumped down. This was his first quest as quest leader, and it already seemed to failure. And yet, Naruto felt like he was forgetting something something that might help them finish this quest and save Thalia's tree. Naruto thought back to what the oracle said. You shall sail the iron ship with warriors of bone. Done that. 
you shall despair for two friends while one entombed in stone. Naruto grieved for Hinata and Tyson, thinking they were dead, and Clarice was imprisoned in a cave by Polyphemus. The demon's power shall reach its limit when you fight your greatest opponent. Double check as Naruto reached the three tail stage when he fought the Kraken who was without a doubt his greatest opponent. United you will retrieve what you seek. Naruto checked that off the list as they were able to retrieve the golden fleece when they came together. Then Naruto thought of the one line that had confounded him since he heard it. But only the daughter of war can succeed. He never could understand what that means, but now, they'll be right back. Naruto said as he rushed off to the nearest bank. His friends were confused until Naruto came back with cash. Naruto, where did you get that? Annabeth asked. I tapped into my trust fund, Naruto replied. Considering this is an emergency, I figured we have nothing to lose risking it. But Naruto, I can't fly on anything but a Pegasus, Percy said. I know, that's why Clarice has to take the fleece back to Camp Half-Blood, Naruto said. The last line of my prophecy said, but only the daughter of war can succeed. It meant only Clarice can take the fleece back to camp. Naruto took off the fleece and handed it and the money to Clarice. I got out $300 that should be enough to get you to New York and have enough change to call a taxi to Camp Half-Blood. Finish the quest. Make Cabin 5 and your dad proud. Clarice studied Naruto for a bit, then gave him a big friendly bear hug. Thank you Naruto, she said as she let go, but if you tell anyone I hug you it'll beat you up. Naruto didn't answer as Clarice called a cab and got into the cab. Soon enough the cab peeled out in a cloud of exhaust and the fleece was on its way back to Camp Half-Blood. Are you sure about this? Annabeth asked. We don't have much of a choice, Naruto explained. Come on, guys, Percy said. Let's find another way home. Percy turned only to find a sword's point at his throat. Hey, cuz, said a 20-year-old with sandy blonde hair and a deep scar on his face. Welcome back to the States. Just then two bear man monsters appeared on either side of the group. One grabbed Annabeth and Grover by their t-shirt. The other tried to grab Hinata and Naruto, but Naruto jumped out of the way as Hinata ducked. Hinata activated her by Akigen and sent a painful gentle fist into the monster's gut as Naruto jumped in the air and kicked the bear man in the face. The combine attack sent the bear man lumbering backwards until it tripped over some carriages. Back down. The guy said calmly. Unless you want Aureus there to bash Annabeth and Grover's heads together. The bear man known as Aureus grinned and raised Annabeth and Grover off the ground, kicking and screaming. What do you want Luke? Naruto growled. Luke smiled, which caused his scar to ripple on the side of his face. He gestured toward the end of the dock, where a cruise ship with the front had the mast of a woman chained to a rock, and on the side of the ship said. Princess Andromeda. Why, I'm here to extend my hospitality, my dear nephew, said Luke. The bear twins herded the six of them aboard the Princess Andromeda. They threw Percy, Annabeth, Grover, and Tyson onto the aft deck and shoved Naruto and Hinata next to their friends, since the bear twins can't carry more than two at a time. In front of them was a swimming pool with a sparkling fountains that sprayed into the air. A dozen ladies with snakes instead of feet, laced Dragonians, and demigods in battle armor gathered to watch the hospitality. Naruto Uzumaki, destroyer of the mighty Kraken, Luke said. I must admit, when I heard you defeated the Kraken, I thought it was some kind of trick, but now that I see that you're alive, I guess I was wrong. Most of the monsters and demigods shifted where they stand. What can I say? Even the mighty Kraken has something to fear from the future hokage of the village hidden in the leaves, Naruto joked. Ah, yes. Your silly childhood dream. Which brings me to this young lady. Luke pointed his sword at Hinata. I don't recognize you, but I'm guessing from how easily you helped take down one of the bear twins, you are from the elemental nations too. Hinata didn't speak, but Luke took it as a yes. HMPH. The gods must be desperate to send another one of their kids from the elemental nations to this world, Luke said. I'm guessing from your appearance, you are the daughter of Heed, the minor goddess of youth, right? Did she tell you, you would be stuffed into my father's cabin before she took you here? I choose to come here. Hinata responded. I wanted to come here, and my mother was fulfilled my wish. Luke's fist tightened. Naruto got the feeling that Luke didn't like hearing how some gods paid more attention to their kids than he got from Hermes. Naruto agreed that it was unfair, but he knew that the gods have their traditions and laws. Enough talk. Luke said. Where's the fleece? He looked over Naruto and his friends, prodding them with his sword, as if expecting to find it under their clothes. Not here, Percy said. We already send it off. Luke's eyes narrowed. Yar lying. You cold have his face reddened as a horrible possibility occurred to him. Clarice. You trusted you gave. The good leader knows who to trust to complete a mission, Naruto said. Clarice earned every right to finish this quest. Agrius. One of the bear giants flinched. Why yes. Ed bellow and prepare my steed. Bring it to deck. I need to fly to the Miami airport, fast. But, boss, do it. Luke screamed. Or he'll feed you to the draken. The bear man gulped and lumbered down the stairs. 
Luke paced in front of the swimming pool, cursing an ancient Greek, gripping his sword so tight his knuckles turned white. The rest of Luke's crew looked uneasy, as if they never seen their boss so unhinged before. Yeah I've been toying with us all along, Percy said. You wanted us to bring you the fleece and save you the trouble of getting it. Luke scowled. Of course, you idiot. And yeah I've messed everything up. Actually that was me, Naruto responded. Traitor. Percy dug something out of his pocket and threw it at Luke. Luke dodged it easily as it entered the rainbow-colored water. What are you doing Percy? Naruto thought. You tricked all of us. Percy yelled at Luke. Even Dionysus at camp half-blood. Behind Luke, the fountain began to shimmer, which Naruto noticed. Clever Percy, Naruto thought. Maybe I should help out. Naruto took out Yuzushi no Orashi and clicked the button, causing it to expand in its full katana form as he gripped it with both hands. Luke just sneered. This is no time for heroics, Naruto. Drop your sword. Who poisoned Thalia's tree Luke? Naruto asked. I did, of course, he snarled. I used Elder Python Venom straight from the depths of Tartarus. Tyron had nothing to do with it. Percy asked. Ha. Ah, you know he would never do that. The old fool won't have the guts. You call it guts. Betraying your friends and endangering the camp? Naruto asked. Luke raised his sword. Oh, my dear nephew, you don't know the half of it. I was going to let you take the fleece once I was done with it. Yeah, right, Naruto said. Yeah I'll just use it to heal Kronos. Well, yes, that's true, Luke said. The fleece's magic wold sped his mending process by tenfold. But you haven't stopped us. Yeah I've only slowed us down a little. And so you poisoned the tree, you betrayed Thalia, you set us up all to help Kronos destroy the gods, Percy yelled. Luke gritted his teeth. You know that. Why do you keep asking me? Because we want everybody in the audience to hear you, Naruto responded. What audience? Then his eyes narrowed. He looked behind him and his goons did the same. They gasped and stumbled back. Above the pool, shimmering in the rainbow mist, was an iris message vision of Dionysus, Tantalus, and the whole camp in the dining pavilion. They sat in stunned silence, watching us. Well, said Dionysus dryly, some unplanned dinner entertainment. Well, Mr. D, you heard Luke. Chiron had nothing to do with the poisoning of the tree, Naruto said. It was all Luke's fault. Mr. D chuckled. I suppose not, Naruto. This is a trick. A prank. Tantalus argued as he had his cheeseburger cornered between his hands. I fear not, said Mr. D, looking with distaste at Tantalus. It appears I shall have to reinstate Chiron as activities director. I suppose I do miss the old horse's pinnacle games. We are no longer in need of your service, Tantalus. You may return to the underworld. You are dismissed. Just as Tantalus grabbed the cheeseburger he dissolved into mist. He disappeared without being able to have his first cheeseburger. The last thing they heard was the campers cheering as Luke bellowed with rage and slashed his sword through the fountain and the iris message dissolved. Naruto couldn't help but grin. Sending that iris message had to be his and Percy's greatest prank yet and on Luke. Luke turned to Percy and Naruto and gave them murderous looks. Kronos was right, Percy. You're an unreliable weapon that will need to be replaced, he said, and Naruto Kronos had high hopes for you. Unfortunately, we'll have to gain the power sealed in you some other way, as none of you will leave this boat alive. A.N. Just for a laugh, here's my first omic involving a very familiar side story of the odyssey of what happened after Odysseus injured Polyphemus' eye and told the Cyclops his name was nobody. Omic, Polyphemus stumbled around trying to find Cyclops' brethren to help him. Help me brethren. Nobody has got me in the eye again. Polyphemus cried. Unfortunately, the Cyclops heard this before and we weren't too happy to hear this again. A nearby Cyclops sighed. Here we go again. Shut up Polyphemus. We went through this before. If nobody hurts you, we can't help you. Help me. Polyphemus cried. My eye is injured. Yeah. Then who did it? Nobody. Polyphemus cried. I told you. Nobody hurt me again. Needless to say, Polyphemus wasn't going to get any help anytime soon. Because, just as Polyphemus said, nobody hurt him again. As it turns out, it was Percy who stopped Luke from killing them immediately. He uncapped his pen, and Riptide sprang out in full form. One on one, Percy challenged Luke. What are you afraid of? Luke curled his lip. The soldiers hesitated as they waited for his order. Just then, Agrius burst onto deck leading a flying horse. It was the first pure black Pegasus Percy and Naruto had ever seen, with wings like a giant raven. The Pegasus stallion bucked and whinnied. Naruto couldn't speak horse, but he had a feeling it was saying some nasty things about Agrius and Luke. Sir. Agrius called, dodging a Pegasus hoof. Your steed is ready. I told you last summer, Percy, Luke said. You can't bait me into a fight. And you keep avoiding one, Percy stated. Scared your warriors will see you get whipped. Naruto noticed what Percy was up to. He was trapping Luke. Luke knew if he denied fighting Percy, he looked weak to his men, but if Luke fought, he lose time to catch Clarice. 
If Percy had challenged Luke last year, Naruto would think Percy was crazy. But Naruto had helped Percy improved in sword fighting over the school year. All Percy need is to believe in himself, which can be a problem as there were times Naruto noticed Percy had doubt in himself. What's wrong Luke? Afraid what the son of Poseidon will humiliate you in front of your men? Naruto asked. That maybe if they see you loose, they will abandon Krono's cause. I will kill him quickly, Luke decided. And then, when I get back, he'll deal with my nephew personally. Luke raised his sword, Backbiter, which was a foot longer than Percy's. Its blade glinted with an evil grey and gold light where the human steel had been melded with celestial bronze. Luke whistled to one of his men, who threw him around leather and bronze shield. He grinned at Percy wickedly. Luke, Annabeth said, at least give him a shield. Sorry, Annabeth, he said. You bring your own equipment to this party. Don't worry Percy. Just remember our training sessions over school break and y'all be fine. Naruto yelled. Percy nodded. He and Naruto had trained in what to do in situations where one had a sword and shield and the other didn't, mostly Naruto was the one without the shield, but they did switch places once in a while. They even had training sessions where one fight with a kunai knife and the other with a sword, again, Naruto mostly fraught with a kunai knife, and again there were times where Naruto gave Percy a chance. Luke lunged at Percy, obviously out for an immediate kill, but Percy sidestep and blocked it. Never leave an opening for your opponent, Percy thought. My, Luke said. Someone been training. He tried to come at Percy again, only this time with a swipe to the head. Percy parried and returned with a thrust. Luke sidestepped easily. Once when Luke lunged at Percy, Percy jumped backward into the swimming pool. Then he spun underwater, creating a funnel cloud, and blasted out of the deep end, straight at Luke's face. The force of the water knocked Luke down, sputtering and blinded, but not defenseless, as he managed to roll aside and back on his feet before Percy could strike. Yeah. That's it. Naruto yelled. Percy moved in to attack Luke's sword arm, but Luke moved his shield enough in the way that Percy only sliced off the edge of his shield. Luke dropped to a crouch and jabbed at Percy's legs. Percy rolled away but collapsed. Percy no. Naruto responded. One more thing before I kill you. Luke looked at the bear man Aureus, who was still holding Annabeth and Grover by their necks. You can eat your dinner now, Aureus. Bone appetite. Hee hee. Hee hee. The bear man lifted Annabeth and Grover and bared his teeth. However, he didn't have a chance to eat them. Wish. The red feathered arrow sprouted from Aureus' mouth. With a surprised look on his hairy face, he crumpled to the deck. Search brother. Agrius wailed. He let go of the Pegasus reins, allowing the black steed to kick him in the head and fly away free over Miami Bay. For a split second, Luke's guards were too stunned to do anything except watch the bear twins' bodies dissolve into smoke. Then there was a wild chorus of war cries and hooves thundering against metal. A dozen centaurs charged out of the main stairwell. Ponies. Tyson cried with delight. Naruto saw this as an opportunity. Hinata, let's give the centaurs some backup. Hinata nodded, activated her by Akigen, took out her bow and started firing arrows. Naruto made the hand sign. Multi-shadow, clone jutsu. Two dozen Naruto's appeared around Naruto and ran out to attack. Naruto moved in as well. During the chaos Naruto found Chiron, trying to regain the order of his brethren while firing his own arrows. Naruto remembered what Chiron said about other centaurs being more wilder than him, but now that he sees it, he can believe it. Despite being in battle, many of the centaurs fighting were dressed as if they were going to a party and or sporting event. Some had t-shirts with day glow letters that said party ponies. South Florida chapter. Some were armed with bows, some with baseball bats, some with paintball buns. One had paint his face painted like a Comanche warrior and was waving a large orange Dorofum hand making a big number one. Another was bare chest and painted entirely green. A third had googly eyeglasses with the eyeballs bouncing around on slinky coils and one of those baseball caps with soda can and straw attachments on either side. And if their gear wasn't enough to tell each centaur apart, their horse halves were. Not a single centaur had the same horse breed half. Naruto could get a headache trying to remember which one was which. They exploded onto the deck with such ferocity and color that for a moment even Luke was stunned. It was hard to tell if the centaurs were attacking or parting. Apparently both, Naruto thought as he hacked through a laced Dragonian with his wind-sharp katana. Luke tried to rally his troops who were scattered and running for safety but then a centaur shot a custom-made arrow with a leather boxing glove on the end. It smacked Luke in the face and sent him crashing into the swimming pool. Then the centaurs let loose with their paintball guns, and Naruto started getting memories of his clones getting splattered with paint in the face. Hey. Watch it. You're hitting some of my clones. Naruto yelled at a passing centaur. Sorry little dude, said one of the party ponies although he didn't seem sorry as he was having too much fun. Naruto grumbled how it's easy for the centaur to say that when it's not his own chakra being used to create the clones. Tyron galloped toward Annabeth and Grover, neatly plucked them off the deck and deposited them on his back. 
Inada ran out of arrow some time during the chaos and started fighting demigod warriors with gentle fist. Attack you fools. Luke ordered his troops as he crawled out of the pool. Somewhere below deck, large alarm bell thrummed. Not good, Naruto responded as he butted an enemy demigod warrior. Withdraw brethren. Chiron yelled. Yo, Lundi. Jump on. Said a centaur. Since Annabeth was riding on Chiron, Naruto figured the centaur meant him. Naruto took out a snake lady and climbed on. Nearby Hinata got on her own centaur as another one plucked Percy off the ground. Dude, get your big friend, the centaur told Percy. Tyson. Percy yelled. Come on. Tyson dropped two warriors he was about to tie into a knot and jogged after them. He jumped on the centaur's back. Dude. The centaur groaned, almost buckling under Tyson's weight. Do the words low-carb diet mean anything to you? You won't get away with this, horse man. Luke shouted. He raised his sword, only to be smacked in the face with another boxing glove arrow that sent him back into the pool. With that, the centaurs had galloped to the edge of the deck and fearlessly jumped the guardrail, as if it were a steeplechase and not ten stories above the ground. They plummeted toward the docks. When the centaurs hit the asphalt, they galloped off, whooping and yelling taunts at the Princess Andromeda as they raced into the streets of downtown Miami. Naruto didn't have time to cancel out his jutsus, but his clones must have decided their jobs was done when the centaurs took off without them, because Naruto retrieved memories of the clones that weren't hit in the face by paintballs. If you had asked Naruto how fast a centaur can run last year, he would guess the same speed as a regular horse. It turns out Naruto was wrong. The centaurs ran so fast the whole city was a blur. In fact, they were so fast, Naruto thought they probably could match Rock Lee in a foot race when Lee wasn't wearing his training weights. Naruto didn't even know they left the city of Miami until the party ponies finally stopped. When the centaurs did stop, they were in a trailer park at the edge of lake. The trailers were all horse trailers, tricked out with televisions and mini refrigerators and mosquito netting. We were in a centaur camp. Dude. Said a party pony as he unloaded his gear. Did you see that bear guy? He was all like. Whoa, I have an arrow in my mouth. The centaur with the googly eyeglasses laughed. That was awesome. Head slam. The two centaurs charged at each other full force and knocked heads, then staggering off in different directions with crazy grins on their faces. Tyron sighed as he set Annabeth and Grover down on a picnic blanket next to Percy. I really wish my cousins wouldn't slam their heads together. They don't have brain cells to spare. Naruto and Hinata joined the others as Tyson started hanging out with the other centaurs. Tyron, Percy said, obviously still stunned. You saved us. He gave Percy a dry smile. Well now, I cold very well let you and Naruto die, especially since you two cleared my name. Naruto chuckled. Percy started it. I was just making sure he didn't screw it up. Hey. Percy responded. But how did you know where we were? Annabeth asked. Advance planning, my dear. I figured you would wash up near Miami if you made it out of the sea of monsters alive. Almost everything strange washes up near Miami. Gee thanks, Grover mumbled. Odd on take it the wrong way, Grover. Naruto shoved his sadder friend. Chiron is happy to see you. Chiron cleared his throat. Yes. The point is, I was able to eavesdrop on Percy's Iris message and trace the signal. Iris and I have been friends for centuries. I asked her to alert me to any important communications in this area. It then took no effort to convince my cousins to ride to your aid. As you can see, centaurs can travel quite fast when we wish to. Distance for us is not the same as distance for humans not even humans from the elemental nations. Heh, you haven't seen Bushy Brows run without his training weights, Naruto chuckled. Tyron chuckled, figuring that Naruto was talking about a friend of his from the elemental nations. Maybe so, Naruto, but I reassure you that you have not seen centaurs run at their fastest. Naruto shrugged. I guess so. Over at the campfire, three centaurs were teaching Tyson to operate a paintball gun. So what now? Percy asked. We just let Luke sail away. Hess got Kronos aboard that ship. Or parts of him anyway. Tyron knelt, carefully folding his front legs underneath him. He opened the medicine pouch on his belt and started treating Percy's leg wounds. I'm afraid, Percy, that today has been something of a draw. We didn't have the strength of numbers to take that ship. Luke was not organized enough to pursue us. Nobody won. But we got the fleece. Said Annabeth. That's right. Clarice is on her way back to camp with it right now, Naruto agreed. That's what I called a mission success. Tyron nodded, although he looked uneasy. You are all true heroes. And as soon as we get Percy fixed up, you must return to Half-Blood Hill. The centaur shall carry you. Are you coming too? Hinata asked. Oh yes Hinata. He'll be relieved to get home. My brethren here simply do not appreciate Dean Martin's music. Besides, I must have some words with Mr. D. Theers the rest of the summer to plan. So much training to do. And I want to see him curious about the fleece. Over by the campfire, Tyson let loose with his paintball gun. 
A blue projectile splattered against one of the centaurs, hurling him backward into the lake. The centaur came up grinning covered in swamp much and blue paint and gave Tyson two thumbs up. Annabeth, Chiron said, perhaps you and Grover would go supervise Tyson and my cousins before they, ah, teach each other too many bad habits. Annabeth met him in the eyes as some kind of understanding passed between them. Sure, Chiron, Annabeth said. Come on, goat boy. But I don't like paintball. Yes, you do. She hoisted Grover to his hooves and led him off toward the campfire. Sensing that Chiron wanted a private word with Percy, Naruto got up. Hey, Hinata, how about we work on the Rasengan? Um, okay. Hinata got up and followed Naruto. After a while of training and Hinata making it to the second step, Naruto decided to walk off on his own. Ah, there you are, Naruto. Naruto turned to see Chiron trotting up to him. Oh, hey, Chiron. Naruto said. You wanted to see me? Yes. I've been meaning to talk to you about your time in Ajija, Chiron said. How Annabeth told you, didn't she? Naruto asked. Yes, she did. And to be honest, I am concerned about how you will handle it, Chiron said. What do you mean? Naruto asked. Naruto, I trained Odysseus, and I knew personally how obsessive he got in finding his way back to Ajija after his finished his quest, Chiron said. And you were going to tell me it's impossible, Naruto said. If you were any other demigod, then yes. But you are not an ordinary demigod, Chiron said. After all, no ordinary demigod could fight the Kraken and survive to tell the tale, much less destroy the Kraken and live to tell about it. Well, I had help, Naruto responded. I'm sure you did, Chiron said. That's why I think that after we return to Camp Half-Blood, I think he'll talk to Mr. D about offering you a special reward for you and your friends. Special reward? Naruto asked. What kind of special reward? What is it? I won't say in fear of getting your hopes too high before talking to Mr. D about it, Chiron said before placing his hand on Naruto's spiky blonde hair. But I will say this. It's one I would think you've been waiting for since your grandparents brought you to this world. Chiron made Naruto promise not to tell the others about the special reward until after he spoke to Mr. D about it, including to Clarice whom Chiron agreed should have a part in the special reward. Chiron didn't make Naruto swear on the river of sticks like he did with Annabeth before he left Camp Half-Blood, as even Chiron knew that when Naruto makes a promise, he tends to stick to his oath as if it was one made on the river of sticks. Not too soon after Chiron led the party ponies to take the group of four demigods, a satyr and a cyclops to Long Island. Naruto quickly learned that Chiron wasn't joking about the centaur's speed. They wouldn't be a match against Rock Lee in a foot race without training weights. They would leave Lee in the dust. What would have took a demigod days to get from Miami to Long Island by foot took the party ponies only hours. By time they have arrived, Clarice had just arrived at the top of Half-Blood Hill, much to her annoyance. The centaur stayed a bit, hoping to be part in one of Dionysus' wild parties. Unfortunately, the god of wine wasn't in a partying mood, nor was the rest of the camp. The camp had been through a hard two weeks. The arts and crafts cabin had burned to the ground from an attack by a Draco Aeonius, which Percy figured was Latin for really big lizard with breath that blows stuff up. The big house's rooms were overflowing with wounded. The kids from Apollo cabin, who were the best healers, had been working overtime performing first aid. Everybody looked weary and battered as they crowded around Thalia's tree. Dear legacy boy. Clarice tossed Naruto the fleece. Naruto managed to catch it with an oomph. What? Naruto asked. Clarice rolled her eyes. I may have brought the fleece home, but this was still your quest. It's only right that the leader of the quest finishes it. Naruto looked around, expecting someone to say something. At least a word of denial from Clarice's siblings. But no one denied what Clarice said. In fact, Naruto noticed that most of the campers that had shunned him after he told them he was the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox was now looking at him like a hero. Naruto figured he should at least say something to thank them, but at the same time say something to Thalia's tree. Then he knew how. Naruto straightened up spread out the fleece in his hands and turned to Thalia's tree. Thalia, six years ago you gave your life so your friends could make it across the boundary line safely. Ever since then, your spirit bound to the tree your father. Lord Zeus has made from your body has protected our camp, Naruto said. And now, on the behalf of Camp Half-Blood and everyone in it mortal and immortal it's my honor to return the favor and save your spirit, just as you have saved the life of your friends with this original and real deal golden fleece. Naruto draped the fleece on the lowest bow. The moonlight seemed to brighten, turning from grey to liquid silver. A cool breeze rustled in the branches and rippled through the grass, all the way into the valley. Everything came into sharper focus the glow of the fireflies down in the woods, the smell of the strawberry fields, the sound of the waves on the beach. Gradually, the needles on the pine tree started turning from brown to green. Everybody cheered. It was happening slowly, but there could be no doubt the fleece's magic was seeping into the tree, filling it with new power and expelling the poison. Tyron ordered a 24-7 guard duty on the helltop, at least until he could find an appropriate monster to protect the fleece. 
He said head place an ad in Search Olympus Weekly right away. Naruto felt some pat him on the shoulder and turned to see it was Mr. D. Nice choice of words, Mr. Uzumaki. A very nice choice of words. Naruto didn't know what to say. Nor did he had a chance to say anything as his aunts and uncles from Athena and Hermes' cabin surrounded him and lifted him up above their shoulders and started carrying him down to the amphitheater, where he along with Hinata and Claris was honored with laurel wreaths and had the honor to burn their shrouds. Naruto's shroud was almost identical to the one he burned last year same color cloth, same symbols. Only this time dead center on the cloth was words painted in bright orange. The mighty Kraken slayer and summoner of gigantic talking toads. Naruto couldn't help but turned search pink at the words as it seemed that Naruto had a new nickname. How did the campers even find out about that? Clarissa's was blood red with bloody spears surrounding it and swords on top. Hinata's made by Hermes' cabin since she was a resident from their cabin was the same shade of color as Hinata's eyes, with a leaf symbol, along with the symbols of heat painted on it in leafy green. Hinata felt bad about burning it, but Chiron reassured her that it was fine. Only Percy, Annabeth and Tyson wasn't given golden laurel wreaths or a shroud to burn. But considering how they got into the quest in the first place, they weren't complaining. At least, they didn't until Mr. D reminded Percy and Annabeth that he'll be expecting them first thing after breakfast to start their punishment for leaving camp without permission. Naruto had to whack Percy in the back of the head before he started calling Mr. D names, while at the same time holding back the urge to bring up the special reward. That night, Naruto laid back in his comfy bunk in cabin 6 after lights out. At first he couldn't sleep, thinking about what kind of special reward Jiren was talking about. But then Naruto took out his compass and opened it. The needle wasn't pointing north, but rather southeast the direction toward Polyphemus Island. Naruto had hoped the magic reset itself or something, but apparently it just do what Hermes said it does. Still, that didn't stop Naruto from trying. He closed his eyes and concentrate, trying to see if he can find some kind of mechanism or something in the compass that resets the needle. Instead, he sense of pins found in a lock, like something was locked inside. Naruto concentrated on that, unlocking the pins of the compass. When he did, the compass part of the watch clicked open and opened automatically like a second door. Inside there was a note folded up in a neat square with two pictures one on the back of the compass and the other in the hidden compartment. One was of a beautiful young woman with red flowing hair, the elfish features of a Hermes child. The other was a young man with a similar blonde spiky hair, tanned skin and stormy gray eyes found in Children of Athena. Naruto jolted up as he realized these were pictures of Kashima Yuzumaki and Minato Namikas. His parents. He unfolded the note only to read. It's about time you have something of your own to remember your parents by. There was no signature, but Naruto knew who it was from. Thanks Grandpa Hermes and Grandma Athena, Naruto said as he closed his compass and held it to his chest before getting some well-deserved sleep. The next day, just when celebrations was thought to be over, Chiron announced that the chariot races would be continued. Everyone was surprised as they thought it would be over now that Tantalus was gone, but Chiron insists that they might as well put the track that Hephaestus' cabin put together to good use, but he would be putting restrictions that Tantalus didn't add last time to try to prevent another incident that led to the chariot races being cancelled in the first place. Not to mention, Chiron has allowed Naruto and Hinata to race for Hermes' cabin mostly because Chiron knew Naruto and Hinata would race fairly against the other racers. At the same time there was a sad announcement. The nameless son of Athena that Naruto tried to save from a raft surrounded by sharks have been identified as Jacob Yearns. Apparently he had disappeared a year before Luke's quest to get the search apple of Hesperides on some secret quest and never was heard from or knew if he was alive or not until now. Tyron reassured to Cabin 6 that Jacob would get the proper funeral he deserves and that whatever his quest was will unfortunately go to his grave with him, as the saying goes. Naruto had to bite his lip in order to stop himself from bringing out that he knew something about Jacob's quest, but the threat Athena gave him still lingered in his mind. Whatever the mark of Athena was, it obviously was something very important to Athena to keep secret that not even Chiron was aware about the details. The good news was that despite the chaos of the camp being attacked, Beckendor finished the projects Naruto asked him to make for him. That morning, Naruto stopped by the forges to see what kind of work Beckendorf done. The first one Beckendorf gave Naruto was two celestial bronze ring-like bracelets. They were almost identical, except one was marked in ancient Greek courage and the other was marked cunning. Which Naruto had to admit matches his personality. Dust call them by their ancient Greek name and they form, Beckendorf said. They also return to normal form if you say it again. Naruto took out the one marked cunning and said, Paneria, and it expanded into a large windmill-shaped shuriken, also known as the Demon Wind Shuriken, Windmill of Shadows. Paneria. The shuriken shrunk down to bracelet form. Naruto tried it with courage, except yelling Tharos instead of Ponria, and it magically expanded into a four-point giant shuriken. 
Once you lock them on your wrist, they're magically enchanted to return to your wrist after being used, unless you have someone else puts them on. Then they would return to their wrist instead, Beckendorf said. Aros, Naruto shouted as the shuriken shrink back down to bracelet form before he put both of them on his wrist. I also made you a dozen jars of that homemade smoke bomb you came up with, Beckendorf took out a bag of bronze jars. It wasn't easy, but I found a way to contain the explosion before they exploded. Thanks Beckendorf, Naruto responded. Beckendorf shrugged. Don't worry about it. I just wish I had them finished before you went on your quest. They might have helped you against the Kraken. That's for sure, Naruto agreed as he put them on his wrist, but the past is in the past. By the way, Beckendorf, can you do something else for me? By time Naruto got out of the forges, his once was pocket watch like compass was now more like a locket with a celestial bronze chain wrapped around Naruto's neck, laying next to Nordo's beaded necklace and the first Hokage's necklace. Although Naruto kept the compass hidden in his shirt. No one else knew about the secret compartment in it, and right now Naruto didn't want anyone to know about it. At least, not yet. If anyone asked, Naruto would just say it's a keepsake and leave it at that. Naruto went to the archery range to try out his new weapons. When he got there, he found Percy talking on his cell phone to what Naruto guessed was Mrs. Jackson. With everything that happened, Naruto forgot that Mrs. Jackson still didn't know that Percy and Naruto had run off to Camp Half-Blood without telling her. Ah, Naruto I was actually planning to get you, Chiron said. Come over here a second. Chiron led Naruto out of Percy and nosy Apollo Camper's hearing range. I have discussed it with Dionysus, and he agreed to help set up your special reward, Chiron said. Although he was rather reluctant of letting Annabeth and Percy time off from their punishment. Ah that's great, Naruto said. But what is the reward? Well, since your battle with the Kraken has shown how far you have gone since coming to this world, we decided it's time you go home, Chiron said. Go home for a week visit. Naruto remembered Chiron saying the reward involving something he'd been longing for. You mean, that's right, Chiron said with a smile. It's still your choice if you want to return to the Leaf Village for a week, or if you choose, the whole school year, but, Naruto jumped on Chiron for a hug, which wasn't hard for a shinobi demigod. Thank you Chiron. Thank you. No problem, Naruto. Chiron said. But it's not a permanent visit. And you can bring your friends who helped you on the quest, but they must be ready to return by the end of the summer session well, except for Ms. Hayuga, if she chooses to stay there for the school year as well. Right. Naruto responded. Naruto forgot about testing his new weapons after that. He was too excited. Instead he spends most of the day trying to burn off his excitement with some ninjutsu training, which he didn't stop until Annabeth came to remind him of dinner. The next few days, Hinata and Naruto spend the afternoons prepping their chariots. Naruto had already told Percy, Annabeth, Claris, Tyson, and yes Grover, about the special reward. To Naruto's laughter, Percy and Annabeth were relieved as it meant they could finish their punishment of being Mr. DS slaves early. Naruto wasn't surprised to find Grover dazing off as the young satyr imagined all the beautiful nature of the elemental nations, Naruto told him about. Ever since being the first satyr to return from Polyphemus Island and making the search for Pan safer than before, the Council of Cloven Elders gave Grover the rest of the summer off from searching for Pan and even rewarded him with new panpipes. Sadly, new panpipes didn't make Grover's musical skills any better than they were before. The morning of the chariot race, Naruto got up extra early to pay a visit to Hestia's hearth. Since she was no longer an Olympian and didn't have any children, being a virgin goddess, Hestia didn't have a cabin to honor her. Instead, the camp had her hearth in the amphitheater. Naruto didn't expect Hestia to be at the hearth. Not that he hates Hestia. To be honest Hestia has become one of Naruto's favorite gods and or goddesses besides his own grandparents. But even he know that Greek gods Olympian and Minor are limited on how much interaction they can have with their kids or champions, or any demigod interaction at all. But what he didn't expect when he arrived at the hearth was to see his own grandmother. Athena stood next to the hearth wearing a white dress shirt and grey jeans, with her hair done in a braid that flowed behind her back. Normally Naruto would be glad to see his grandparents, but he had a sinking suspicion this wasn't one of those visits where the Olympians check up on their kids. Naruto subconsciously reached in his pocket storage seal where he kept the coin. He figured it was just a matter of time before Athena will make her appearance for the coin. After all, it was the only link Naruto had to the mystery of the mark of Athena. But when Athena saw Naruto, she gave him a small but friendly smile. Hello, Naruto, Athena greeted. I see you kept the coin safe. Naruto didn't know how his grandmother knew where he kept it, but he unsealed it as he walked up to his grandmother and tossed it to her, which Athena caught it with ease. I kept it a secret, like you ask. Naruto said. The mark what Jacob told me everything. I know you would, Athena said. No offense, Grandma, but you didn't sound certain when you told me to keep quiet, Naruto responded. Athena gave Naruto a steely gray look that would make most demigods back down. But Naruto wasn't like most demigods, and he stood his ground. 
I am sorry if I anger you with my warning, Naruto. But I had to do what I did to make sure that the secret of the mark remains a secret, Athena said. You must understand, when my children fail following the mark, they normally die, and the secret they know dies with them until I find someone else to take on the quest. So what? Me finding out about the mark of Athena is an accident. A mistake. Naruto asked. I can't say, Athena said. There are no accidents in this world, and even if there were accidents as well as mistakes or acts of the fates. Again with the fates, Naruto muttered. Don't take the fates lightly Naruto. They're a lot more powerful than you think, Athena warned. Even the Olympians fears their powers. Naruto frowned. But aren't the Olympians stronger than them? We like to think that way, but truth is, our powers are bound to search fate, just as mortal lives are, Athena said, it's true we make our own decisions that impact who we are, but in the end our decisions leads to the search fate of Search Olympus. You may not like to admit it, Naruto, but you know in your heart it's true. That's why you thought back to the Oracle's prophecy in search of answers to how to get the Golden Fleece back to camp. Great, Naruto muttered. Anything else? Actually yes. Lift your shirt, Athena said. What? Zeus has ordered me to check your seal, Athena responded. We want to make sure that you don't lose search control over the fox's power anytime soon. Naruto shrugged and pulled up his shirt, revealing his stomach. Athena kneeled down and touched Naruto's skin. Although the seal wasn't visible she could sense the work of it. Leonardo really outdone himself, Athena said. Perhaps if he had survived, he could have took on the quest. For a second Athena's appearance flickered to her wearing a flannel shirt and jeans clothes of someone who has been traveling and living on the road. Naruto was caught off guard by the sudden change in his grandmother's appearance. Yes, perhaps then he could have avenged me, Athena said. Ah, grandmother are you okay? Naruto asked looking worried. Athena winced like she had a headache before flickering back to the clothes she was wearing before. Things seems to be in order, Athena said as if nothing happened. But I would be cautious on drawing on the fox's powers until you master its power though. Which brings me to this, she took out a scroll. I managed to salvage a copy of one of Minato's famous jutsus. I think it's time you start learning from it. It also contains a containment seal at the very end that holds the weapons you need to help you use this jutsu. Naruto took the scroll and read the writing on it the flying thunder god jutsu. Naruto's eyes widened. He never been good when it came to history of the leaf village back in the academy, having dyslexia never helped, but even he knew this was the jutsu that earned his father the nickname the yellow flash. If I master this jutsu, I probably can figure out a way to travel to Ajija and back, Naruto thought. I wish you luck Naruto, Athena said. And when you visit the Leaf Village, don't let Elder Council members keep you there. Uh-huh. Naruto only half heard her as he opened the scroll and started studying the details of the jutsu. He didn't even notice that Athena left until he looked up. By time of the chariot race, everyone was excited. Naruto and Hinata stocked their chariot with every ninja and demigod weapon they could use, as well as a few other surprises. Naruto also brought cunning and courage with him. Smaller shurikens would be great for cutting the ropes at a distance, but Naruto figured these two will be good for real offensive attacks. Annabeth and Percy had teamed up for the chariot race this time, using the chariot Athena cabin used in the last race that was modified by Tyson. Percy was obviously the driver as Annabeth was the fighter. They had two javelins in their chariot that Naruto figured Tyson made. Everyone got their chariots at the starting line, waiting for Chiron to blow the conch. The main rules were almost identical to Tantalus, but there were safety protocols added to the rules. They can't have maimed or kill each other, charioteers must keep their chariot on the tracks while racing if possible, as there were always a chance for chariots and horses to be forced off the tracks. Any chariot that leaves the track is out of the race. Any chariot unable to keep moving is out of the race. Anyone who purposely break the rules will have a month of kitchen duty. A medic team will be on standby for any injuries during the race. With all the rules reinforced, Chiron blew the conch and the race started. Immediately Hermes' team chariot and Athena Poseidon's team chariot took the lead. But Naruto and Hinata barely maintained it as Anubis, and Percy's chariot obviously was rebuilt for perfect movement and speed. They took the first turn before anyone else as Claris tailed behind them. Hinata and Naruto got their break when Hephaestus' cabin came up Anubis' flank, until Naruto ducked to dodge an arrow soaring over his head. Naruto turned to see Apollo cabin coming at their right flank. Maintain speed, Naruto told Hinata. Right. Hinata responded. Michael you fighter for Apollo cabin picked up a javelin, ready to throw it at their wheel. Naruto took out courage and yelled, Aros. The bracelet transformed into a giant shuriken that he threw at the javelin. With success, it hit the javelin and sent it flying out of Michael's hands before he could throw. Then Naruto took out two more smaller shurikens and threw them at the reins and cut them with success. Apollo chariot crashed into the ground as the horses run off. Naruto, we got the lead. Hinata yelled. What? How? Naruto looked and found out why. Apparently Beckendorf had used some kind of mechanism that tied up Percy's and Anubis' chariot. 
Annabeth managed to use their javelin to lock onto Hephaestus' chariot, preventing him from gaining the lead. But their luck only lasted for a moment as Clarice with her sibling and their war chariot pulled up to them. Clarice threw a mace and chain at them, which Naruto dodged. Hey. Watch it. Naruto yelled. Sorry Kraken Slayer. Clarice neared as she reached for her javelin next. However, Naruto was faster, unlike with Apollo Cabin, Naruto didn't want to risk losing their lead fighting Claris, so Naruto took out the jars of the homemade smoke bomb jars and threw it. Naturally Claris took out her sword and cut through the jar. But she did, the jar broke and smoke blew out everywhere, blinding Claris and her driver. In the confusion the driver must have loosened his grip on the reins, as the grizzly horses run off the track, with Claris yelling at them to stop in ancient Greek. Boom. Naruto was nearly knocked off their chariot as he heard an explosion. He turned to see that it was Hephaestus Cabin's chariot, which was on fire as Beckendorf, and one of his brothers who Naruto guessed jumped out at the last minute tried to scramble away from it. Bang Percy, what did you do? Naruto thought. But he didn't have much time to think of it, as Athena Poseidon chariot was catching up. Hinata, pick up speed. Naruto responded. Right. Hinata flicked the reins and their horses picked up speed. Percy and Annabeth managed to catch up, but it was too late as they made the turn and Naruto and Hinata won by a head. The chariot pulled to a stop as Hermes campers ran out to hoist Naruto and Hinata on their shoulders and cheered. Hermes cabin won the race and was chores free for the week, as Chiron rewarded Naruto and Hinata, both laurel wreaths. Despite how the race ended, Tyson got the appreciation from the camp he deserved. It was hard to call the Cyclops who helped rebuild a well-designed chariot and gave his search brother a shield a monster. That's right. Tyson gave Percy a shield. It turned out the little project Tyson was working on was a wristwatch that turns into a shield when you press the stop button. After the race, Percy started calling Tyson's search brother more than he did before the quest, which showed how much Percy had grown attached to the idea of having a Cyclops for a brother. Naruto even noticed that Annabeth was easier on Tyson. She no longer treated Tyson like a monster that could eat them any second. Naruto never did find out if Percy let Grover remove their empathy link, but Naruto doubt that Percy would let Grover do it. If it wasn't for the empathy link, Grover would have died and they wouldn't have found the Golden Fleece. Hopefully now that the Golden Fleece is retrieved, it would be easier for Satters to search for Pan. If not well, at least the Golden Fleece would help Satters find their way back to camp. Not that many of them had too much trouble finding their way back before. The night after the race, Tyson paid Naruto a visit and told him the news. They are leaving. Naruto asked. Tyson nodded. Daddy offered me a job in the forges of the Cyclops. I haven't told Search Brother yet. Don't worry about it. I'm sure Percy will understand eventually. Naruto hesitated on the last part as he didn't know how Percy would react. Tyson gave Naruto a big bear hug. I want to thank you, Tyson said. You were the first person to accept me, even when Search Brother was struggling to. He'll always remember you. Tyson cried a little before letting go. I'm sorry I can't come with you to see your home. It's okay. Naruto responded. There be other visits. Besides, since y'all get to see Poseidon maybe he can arrange you to come to the elemental nations once in a while. Tyson grinned as he liked the thought. As Naruto thought, Percy took the news hard. But he was still happy for Tyson. The two brothers said their goodbyes before Tyson went into the ocean. That night Annabeth was on night guard duty at Thalia's tree and left Malcolm in charge. But Naruto was sound asleep in his bunk minutes before his uncle called lights out. That night Naruto dreamt of the leaf village the trees, the village, the mountain with the faces of the four Hokages, the giant wall that surrounds the village for protection. Naruto never realized how much he missed the village until Chiron told him he was allowed to go home for a while. This world was okay and his apartment and the camp were great, but Naruto wasn't raised in New York and although he had family in Camp Half-Blood, Naruto missed those he left behind in the leaf village. Naturally, Naruto was the first awake, first to get dressed, first to leave the cabin. However, when he made it outside, he found Grover rushing over to him. Naruto, thank the gods you are already awake. Grover gasped. Grover, I wake up at this time almost every morning. You know that, Naruto reminded him. Right. Grover's ears turned search pink. Come on. We got to wake Percy. Wait what's going on? Naruto asked. Something happened on the hill while Annabeth was on guard duty, Grover said. What kind of something? I can't explain. You have to see it yourself. Okay listen, you get Percy, he'll check on Annabeth, Naruto said. Obviously forgetting that he wanted Naruto with him, Grover nodded as Naruto ran toward Half-Blood Hill. Hinata was out of Hermes' cabin, dressed in an orange camp Half-Blood t-shirt and jeans, when she noticed Naruto. And Naruto, W what's going on? Something happened at Half-Blood Hill, Naruto said. I'm going to go check. W wait, Naruto. Hinata headed back in Hermes' cabin and came back out with her bow and quiver full of arrows. Sadly, Naruto didn't wait as he was already halfway to the hill. 
If there's one thing no one can say about Naruto, it's that if he wants to, he can keep running without slowing down. Not even when Hess running up Half-Blood Hill, which was the biggest hill in camp. Most demigods started breathing heavily if they ran up Half-Blood Hill without slowing down, but Naruto ran up and down the hill during his morning runs that the need to slow down hardly ever becomes a problem. Naruto reached the base of Thalia's tree where the golden fleece was still hanging on the lowest branch where Naruto placed it. Seeing it there was a relief for Naruto, but something else caught his concern. Next to it was two girls. One was unconscious and lying on the ground, and the other girl in Greek armor was kneeling next to her. Annabeth. Naruto shouted as he rushed toward them. The armored girl looked up, revealing to be Annabeth. Naruto. The flea said, she just suddenly there. By then the rest of the campers had started showing up. Chiron was the first to arrive with Grover and Percy on his back with Hinata right behind him. The fleece healed the tree, Chiron said, his voice ragged. And the poison was not the only thing it purged. Naruto knelt down on the other side of the girl to get a good look at her. The girl had short black hair and freckles across her nose. She was built like a long-distance runner, lithe and strong, and she wore clothes that were somewhere between punk and goth a black t-shirt, black tattered jeans, and a leather jacket with buttons from a bunch of bands. The girl looked about a year older than Naruto, but other than that, Naruto recognized her from the photo Annabeth showed him last summer. Thalia. It didn't make sense. Thalia should be four years older than Naruto, not a year older. But there was no doubt in Naruto's mind it was her. Hinata. We need nectar and ambrosia. Naruto responded. Go get it. Quick. All right. Hinata ran down the hill toward the big house. Percy, help me out here. Naruto ordered. Percy got off Chiron and rushed over to help Naruto set Thalia on the tree. When they did, Thalia took a shaky breath and coughed, as if it was the first breath she took in years, which was true. She opened her eyes, revealing to have electric blue eyes as she stared at Naruto and Percy in confusion. Who? My name is Naruto Uzumaki. This here is Percy Jackson. Naruto pointed to Percy. What was the last thing you remember? Thalia blinked. I was fighting the Furies and was fatally wounded. I was dying. It's okay now, Percy said. You are not dying. Can you tell me your name? Naruto asked. Thalia looked at Naruto bewildered. Of course. I am Thalia, she said. Daughter of Zeus. Despite how the race ended, Tyson got the appreciation from the camp he deserved. It was hard to call the Cyclops who helped rebuild a well-designed chariot and gave his search brother a shield a monster. That's right. Tyson gave Percy a shield. It turned out the little project Tyson was working on was a wristwatch that turns into a shield when you press the stop button. After the race, Percy started calling Tyson's search brother more than he did before the quest, which showed how much Percy had grown attached to the idea of having a Cyclops for a brother. Naruto even noticed that Annabeth was easier on Tyson. She no longer treated Tyson like a monster that could eat them any second. Naruto never did find out if Percy let Grover remove their empathy link, but Naruto doubt that Percy would let Grover do it. If it wasn't for the empathy link, Grover would have died and they wouldn't have found the golden fleece. Hopefully now that the golden fleece is retrieved, it would be easier for Satters to search for Pan. If not well, at least the golden fleece would help Satters find their way back to camp. Not that many of them had too much trouble finding their way back before. The night after the race, Tyson paid Naruto a visit and told him the news. They are leaving. Naruto asked. Tyson nodded. Daddy offered me a job in the forges of the Cyclops. I haven't told Search Brother yet. Don't worry about it. I'm sure Percy will understand eventually. Naruto hesitated on the last part as he didn't know how Percy will react. Tyson gave Naruto a big bear hug. I want to thank you, Tyson said. You were the first person to accept me, even when Search Brother was struggling to. He'll always remember you. Tyson cried a little before letting go. I'm sorry I can't come with you to see your home. It's okay. Naruto responded. There be other visits. Besides, since y'all get to see Poseidon maybe he can arrange you to come to the elemental nations once in a while. Tyson grinned as he liked the thought. As Naruto thought, Percy took the news hard. But he was still happy for Tyson. The two brothers said their goodbyes before Tyson went into the ocean. That night Annabeth was on night guard duty at Thalia's tree and left Malcolm in charge. But Naruto was sound asleep in his bunk minutes before his uncle called lights out. At night Naruto dreamt of the leaf village the trees, the village, the mountain with the faces of the four hokages, the giant wall that surrounds the village for protection. Naruto never realized how much he missed the village until Chiron told him he was allowed to go home for a while. This world was okay and his apartment and the camp were great, but Naruto wasn't raised in New York and although he had family in Camp Half-Blood, Naruto missed those he left behind in the leaf village. Naturally, Naruto was the first to wake, first to get dressed, first to leave the cabin. However, when he made it outside, he found Grover rushing over to him. Naruto, thank the gods you are already awake. Grover gasped. Grover, I wake up at this time almost every morning. 
You know that, Naruto reminded him, right? Grover's ears turned search pink. Come on. We got to wake Percy. Wait what's going on? Naruto asked. Something happened on the hill while Annabeth was on guard duty, Grover said. What kind of something? I can't explain. You have to see it yourself. Okay listen, you get Percy, he'll check on Annabeth, Naruto said. Obviously forgetting that he wanted Naruto with him, Grover nodded as Naruto ran toward Half-Blood Hill. Anata was out of Hermes' cabin, dressed in an orange camp Half-Blood t-shirt and jeans, when she noticed Naruto. And Naruto, W what's going on? Something happened at Half-Blood Hill, Naruto said. I'm going to go check. W wait, Naruto. Hinata headed back in Hermes' cabin and came back out with her bow and quiver full of arrows. Sadly, Naruto didn't wait as he was already halfway to the hill. If there's one thing no one can say about Naruto, it's that if he wants to, he can keep running without slowing down. Not even when Hess running up Half-Blood Hill, which was the biggest hill in camp. Most demigods started breathing heavily if they ran up Half-Blood Hill without slowing down, but Naruto ran up and down the hill during his morning runs that the need to slow down hardly ever becomes a problem. Naruto reached the base of Thalia's tree where the golden fleece was still hanging on the lowest branch where Naruto placed it. Seeing it there was a relief for Naruto, but something else caught his concern. Next to it was two girls. One was unconscious and lying on the ground, and the other girl in Greek armor was kneeling next to her. Annabeth. Naruto shouted as he rushed toward them. The armored girl looked up, revealing to be Annabeth. Naruto. The flea said, she just suddenly there. By then the rest of the campers had started showing up. Chiron was the first to arrive with Grover and Percy on his back with Hinata right behind him. The fleece healed the tree, Chiron said, his voice ragged. And the poison was not the only thing it purged. Naruto knelt down on the other side of the girl to get a good look at her. The girl had short black hair and freckles across her nose. She was built like a long-distance runner, lithe and strong, and she wore clothes that were somewhere between punk and goth a black t-shirt, black tattered jeans, and a leather jacket with buttons from a bunch of bands. The girl looked about a year older than Naruto, but other than that, Naruto recognized her from the photo Annabeth showed him last summer. Thalia. It didn't make sense. Thalia should be four years older than Naruto, not a year older. But there was no doubt in Naruto's mind it was her. Hinata. We need nectar and ambrosia. Naruto responded. Go get it. Quick. All right. Hinata ran down the hill toward the big house. Percy, help me out here. Naruto ordered. Percy got off Chiron and rushed over to help Naruto set Thalia on the tree. When they did, Thalia took a shaky breath and coughed, as if it was the first breath she took in years, which was true. She opened her eyes, revealing to have electric blue eyes as she stared at Naruto and Percy in confusion. Who? My name is Naruto Uzumaki. This here is Percy Jackson. Naruto pointed to Percy. What was the last thing you remember? Thalia blinked. I was fighting the Furies and was fatally wounded. I was dying. It's okay now, Percy said. You are not dying. Can you tell me your name? Naruto asked. Thalia looked at Naruto bewildered. Of course. I am Thalia, she said. Daughter of Zeus. It was the last week of summer, and Naruto stood at Half-Blood Hill with his backpack strapped to his back. A lot had happened since Thalia came back. Mostly because campers were running around like headless chickens, not sure how they should behave around her. If it wasn't the fear of Zeus striking them down for making fun of her, it was the fear of being zapped by Thalia if they do, Drew proved so when she tried to make fun of Thalia's clothes. At first Thalia stayed in the medical wing for two days regaining her strength and getting caught up with Annabeth, who never left her side. Thalia was impressed from all the stories Annabeth told her of what kind of woman she'd grown into. When Naruto came to visit, Thalia was surprised to find out that Naruto was the grandson of Athena and Hermes from another world. At first she didn't believe it until Naruto created a few shadow clones. But the one thing Thalia had the hardest to believe was that Naruto defeated the Kraken. Things did get rocky when Naruto told Thalia about the demon sealed in him. Naruto felt it was only right since everyone else in camp knew. At first Thalia didn't know what to make of the idea of Naruto being a Jinchuriki, but Annabeth helped clear things up with Thalia that Naruto was a good person and wouldn't do any real harm, although he would prank anyone who cross him. The fact that Naruto led the quest to Polyphemus Island to save Grover and retrieve the Golden Fleece that saved Thalia's life was proof enough. Thalia eventually met Clarice Hinata and Percy and befriended them although Thalia and Percy had a rockier start than Percy's and Annabeth's friendship. The hardest part though was telling Thalia about Luke. At first Thalia called them a liar, which Naruto expected. But after Chiron back up a story and told her Luke had changed since her supposed death, she accepted it but was still hurt. Naruto decided to make Thalia feel better by inviting her to come with them to the elemental nations. After Annabeth convinced Thalia, she agreed. Now Naruto waited for his friends at the meeting spot. At first Naruto thought of changing into his old jumpsuit for the first time in two years since it was the clothes he left the elemental nations in. 
But it turns out that Naruto had grown so much in the last two years, his old jumpsuit didn't fit. Not even his ninja shoes fit. Instead, he wore his Camp Half-Blood t-shirt under a grey-blue sleeveless hoodie with a Yuzumaki whirlpool on the back, blue cargo pants, black combat boots, and his shinobi headband tied around his forehead. He had his first Hokage necklace, camp necklace, and his compass locket around his necks and Tharos and Ponria on his wrist. Anada and Claris were the first to show up. Anada was wearing a purple hoodie with white sleeves, blue jeans, ninja sandals, her headband which was coated with celestial bronze around her neck, and a lavender color backpack on her back. Claris on other hand had a brown rucksack on her back wearing an extra 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 large blood red shirt, camouflage pants, a pair of her own combat, and a bandana over her hair. Tell me why again we agreed to meet here. Claris asked. I thought it seems right, Naruto responded. Percy and Grover arrived next, both carrying a rough sack, only Percy's is blue, and Grover's is leafy green. Then Annabeth and Thalia, who were the only ones who packed in suitcase, although Annabeth had a camera she bought at the camp store tied to a string around her neck. Geez, Annabeth. Are you planning to take pictures of the leaf? Percy asked. Yep. Annabeth said. I don't plan to miss any of the architect of Naruto's homeworld. Um, Annabeth, you do realize we're only going to the Leaf Village, right? Naruto asked. We're not going to be able to visit every nation in the Elemental Nations or their architects. I know, but I still want to get some pictures, Annabeth said. Most of the group shook their heads. Is this everyone going? Asked another voice. Mr. T appeared besides the tree. Yep, Naruto responded. Okay, listen up, said Mr. T. I can't take you directly into the Leaf Village without causing a panic. Unlike in this world, the mist there doesn't cover everything. Mostly because we don't normally need the mist to cover everything, Naruto explained. Right, Mr. T said. So it'll transport you at least a mile from the walls of the leaf where, hopefully it would be mortal free. If anyone ask, you kids came from the land of the gods. That's the name we Olympians used to hide who were from those who weren't supposed to know about this world. Those who do know it will know where it is. That sounds good, Naruto agreed. I never did get to return to the leaf from my mission before I was brought to this world, anyways. My mom had me leave the village before taking me here too, Hinata said. She didn't want to cause a panic for my team by having me disappear in the leaf, right? So when you are ready to go home use these, Mr. D toss each of them a strawberry color pearl to each of them. Step on it and it will take you back to camp more precise in the strawberry fields. Kind of like how those pearls Poseidon gave us returned us to the sea, Naruto remembered. What belongs to the sea returns to the sea, so what belongs to the strawberry fields of Camp Half-Blood will return to the strawberry fields of Camp Half-Blood, Percy agreed. Right, Mr. T said. Okay, hold hands, runts. That way you don't separate when you enter the elemental nations. Wow, Mr. D, I didn't think you would be worried about us separating in the elemental nations. Naruto asked. I don't, but I rather not have to explain to your parents and grandparents how I lost six demigods and a satyr in another world, Dionysa said. Grover probably won't mind, Naruto said. He might use it as a chance to search for Pan there. Grover turned search pink as everyone laughed. It was no secret that there was a rumor going around satyrs and nature spirits that the Lord of the Wild might be hiding in the elemental nations, wildlife is still at their peak, and despite the ninja battles that happen there, the nature there is nowhere near as polluted as it is here. They held hands. All right, Mr. T said. Don't try any problems if you can't help yourself. Mr. D snapped his fingers, and Naruto felt like he was vanishing in a sizzle of grape-smelling smoke. He looked down and saw grape-color smoke surrounding him and his friends, until they couldn't see anything. When the smoke cleared, and everyone was done coughing, Naruto found himself in a familiar wooded area. What was the point of that? We were just transported into the woods surrounding the camp. Thalia asked. I don't think this is the woods surrounding the camp, Naruto said. Naruto's right, Hinata agreed. What do you mean? Annabeth asked. Hold on. He'll go see. Naruto ran up a nearby tree to the highest point above the treetops. Once up there, Naruto saw a large set of walls that towers over the trees tall, enough to be seen even this far away. The walls that surrounded the leaf village. Naruto grinned as he jumped down to his friends. We made it. We're in the land of fire. We're right outside the village hidden in the leaves. Remind me again why a village with that name is located in a country called the land of fire. Thalia asked. Don't ask me. The first Hokage supposedly came up with that name, Naruto responded. Come on. I want to see how much my home has changed in the past two years. Naruto raced off. Naruto, wait up. Percy yelled as they chased after him. Your nephew sure can run, Annabeth, Thalia complained. Tell me about it, Annabeth grumbled. Naruto kept running even after the walls that surrounded the village came to view from the ground. He did stop when he reached the clearing right outside the wall. Naruto couldn't help but cry with joy at the sight. The last time he saw the walls was when he was off on a mission to save Sasuke which ended as a failure. 
that was over two years ago. Naruto, don't run off like that. Percy complained. Not all of us has your stamina. Percy? Grover stopped Percy. Percy noticed what Grover meant as tears flow out of his eyes. Sorry guys, Naruto wiped his eyes. It's okay, Naruto we understand, Hinata said. Yeah. This is where you grew up most of your life, Anubis said. Even with a rotten life you had, this place was still the first place holds importance to you. Naruto nodded. Come on. Five of you will need it to be granted entrance by the guards before you can enter. They headed to the gates of the walls where two jonin were keeping guard. One had dark wildly spiky hair with a bandage over his nose, while the other had a bandana headband that went over his hair. Well, look who the cat dragged in, said the first jonin. Naruto Uzumaki. I thought you would have gone rogue. No way, Naruto responded. I would never leave the leaf permanently. Hey listen, some of my friends here need grant access. That's fine with me. We just need them to sign in their name and the nation they're from, explained the first jonin. Ah, Naruto responded. They're from the land of the gods, Hinata responded. Oh, the land of the gods. I always wanted to go there, but I heard you have to know somebody important to get there, said the first jonin. That's right, we know very important people, Annabeth replied. So where do we sign in? Annabeth, Thalia, Percy, Grover, and Clara signed in. Nice one wise girl, Clara said. Why not tell everyone who our parents are? Sorry, Annabeth muttered. At least we got in, Thalia said. So now where do we go? We should check into the Hokage's office, Hinata said. Let her know Naruto and I are back. Oh, uh, where is Naruto? Grover asked. They looked around until Annabeth said, oh my gods. As she looked up, they looked up to see Naruto was standing on a nearby power pole looking over the village. I'm home everyone. Naruto yelled from the top of his lungs. We better find a short leash to put on Naruto, Percy grumbled. Otherwise, we'll keep losing him. Hey Hinata. Are those the faces of the Hokage? Annabeth asked Hianta pointing to the mountain that had five faces on it four men and one female. Why yeah, Hinata responded. T they added Lady Tsunade's face to the mountain before I came to camp. S Shes the fifth Hokage and granddaughter of the first Hokage. Naruto told me about that, Annabeth said. She also started the medical ninja training program, so the village would have medics in the battlefield when the nations were at war with each other, and Shes one of the legendary three son and three of the greatest ninjas in the elemental nations. Not to mention Shes super strong like can destroy a wall with one punch strong. Sounds like a female hero that would make the history books, Thalia said. No wonder Shes the first female leader of the Leaf Village. Yep, and one day it'll be one of her successors, Naruto said as he came back down. As sixth Okage. Naruto, can you be real for a second? Thalia asked. Okay, maybe seventh Okage if Grandma Tsunade retires or if something happens to her before I finish up my training at Camp Half-Blood, Naruto responded. That's not what I mean, Thalia responded. That is Naruto being real, Grover said. Naruto's dream is to become Hokage like his dad, Annabeth explained. By the way, Naruto, which one is your dad? Percy asked. Left side from Grandma Tsunade, Naruto pointed to the face next to Tsunade of a man with spiky hair. And the one before him is the third Hokage, and the one before him is the second Hokage, and the one before him is the first Hokage the founder of the Leaf Village. Well, I can see where you get your spiky hair from, Clarice responded looking at the fourth Hokage's face. Annabeth was staring at the fourth Hokage's face but for a different reason. So has my search brother, Annabeth thought. The war hero of the Leaf. Come on guys, Naruto responded. The Hokage's office is this way. Naruto lead them through the village. Annabeth took pictures of the architects until they reached a building that almost resembled cylinders stacked on each other, with a circle on the top piece with the symbol for Hokage. The woman with blonde hair and brown eyes in a green coat was working through her paperwork. She would have stopped earlier for a sake break, but her assistant Shizun won't allow it as Tsunade was behind on her paperwork due to her trip to the Leaf Villages, famous hot springs for the whole day yesterday. Ever since Naruto left for the other world, her work never been the same. At first she kept expecting the blonde knucklehead to show up at her door in his loud and obnoxious way. When she came to accept Naruto wasn't coming back anytime soon, she started slacking off on some of her work more than usual. At first Shizun went off easy on Tsunade, thinking it was Tsunade's way of getting over the fact that Naruto was gone. But then the work started piling up more than usual, and Shizun started getting on Tsunade's case about finishing the work. There was a knock on the door. I'm getting the work done, Shizun. Don't worry, Tsunade responded as Shizun had been checking in every five minutes to make sure Tsunade was getting the paperwork done. Shizun came in. Well that's good to know, but that's not why I'm here. You have a guest. The guest? Naruto came in through the door. Hey Grandma Tsunade. Long time no see. Naruto, what how? Tsunade responded. I was allowed to come back from the land of gods for a while for good behavior, Naruto responded. You can cut the act, Naruto. We know you were from the other world, Tsunade said. My great-grandmother is Aphrodite after all. 
Naruto frowned. Yara legacy? That's right, Tsunade responded. My grandmother was the daughter of Aphrodite. Now tell me the real reason why you are here. Well first, here are some people you have to meet. Naruto headed out for a second. When he came back, he came back with Hinata along with five others. One of them was a boy with dark hair with sea green eyes, a boy with curly brown hair with crutches, although Tsunade got the feeling he didn't really need them, a girl with surfer tan skin, blonde hair and stormy grey eyes, who had a slight family resemblance to Naruto, a girl with dark hair electric blue eyes and freckles across her nose, and the last girl with brown hair and muscular like she'd been working out and fighting her whole life. Eyes, this is Lady Tsunade the fifth Hokage, Naruto said. And apparently the great-granddaughter of Aphrodite. They are the great-granddaughter of Aphrodite. The blonde girl asked. That's right, Tsunade said. My grandmother was Aphrodite's mother. We believe you, said the dark hair boy. It's just we met some of your aunts and uncles and you don't seem that much like them. Not in a bad way, said the curly hair boy in crutches. I get what he means, Tsunade said. Lady Tsunade doesn't possess all of the powers that a child of Aphrodite might have, Shizun said. You could say most of it is faded with each generation. Anyway, this here is Percy Jackson. Son of Poseidon, Thalia Grace daughter of Zeus, Clarice LaRue. Daughter of Ars and Grover Underwood. A satyr from the camp we were from, Naruto pointed out each of his friends before wrapping his arm around Annabeth. And this young lady here is my aunt Annabeth Chase. Daughter of Athena. I take it you found out your heritage? Shizun asked. That's right. Grandma Athena and Grandpa Hermes told me, Naruto explained. They also told me why my heritage was a secret up until now. Did the fourth Hokage really had that many enemies? Annabeth asked. Oh yes, Tsunade said. During the last Great War, Minato took down thousands of stone ninjas in one battle. That one battle practically earned him the title of Hokage, but it also led to many enemies who would want revenge. Including the third Tsuchikage. That's why Jiraiya and even Kakashi agreed that when Minato died, the best way to keep Naruto safe was to keep it a secret. Kakashi sensei knew? Naruto asked. Of course, Kakashi was one of your father's students, Tsunade said. It's actually the reason you were assigned to him. So that if you pass his test to become Genin, he could watch over you as you grow to be a ninja your parents want you to be. Sounds like a well-designed plan, Annabeth said. Athena worthy. Naruto, I have to ask you, how long do you plan to stay here? Tsunade asked. Annabeth, Percy, Thalia, Grover and Clarice will be here for the week, Naruto said. I think I might stay a little longer maybe until winter break or next summer. I know there are stuff going on here in the elemental nations involving the Akatsuki, but there is something going on in the other world that my friends here might get caught in. Say no more, Tsunade said. You have family in that world, and even the Hokage can't interfere with family problems. Just know you are always welcome back even for visits. But there will be some issues. What kind of issues? Naruto asked. Most of the things I can't deal with myself. But only after I do a physical and mental exam on you to see if you're fit to return to the ninja core. Sounds good, Naruto responded. It'll also will need to do a DNA test between you and Annabeth to prove you two are related, Tsunade said. Fortunately demigod DNA makes half-siblings with the same divine parent be recognized. So if Annabeth is Minato's half-sister, and I do believe she is, in theory it might show in the DNA you got from your father. Right, Naruto and Annabeth responded. As for the rest there are a few things we need to discuss like the living arrangements of your friends, as I doubt they all can fit in your single apartment, Tsunade said. I, I can talk to my father about letting Clarice Annabeth and Thalia stay with me at the Hyuga compound, Hinata responded. That way they won't be crammed into Naruto's apartment. Fair enough, Tsunade agreed. There is also the issue of your rank. When you left the village, you were a genin so you'll have to be reinstated at that rank. The good news is that the next Chuanin exams isn't until next month in the village hidden in the sand. Sounds good, Naruto responded. I can go see Gara and get promoted at the same time. Very well, then that just leaves getting reacquainted with your teammate Sakura Haruno and your Jonin instructor Kakashi Haddock, Tsunade said. We don't know how much you have improved and they'll have new tricks you haven't seen. We can do that while my friends are here, Naruto said. That way they can meet them. I like that idea, Percy agreed. Naruto, you might want to stock up on ninja weapons made from the metal used in this world, Annabeth told Naruto. After all, the only weapons you brought with you are made out of celestial bronze. Effective against demigods and monsters, ineffective against mortal ninjas. Oh, right, Naruto responded. Not even my katana would be any use against mortal shinobis. Katana? Tsunade asked. Naruto took out Yuzushi Ono or Rashi in pen form and clicked the button. The sword expanded into its full-length celestial bronze katana. Tsunade was shocked to see it as it was obvious from her expression that she recognized it. Not only Tsunade, but Shizun recognized it. Grandpa Hermes gave it to me. He said it was a family heirloom, Naruto said. 
That's right, Tsunade said, Yuzushio no Orashi was a gift to my grandmother before she married my grandfather and went by her maiden name. Yuzumaki. Yuzumaki you mean him related to Aphrodite? Naruto asked. Not really, Tsunade said. The Yuzumaki clan had a special connection with the Shinigami the god of death in this world, and through him, they have history with the Olympians. However, we're as related as much as everyone in any other clan members are related to members of the same clan. You and Kishina is more like my distant cousin. But then how did I came to have your grandmother's sword? Naruto asked. Well, it was given to her back when she became the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Your grandmother was the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Naruto asked. The very first Jinchuriki, Tsunade said. And a powerful one while added. She was able to search control the power of the Nine-Tailed Fox. This sword was given to her as a gift for being able to do what only few ever in history were able to. She stayed as Jinchuriki until your mother became Jinchuriki. Naruto's mom was Jinchuriki. Percy asked. And like my grandmother, she was able to search control the fox's powers. Part of the reason why Minato had high hopes that Naruto would be able to control the fox's power, Tsunade said. When Kishina was chosen to be the Jinchuriki, my grandmother passed the sword to her, saying that since it was given to her when she became a Jinchuriki, it's only right she does the same. Although Kishina never really used it. I think she only kept it as a keepsake. Well Naruto sure uses it, Percy said. There is hardly a battle Naruto fought without that thing. Naruto looked embarrassed. Well, at least it was put to good use, Tsunade responded. I don't see why you can't keep it. Seriously. But this was your grandmother's, Naruto responded. And that necklace I gave you was from my grandfather, Tsunade responded. If I can trust you with my grandfather's necklace, I can trust you with my grandmother's sword. Just as she trusted your mother with it, Tsunade handed Naruto back the sword. Naruto butted it in his hand, and it shrunk down to pen form. I will say this, I never seen it done like that before, Tsunade responded. Hermes must have had it modified so Naruto could carry it around in our world without drawing attention to himself, Annabeth said. Many weapons and shields we used are like that. He might have also had it enchanted to return to Naruto's pocket in pen form, if Naruto ever lose it, Percy stated. Sounds like something the Olympians would do, Tsunade responded. If that's it, you can go. Naruto, Annabeth, I expect you tomorrow to get DNA samples. Everyone nodded. After they left the office, Hinata headed straight to the Hyuga compound to get permission from her father to let Annabeth Claris and Thalia stay there. So much for vacation, Percy said. DNA test and physical. Lady Tsunade probably wants to make sure Naruto is still capable of completing quest, Annabeth said. As for the DNA test, as far as the village knows, Naruto never had a family before he left, so she probably want to clear any doubt he has family. Well I don't know about DNA test, but Naruto will pass the physical, said Grover. He could run up and down Half-Blood Hill without slowing down or resting longer than most demigods. Not to mention out every dryad instructor, Percy responded. All those practices of running away from the gods seems not enough against Naruto. Says the guy who is slower than a tree, Naruto joked. Hey. Who is slower than a tree? Asked a new voice. Naruto turned to see a girl his age with bubblegum search pink hair and green eyes. Sakura. Naruto responded. I heard you were back, Naruto, Sakura said. I thought you would have gone to Ichirakus though, so I went there first. Ichiraku? Thalia asked Annabeth. Naruto's favorite Raymond stand, Annabeth said. It's the original Ichiraku there talking about as Hinata's mom opened up two more stands one in the Lotus Casino and another one on Mount Search Olympus. Both of which Naruto has visited. Sorry, we visited Grandma Tsunade first, Naruto said. We had to get a few things sorted out. We? Sakura turned to those with Naruto. This is my friends from the land of the gods where I've been staying while I cooperated, Naruto explained. Thalia Grace, Percy Jackson, Clarice LaRue, Grover Underwood, and Annabeth Chase. Nice to meet you, Sakura said. Land of the gods I think I heard of it before. It's a private nation. You have to know someone important from there to be allowed there, Naruto said. One of those people was on his way back there when he found me and took me there. We have some of the best medics and medicine there. Uh-huh, Sakura responded. Nice try Naruto, but where are they really from? How did you know Naruto was lying? Annabeth asked. Because I've been Naruto's teammate and I know that when Naruto lies, he gets a gleam in his eyes, Sakura said. It especially became an obvious sign when he started his own ninja ways of keeping oaths, because when he makes an oath he doesn't have that gleam. That does make sense, Grover said. Okay, Sakura, if you can get Ino, Shikamaru, Choji, Kiba, Shino, Tenten, and Lee to come to training ground 7 where Kakashi-sensei gave us that bell test tomorrow afternoon, it'll tell you the whole truth, Naruto offered. I promise. Sounds good, Sakura agreed. Especially since it seems your friends need to get adjusted here. Sakura left. All of your friends? Annabeth asked. 
yeah, if I'm going to go clean with Sakura, I might as well do the same for the rest of them, Naruto said. We can tell Hinata about it too so she can tell her cousin Niji. Hopefully they're not going on a quest tomorrow. Come on. We can drop by our stuff before I introduce you guys to my favorite restaurant in the Leaf. Let me guess, Ichiraku. Dahlia asked. The best ramen in the elemental nations, Naruto responded. Hinata entered the Hyuga compound. Sister, you're home. A girl four to five years younger than Hinata with long dark hair and Hyuga eyes greeted. We didn't expect you for another week. The camp activities director let me come home a week early, Hinata explained. Where's father? In his studies, Hanabi said. Thank you. Hinata headed to her father's studies. She knocked on the wood of the sliding door. Come in. Said a male voice. Hinata entered where a man with dark brown long hair Hyuga eyes and wearing robes was sitting. Hello father, Hinata responded. Hinata, I didn't expect you home for another week, her father responded. The activities director. Chiron let me come home early for helping the camp, Hinata explained. He even let Naruto come back with some of our friends from camp. I see, her father responded. How did your training go? Good so far. Chiron and I discovered him pretty good with a bow and arrow, thanks to my Byakugan, Hinata responded. They also teach wrestling and monster fighting, so I'm learning ways of using the gentle fist against monsters. Plus, Naruto introduced me to good people in the camp some of them are in charge of some of the activities for Chiron, so he have to be in more than one place. Well, that's good to know, her father responded. As long as you keep improving, you can return next summer. Thank you, father. Hinata bowed. Um, father. Yes. Naruto's apartment is too small for all of our friends, and three of them are girls, so I was hoping they can stay in the Hyuga compound until they return to their home at the end of the week. As long as they behave and respect the Hyuga clan rules, I don't see any problems, her father responded. And I would also like to meet these friends you made that came with you and Naruto. Maybe invite them to dinner. Naruto too, since he helps you so much. Yes, father. Hinata responded. Thank you father. Now, tell me about this quest you were on. Here we are, Naruto said as he unlocked the door to his apartment, sending dust everywhere. The whole apartment was covered in dust. Whoa. It's a bit dusty here. A bit. Annabeth said. Gods, what's that smell? It's coming to the fridge, Percy said. I hate to say this, but we should clean this stuff up, Thalia said. And please, someone, throw out that fridge. They started working around the apartment getting it clean, and with the help of Percy and Grover, Naruto threw out everything in the fridge as nothing was salvageable. Annabeth even noticed that most of the stuff was expired long before Naruto came to their world. Great. Now I'm going to need to add getting groceries to the list of stuff I'll have to do while I'm here. Naruto said once the apartment was clean. And unlike back in the other world, I do not have a trust fund in the elemental nations. How did you get by before? Annabeth asked. Well, up until I graduated the academy, old man Hokage gave me money to pay for my meals, Naruto said. After I graduated I started making money by completing missions. So until you start working, you're broke, Thalia said. Oh man, Naruto responded. What? Annabeth asked. I just realize I can't afford a Chiricus Raymond, Naruto said. What about weapons? Claris asked. If you're broke you can't afford that. Fenton has scrolls full of containment seals she used to hold hundreds of weapons, Naruto said, I can see if she can spare me some kunai knives and shurikens tomorrow. Well, that's great, but we need to eat, Grover complained. At that moment, there was a knock at Naruto's door. That must be Hinata, Annabeth said as she headed to the door. However, when she opened it she found it was a young man at least 12 years older than Naruto, with brown hair kept in a ponytail, dark eyes, and a scar that runs across the bridge of his nose. Annabeth figured he was a ninja as he had the standard Konoha Shinobi forehead protector like Naruto's and Hinata's, except the plate was stell instead of celestial bronze. He also wore a sandals, a flak jacket and on each sleeve a red whirlpool. Oh, hello. I was told Naruto Uzumaki would be here, the man said. Naruka sensei Naruto cheered. Naruto. Look at you. You sure have grown since I last saw you, Naruka responded. How did you know I was back? Naruto asked. I ran into Sakura and she told me, Haruka responded. And I see she wasn't kidding when you said you brought friends. Haruka looked over Annabeth and everyone else in the apartment. Oh, this is Annabeth, Thalia, Claris, Percy, and Grover, Naruto introduced pointing to each one of his friends. Guys this is my former academy instructor Haruka. So you are the famous Haruka sensei Naruto brags about, Grover said. I don't brag about him, Naruto argued. Yes, you do, Annabeth said. I actually thought of coming here to treat Naruto to Raymond, Haruka said. If you guys want, I can treat all of you too. Good. Because Naruto doesn't have any food left that hasn't expired, Thalia said. Aruka took them to a small ramen stand with curtains draped over the top of the restaurant. Hey guys. Naruto greeted as they entered. 
Long time no see. Naruto, you're back. Said the owner and head chef Tucci. Yep. Naruto responded, and I brought friends. Great. More the merrier, Tucci said. Everyone managed to find a seat in the stand. So what would you take? Asked Tucci's daughter Ayumi. Seven of your best Raymonds for Naruto and his friends, Hiruka said. Ah, actually if you can, can you make mine vegetarian friendly? Grover asked. I don't eat any meat. A non-meat eater, huh? Tucci asked. I'm always up for a new challenge. He'll see what I can do for you. Thank you, Grover responded. So you're a vegetarian, Grover? Hiruka asked. Ah, yeah, Grover responded. So Naruto, where have you been the last two years? Hiruka asked. All Kakashi told me was that you were with family. I was in the land of the gods, Naruto lied. Naruto I can tell when you're lying, Hiruka responded. Does everyone in this world know the secret to knowing when I lie and not tell me? Naruto asked. It comes to being a teacher, Naruto, Hiruka responded. Naruto pouted as Anabeth decided it was best to tell Hiruka. So you guys are from another world? Hiruka asked. And each of you are half gods and half humans. Except me, Grover said. I'm a sadder half human half goat. And it turns out both of my parents were half bloods, Naruto said, which makes me a legacy. My dad's mother is Athena. Goddess of wisdom, and my mom's dad is Hermes. Messenger of the gods. I'm also the champion of Hestia. Goddess of the hearth. It basically means she had blessed me with some of her powers, and in return I help her out whenever she calls me to duty. My mom is Athena, which makes me Naruto's aunt, Annabeth said. My dad's Poseidon. God of the sea, Percy said. Zeus is my father. God of the sky, Thalia finished. My father is Ares. Search God of War, Clara said. Naruto's heritage actually does explain his personality, Annabeth explained. You see, many demigods are ADHD attention deficient hyperactive disorder. We can't stand still most of the time, and we seek and see things most mortals dismissed. This is due to our brains being hardwired for battle. Naruto also has dyslexia, which is a reading disorder where when we try to read the word starts moving around, making it difficult. That's brought on by our brains being hardwired for ancient Greek one of the languages of our world. As for Naruto's love for pranks that's a side effect of being a legacy of Hermes as Hermes, also a patron god of anyone who uses roads from friendly merchants to cunning thieves. It does explain a lot, Hiruka said. Unfortunately Naruto is more Hermes than Athena, Annabeth said. Only once in a while his Athena side kicks in. Hey. Naruto responded. Here you go, Aum handed everyone a bowl of Raymond, and here you go sir. One vegetarian Raymond. She gave Grover his bowl. Thank you, Grover took out his chopsticks and tried it. Wow this is good. I told you, Naruto responded. Everyone tried it and soon they were all eating as Naruto told Iruka some of the other friends he had in camp and the quest they were on. Thank you for coming, Aum said after they were one. Thanks for the meal, sir, Thalia said. Please, call me Iruka, Iruka responded. Then Naruto. They turned to see Hinata running toward them. I better let you go, Iruka said. If you need another meal, just ask. Thanks, Iruka sensei Naruto responded. Hey Hinata, what's the news on our living arrangements? Thalia asked. And my father agreed, Hinata agreed. That's great. H however, father does want all of you to come over at least once for dinner, Hinata said. He wants to meet you guys, and then Naruto, you are invited as thanks for helping me get settled in camp. Great. We can do it tomorrow, Naruto said. That reminds me. Hinata, you think you can get Kiba, Shino, and Niji to come to training ground 7 tomorrow? And see if Niji could get Lee and Tenten too. That's sure thing Naruto, Hinata agreed. At least we don't have to go hungry tomorrow, said Claris. The girls left toward the Hyuga compound. I guess we better head back to your apartment, Percy said. Sounds good, Grover said. I had enough adventures for one day. They headed to Naruto's apartment for the night. After the following morning, Naruto went through Tsunade's physical. It took most of the afternoon with laps, blood work, reflexes, etch. Annabeth even came in for the recommended DNA test. By the end of the exam Naruto was in Tsunade's medical office as she looked over Naruto's results. We won't get the results of your blood work for a while, but judging from the rest of your results, you seem to be at your peak physical condition, Tsunade said. Does that mean I can return to the ninja core? Naruto asked. As soon as your blood work comes in, Tsunade said. As for your DNA test, as I had figured, even without the lack of human DNA from divine heritage, there is some abnormalities in both of your DNA that proves you two are related and thus prove you have family. Great, Naruto responded. Is that all? Yes, Tsunade said. Right, thanks Gramma Tsunade. Naruto headed off. Tsunade looked over Naruto's chart and took out Naruto's old record she kept on her. She didn't tell Naruto, but there was a significant difference in Naruto's skill levels especially in chakra search control. It looks like Naruto has made a jump in improvement. A new voice said. 
Sunaid looked up to see a man with spiky white long hair tied in a ponytail and face paint lines running down from his eyes. He was wearing grey and red toads and old-fashioned sandals that most ninjas don't wear. Perhaps more of an improvement he would have achieved training with me, the man said. Duryaya, Sunaid said. What brings you back to the leaf? Well, I heard Naruto was back, so I thought I'd come and see my godson, Jiraiya said. HMPH. I wonder how Naruto would react to you calling him your godson, considering you spend most of his life away from the village, Sunaid said. Hey, I would have let Naruto come live with me, but the council won't let it unless I stay in the leaf, Jiraiya said. Well, the council will have a hard time keeping Naruto here now that I confirm Naruto has family, Sunaid said. Now what's the real reason you're here? Okay, okay, Jiraiya said. I've learned of something about the Akatsuki. Have they gone active? Tsunade asked. Actually, on contrary, they seem to have disappeared, Jiraiya said. How? Tsunade asked. I don't know. But it might buy Naruto more time to prepare for when they show their ugly faces, Jiraiya said. But there is more. More than the Akatsuki gone missing. Tsunade asked. Unfortunately, said Jiraiya. Hirachimaru is dead. Dead? Tsunade responded. How did that happen? From what I heard, Sasu killed him, Jiraiya said. I don't know how or why it happened. I mean, from what I learned we still have months until the Rachimaru time with his new body runs out. Great. Tsunade responded. So the Akatsuki is missing, and Sasuke is most likely out looking for his search brother, after killing Orochimaru was killed. Anything else? Ah, uh, yeah. Fugasaku has requested I bring Naruto to Toad Village to start sage training, Jiraiya said. As soon as I got word he came back to the elemental nations and found him. I had to ask. Tsunade grumbled. How did it go? Annabeth asked as Naruto came out. Good. Grandma Tsunade said it'll be starting missions as soon as the blood test confirms her results, Naruto explained. Oh, and there are traces in my DNA that proves you are my aunt. That's good, Annabeth said. Demigod DNA isn't like mortal or divine DNA, so I was wondering if it was possible for Tsunade to confirm it. Now come on. We're late for your own meeting. Meanwhile, Percy, Grover, Thalia, and Claris who came with Hinata and Sakura were at the three post at training field 7, waiting for Naruto. So far all of Naruto's friends showed up including three kids had to be at least three years younger than Percy and Annabeth, each wore a matching blue goggles that they said is like the ones Naruto used to wear. Hinata and Sakura took the honor of introducing the demigods and Sadder to each person there, although Hinata didn't get into much details as they were waiting for Naruto to arrive. Hey guys. Naruto yelled as he rushed to the area. The physical exams took longer than I thought. About time. A blonde girl with pale blue eyes known as Eno shouted. Sorry, Eno, Naruto responded. I got here as fast as I could. Where is Annabeth? Thalia asked. Naruto looked behind him and rubbed the back of his head. Beats me. She was right behind me when we reached the outer parts of the village. I told you we should keep a leash on him, Percy muttered. He probably got excited and picked up the pace without thinking of telling Annabeth. Naruto. Fast. The wild-looking teen named Kiva laughed. I would love to see that. Shino, you think you could send a beetle out to look for Naruto's friend? Asked the lazy dark-haired teen Shikamaru. The teen wearing a pair of sunglasses and a hooded jacket nodded. Somewhere from under his sleeve a bug flew out and headed off the direction Naruto left. When it returned, Annabeth was following, looking rather confused until she saw Naruto. Then she looked furious. Naruto Uzumaki. The next time you pick up speed that is impossible for me to keep up without warning, it'll stick one of your celestial bronze kunai knives somewhere where you'll need a medical ninja to get it removed. Annabeth threatened. Naruto paled, which caught his friends from the elemental nation's attention since Sakura normally the one who threatened Naruto and even she doesn't make Naruto that scared. I'm sorry Annabeth, Naruto apologized. Hey Naruto. Naruto turned to see a puff of smoke appearing out of nowhere. As it started to give way, there was a naked dark hair girl whose private areas were covered by the smoke. Most of the boys either turned search pink or had nose bleeds or just turned away as they seen the jutsu before. Then in another puff of smoke as the girl transformed into a 10-year-old boy. What do you think? An improvement from the last time you saw me use it, right? The kid known as Konohamaru said. Yeah. I can tell you've been working on the sexy jutsu, Naruto admitted. However, while you've been improving the sexy jutsu, I've been working on improving the transformation jutsu in a whole different scale. Oh, I got to see this, Kiba said. There is no way Naruto could have transform. Naruto made the hand sign and a puff of smoke. When it cleared Naruto was an unidentifiable form with red spiky hair, green eyes, and different facial structure and skin tone. Naruto transformed back to his normal form. Cool huh? I also figured out how to use the transformation jutsu to make my clothes look like something else so that I can appear unarmed and yet be armed at the same time. That does sound more practical, said a brown hair boy wearing glasses named Mutant. 
Can you teach me that second trick of the transformation? An orange hair girl named Mogi asked. Wait a second, before Naruto goes shows off any more jutsus, he still need to answer questions, said Tintin. Such as, where have you been in the last two years? Well, we could go through the long explanation, or Ino could use one of her family's jutsus to share some of my memories, Naruto said. Could you? Sakura asked Ino. I think so I never tried though, Ino explained. I trust you, Ino, Naruto said. Ino nodded. Okay everyone hold on to me. This will be rocky. Everyone did as Ino made the hand signs and touched Naruto's head. Ninja art. Memory view jutsu. As she said that the memories started coming through everyone's heads. From the moment Naruto read the letter from his grandparents to just a few days ago when Naruto found Annabeth leaning over Thalia. There was nothing personal, except the memories where Naruto met Hermes and Athena, as he wanted his friends know his grandparents, or anything on the mark of Athena, but the message became clear where Naruto had been. Whoa, said a teen with a black bowl cut style hair with busy brows wearing a green spandex and leg warmers Lee. Naruto said Sakura. It's okay, Naruto responded. Okay Naruto, you found your family, Sakura said. I'm amazed you agree to come back at all. Just because I found my family didn't mean I stopped thinking the leaf is my home, Naruto stated. Or forgot about you guys, or gave up on my dream of becoming Hokage. If I did, I would have turned down Chiron's offer to come back. It's true, Percy said. Naruto was practically jumping with joy when Chiron said he could return to the elemental nations. I believe it, said a lazy kid with a pineapple-style dark hair, Naruto isn't the type to turn his back on his friends, and it takes a lot to make him to leave them to fight their battles as we seen during our battle with the Sound 5. Annabeth looked at the boy. Yara the lazy genius Shikamaru Nara Naruto told me about, aren't you? Lazy genius? Asked a girl with her hair done in buns named Tenten. Yeah, because Shikamaru is a genius, but he spends most of his time hiding it by being lazy, Naruto responded. He got you, Shikamaru, said a chubby boy named Choji. Troublesome, Shikamaru muttered. Annabeth is able to read people due to her time in Camp Half-Blood, and she could tell immediately that Choji and Shikamaru were as close as friends as she and Thalia were almost sibling-like. It was like they represent two things you don't expect from a ninja, which Annabeth had already guessed from knowing Naruto for two years, laziness and being overweight, and yet these two were full-fledged shinobis. Well, now. Since introductions is over, maybe I can step in. Said a new voice. They turned to see a man who was older than Aruka at least they could guess he was, since he had a face mask that covered his lower face and his shinobi headband covering one of his eyes, so only a small portion of his face was visible. He was wearing a black bodysuit with a green jonin vest, and he had grey hair that looked like he tried to spike it upward, only for gravity to kick in as it leaned to the side. Bakashi sensei Naruto responded. What are you doing here? Lady Hokage actually send me, Kakashi said, she wants me to get started to get you and Sakura reacquainted with each other's skills as well as my own for. What? But we're hanging out with our friends. Naruto complained. They can stay and watch, Kakashi said. After all, there is always a chance you two might have to work with your friends. Go ahead, legacy boy, Clarice punched Naruto in the shoulder, it's a good way for us to see you in action with your teammates. Fine, Naruto grumbled. Tenten, can I borrow some kunais and shurikens? The weapons I brought with me from camp only works on demigods and monsters. Also if you have a spare katana I can borrow, I appreciate it. Uh, sure. Tenten unsealed a dozen kunai said shurikens from one of her scrolls for Naruto to use as well as a katana for Naruto to use. Naruto swung around the katana a bit, testing it. It doesn't feel right. I mean, it's in good shape and everything, but it doesn't feel as good in your hands as your own sword, Kakashi finished. Naruto nodded. Well, it won't be the first time I work with a sword that felt wrong in my hands, and I doubt it will be the last. Sakura, are you ready? Uh, yeah. Sakura responded. I'm ready when you two are. Very well, Kakashi said as he took out two silver bells tied to a string. I believe you two are familiar with the bell test. Naruto and Sakura smirked as they were all too well familiar with it. We must get the bell within a certain amount of time. Otherwise we will fail, Sakura said. And in order to get the bells, we have to come at you with the full intention to kill you, Naruto said. But I think you need your eyes check Kakashi sensei. You have two bells, and there's two of us. I would have thought you make it as challenging as before with having us compete for one bell. Last time you two were fresh new academy graduates who were starting to learn the basics of what it means to be a genin. Last time you didn't know the purpose of the lesson, Kakashi said. This time, however, you two know the purpose of the bell test, and even though you have been separated for two years, I got a feeling your capability to think as a team is better than it was when you two were fresh academy graduates. So, it's only fair that I leave out the disadvantage of having you two compete for one bell. Sounds fair to me, Sakura said. Yeah, and it will be good workout before I retake the Chuanin exams next month, Naruto agreed. 
Up until the finals, teamwork is the main focus of the exam. Bakashi looked as if he smirked under his mask. You really have grown, Naruto. Both physically and mentally. All right, on my mark, the test will begin, Kakashi said. There was a brief pause as everyone waited with anticipation. Begin. Bakashi disappeared in a puff of smoke. Well this is a nice change of pace from our first test, Sakura. Naruto turned to his demigod friends. You guys might want to take cover in the woods. This could get a bit shaky, and I don't want to explain to Chiron why you came back to camp in bandages. Annabeth, Percy, Grover and Clarice and with a little convincing to Thalia they headed to the woods, as did everyone else, leaving Naruto and Sakura to find Kakashi. Naruto, do you know any elemental attacks? Sakura asked. Yeah. Both wind and fire style jutsus. Naruto replied. Fire being an added bonus of being the champion of Hescha. Right, so when you see Kakashi, attack, Sakura said as she put on some gloves. Wait, what? Sakura punched the ground with all her strength, causing it to shatter and break into a large crater around them. In the crater stood Kakashi, who looked like he was just caught off guard. Kakashi wasn't the only one as Naruto turned deathly pale with both fear and shock. Naruto. Sakura shouted. Uh, right. Naruto made a series of hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Naruto took a deep breath and a fireball through his fingers. Kakashi caught on as he dodged the attack. But he didn't have time to think twice as multiple shadow clones came at him with wind sharpened katanas. Naruto. Each clone struck Kakashi as the real Naruto moved in for the final strike. Uzumaki wind sharpened katana barrage. Naruto cut through Kakashi. When Naruto landed on the ground Kakashi was replaced with a large piece of log that was cut to pieces. Okay, where did you go? Naruto said. How about down here? Kakashi's hand shot out of the ground and pulled Naruto downward until from the neck down Naruto was buried and Kakashi jumped out of the ground. That was a nice attempt, Naruto. I must admit, I didn't expect you to be able to use two elements. But it'll take more than that to defeat me, Kakashi said. I know. That's why I was the decoy. Said Naruto before disappearing in a puff of smoke. What? Kakashi responded. Just then Sakura came down with a powerful punch at Kakashi. Kakashi barely dodged the attack as Sakura hit the ground, creating another crater. That was too close, Kakashi responded. Just then the ground cracked under Kakashi's feet before Naruto broke out with a wind power Rasengan. Wind style Rasengan. Naruto yelled as he jabbed Kakashi, sending him soaring through the air, causing great amount of damage. Kakashi hit the trees in the wooded area so hard it would kill a normal person. However, Kakashi disappeared in a puff of smoke. Shadow clone, Naruto grumbled. Why am I not surprised? Hidden in the woods Kakashi rested. That was too close, Kakashi thought. It didn't look complete, but it amazed me that Naruto was able to infuse wind chakra into the Rasengan. Neither Master Jiri Aya nor Minato Sensei was able to do that. Not only that, but Sakura's training seemed to have increased her strength to match Lady Hokage. Kakashi sighed. I was hoping not to use this, but it's obvious I can't hold back against my students. Kakashi pushed up his headband so his covered eye was uncovered, revealing a scar that went through the eyelid. When he opened the eye, it revealed to be red with a ring around the pupil, and on the ring was three Tomex. That was intense, said Thalia. I thought Naruto and Sakura had him that time. It'll get worse by now, said a teen wearing sunglasses and a hooded trench coat that covered most of his face known as Shino. By now Kakashi Sensei realized he can't afford to hold back anymore and will sing his full strength. Too bad that was a clone. We could have gotten the bell by now, Naruto said. Yeah, but we can't expect much different from Kakashi Sensei, Sakura said. We need to catch him off guard somehow. Naruto folded his arms and started thinking. All it did though was made Naruto wish he could prank Tantalus again. Pranking his former temporary activities director seemed easier than trying to come up a way to catch Kakashi off guard. Naruto thought of having Sakura perform Jinjutsu, but then he thought of Kakashi's Sharingan eye. By now Kakashi probably uncovered it, realizing hell needed. Kakashi will be able to see through and copy the Jinjutsu with ease. Naruto turned to the lake. It was clear as day and the sun reflected off it, almost creating a rainbow. If only we could use Iris' message, Naruto thought. It'll be something Kakashi Sensei won't see coming, and even if he try to use his Sharingan, it's not a Jutsu, so he can't copy it. Then Naruto got an idea. Maybe they can use Iris' messaging. The gods visits the elemental nations, right? So their domains must have some kind effect in this world. Plus, most villages contact each other through messenger hawks and other form of birds, so they didn't need something like Iris' message. So it's not like anyone has tried it before. Naruto checked a pocket seal and unsealed it, hoping he had at least brought what they need. Sure enough, Naruto felt a pouch full of drachmas. Sakura, this may sound crazy, but I have an idea, Naruto said. Kakashi waited for Naruto and Sakura. By now Naruto and Sakura might have come up with a new plan, Kakashi thought. Hey, Kakashi-sensei. 
Kakashi looked to see Naruto standing there. But Kakashi noticed it wasn't Naruto, but it was. In Jutsu probably Sakura's doing, Kakashi made the hand sign. Release. However, the image didn't fade as Sakura appeared. Nice try, Kakashi-sensei, Sakura responded. Not Jinjutsu, so it must be some kind of demigod trick. Kakashi took out two kunais and tossed them at both images. Sure enough when the kunais went through the images and broke them. But as he did more images appeared. Kakashi-sensei. Hey, Kakashi-sensei. Oh, Kakashi-sensei. With no other choice, Kakashi jumped in the air. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Kakashi pulled his mask down enough to blew a fireball at all the images. Now. Naruto and Sakura jumped from above and body slammed Kakashi into the ground. Naruto nicked the bells as they jumped off. Kakashi looked up, both Naruto and Sakura had a bell now. We pass. Naruto grinned. Kakashi sighed. Yes you did. It's over. Anabeth asked as everyone showed up. Yep. Naruto said. The Shadow Clone Iris message plan worked and Iris got a dozen drachmas in return. Iris message? Lee asked. The form of demigod communication, Annabeth said. In our world, a demigod can't use technology without attracting monsters, so we use Iris rainbows to message each other like a two-way video communication. To be honest I didn't know it would work, Naruto laughed. Thank the gods it did. Either way, you two passed, Kakashi said. You display excellent teamwork and shown me how well the two of you have improved. Naruto grinned and rubbed the back of his head. He and Sakura passed and their team was reunited. Nothing could go wrong. Kakashi offered Naruto and his friends Raymond his treat, but Niji reminded Naruto of their dinner at the Hyuga compound, forcing Naruto to turn down the offer. Since the borrowed katana didn't feel right in Naruto's hand, he gave it back to Tenten, thanking her for letting him use it. In return, Tenten let Naruto keep the kunais and shuriken she gave him. Now Naruto, Percy, and Grover stood in front of the entrance into the compound in their best clothes. Annabeth, Claris, and Thalia left for the compound earlier to get ready themselves. The Hyuga compound was more like a mini village within the Leaf Village, surrounded by walls and one entrance and exit. Inside were low buildings with an outside hallway that led out to the gardens. However, the living area was split off into two areas one lives by the main house members and the other were the branch members. Of course, whenever a child born into one house lost their parents must move in with the closest relatives even if that family member lives in the other housing area until they are old enough to live in their own living space, as is the case of Niji, who is from the branch family, but after his dad died when he was five, Niji who was allowed to move in with his uncle and cousins who were in the main house. There were also other arranged living arrangements set for Hyuga kids that Naruto never quite understood. Like how Nejis and Hinata's fathers were born twins, and yet Hinata's father who was born first end up in the main family and Nejis' father who was born second was placed in the branch family. Naruto never quite understand much how that worked out, since both Hinata and her sister Hanabi were raised as main house members. Well we better head in, Naruto said. Right, Grover agreed as they headed into the front entrance. So Naruto, do you know where we're supposed to meet for dinner? Percy asked. Uh, Naruto stopped, realizing he didn't. Naruto. Niji walked up to them. My uncle sent me to find you three. Thank gods, Naruto muttered. What? Nothing, Naruto responded. So lead us to the eating area. Im hungry and Im looking forward to dinner. Niji stared at Naruto, but shrugged it off and led them to where they were going to eat. Claris, Annabeth, and Thalia was already sitting at the table with Hinata, Hinata's father Hiyashi, and a girl who was Hinata's younger sister, but looked more like her father than Hinata. Claris and Thalia looked discomfort able, and Naruto saw why. Apparently he actually lend the girls kimonos, which the daughter of Ares and the daughter of Zeus was not used to wearing. Annabeth seemed fine, but Naruto got the feeling that his aunt didn't like it any much better since she's not normally the type of person to dress in such clothes. Naruto noticed that Percy was gaping at the girl's appearance mostly at Annabeth's, and Naruto jabbed his friend in the side to get him out of his daze. Ah, Naruto, nice of you to join us, he actually said in a friendly tone. And you two must be Percy Jackson and Grover Underwood. Yes sir, Grover and Percy responded. They sat down, as did Niji. Soon they had food served. Tsunade was working on paperwork when she heard knocking at the door. Come in. Bakashi came in. So how did the test go? Tsunade asked. Interesting to say the least, Kakashi responded. You won't think Sakura and Naruto Haven trained together in two years. Is Hichuan in exams ready? Tsunade asked. I believe so, Kakashi said. Great. I managed to talk to Jiri Aya about getting Fukasaku to give Naruto time off for the Chunin exams, Tsunade said. Here's something else, Kakashi interrupted. During the test, Naruto was able to infuse Wind Chakra into the Rasengan. Tsunade paused. Are you sure? Yeah, Kakashi said. It's not complete, but it came to be obvious that he has gone farther in the process than both Master Jiri Aya and Minato-sensei ever could have reached. Tsunade leaned back on her chair. All right. 
Thanks for the information. Inner went rather well. Hiashi asked of the quest his daughter took part in, wanting to hear it from those that were there. Naruto practically bragged how Hinata shot many shark men to dust with one hit and got a perfect bullseye on Polyphemus' eye while riding on Tyson's shoulders surrounded by man-eating sheep. They also brought up how Hinata was the first hero ever to destroy a hydra with a paperbum attached arrow, although Hinata explained it was Naruto's idea it still impressed Hiashi, Niji, her sister Hanabi. By the end of the meal Naruto, Percy and Grover thanked Hiashi before heading out of the compound to Naruto's apartment. They were wakened the next morning by a knock at Naruto's door. I'm coming, Naruto groaned. He opened the door to see Shizun at the door. Shizun, what are you doing here? Naruto asked. Is something wrong? No Naruto. I'm here to take you to Tsunade's office, Shizun said. She has an offer for you. At that moment Percy and Grover walked up to the door. Your friends can come with you, Shizun said before leaving. Naruto got ready rather quickly. Percy and Grover decided to stay behind, deciding to wait for the girls who were coming over. Naruto headed to Tsunade's office. When he opened the door to her office, H noticed that Jiraiya, Kakashi, and Sakura were there. Uh, what's going on? Naruto asked. What's Pervy Sage doing here? Nice to see you too, kid, Jiraiya grumbled, still not too happy to hear Naruto's nickname for him. Naruto, we summoned you here because we got news that will impact both you, Sakura and Kakashi involving Sasuke, Tsunade responded. That caught Naruto's attention. With everything going on, he almost forgot about Sasuke. That's dead, isn't he? Sakura asked the question on their mind. Orochimaru took over Sasuke's body for a vessel. No, actually on contrary, Tsunade said. It seems Sasuke has killed Orochimaru. What? Naruto and Sakura asked. From what I gathered, Sasuke still had months before Orochimaru's need to transfer. But for some reason Sasuke decided to end Orochimaru then and there, Jiraiya said. Then where's Sasuke? Naruto asked. Any idea where he went? No, unfortunately. Sasuke seemed to have disappeared from this world, Tsunade responded. Not only that, but I got word that the Akatsuki has seized their activities in trying to get the tailed beast and have also vanished, Jiraiya said. It's as if some unknown source decided to persuade Sasuke and the Akatsuki to change their plans and disappear before we could catch up. Naruto froze when he heard this. Only one person came to his mind who might have found a way to contact Sasuke and the Akatsuki. Could Kronos gain enough strength to contact Sasuke and or the Akatsuki from the elemental nations? Naruto thought before shaking his head mentally. No, even if Kronos managed to persuade the Akatsuki to join his cause, he won't be able to persuade Sasuke to join his cause with Sasuke. Tsunade noticed Naruto was acting strangely. You have an idea who might be behind this. I have one Kronos, Naruto said. He'd been gathering power and strength since his children chopped him up into pieces especially since an uncle of mine has joined his cause. But I don't see how Kronos would be able to get both Sasuke and the Akatsuki to work together without having to let Sasuke kill Itachi first. So there might be another person behind this, Kakashi said. It's possible, Tsunade said. Naruto, there is something else, Jiraiya said. I'm here to offer you to take you to Toad Village where the Toad summonings live to learn how to enter Sage Mode. Sage Mode? Naruto asked. Basically it's a power brought on by absorbing chakra from nature itself, Jiraiya said. It can strengthen your body and power. Naruto was shocked. Are you serious? I just got back and you want to take me away. It's only temporary, Jiraiya said. And you can return to the Leaf Village to take the Chuanin exams if you choose and return to the Land of the Gods for the summer. But if you haven't learned Sage Mode before next summer, you'll have to return after your summer session to continue it. Naruto was shocked. Jiraiya was offering his a way to be stronger. It was too good to be true. But at the same time, Naruto got this feeling that if he did master Sage Mode, it might help when Kronos rise and maybe even help Grover find Lord Pan. Maybe it can also give Naruto time to learn his father's famous jutsu. And I talked to my friends about it. Naruto asked. Tsunade smiled. Sure, Naruto. You don't have to give us your answer until tomorrow. The moment Naruto returned to his apartment and found Annabeth, Thalia and Claris with Percy and Grover and told them the news. Oh, wow, said Percy. Are you going to take the offer? Annabeth asked. I don't know. It's tempting, Naruto said. If I master it, it could come in handy in case Kronos does rise. But you don't know if you want to go on with it? Thalia asked. Naruto shrugged. I never been the type who goes for power right off the bat. Heck, I felt how powerful the fleece was, but I didn't think about keeping it for myself. Well, I say you should go with it, Clara said, which shocked everyone. Better for you to learn how to use nature chakra than one of Kronos' men. Here's something else, Naruto said. I can master sage mode, it means I can draw power from nature itself, which could allow me to link myself to Pan's power. Grover rose when he heard this, you mean sage mode could be the key to finding Pan. 
If I can, Naruto reminded him. There is also the issue of Zeus. Nothing against your dad, Thalia, but he never been too keen about me being in the other world since I have the nine tail fox sealed in me. Well, Zeus will have to get over it, Thalia said. Whatever the choice you made, I'm behind you on it, said Percy as everyone nodded. Just be sure to come back to our world. If I do this, I'll be sure I do, Naruto responded. That night, Naruto didn't get any ounce of sleep, trying to make his mind up. After an hour of Percy and Grover being asleep, Naruto took out his locket compass. He opened the first slot revealing the compass part of it. Naruto wasn't surprised to see that the needle was spinning out of search control, as if struggling to find where it was supposed to point at. The compass was enchanted to find Polyphemus Island, but since he was in the elemental nations, the compass called and find Polyphemus Island as Polyphemus Island isn't found in the elemental nations. Naruto concentrated on the hidden lock pens in the compass, unlocking it from inside as the secret compartment popped open. Inside the secret compartment were two pictures of his parents. Would you approve me doing this? Naruto thought. Then he remembers the Gutsy Ninja, a book that his grandparents gave him, saying that it was their favorite book. They had expected Naruto to be like the character in the book. It was one of the reasons he was named Naruto. Knowing what the character in the book would do, Naruto closed his compass and went to bed. The next day, Naruto, Percy. Grover, Annabeth, Thalia, Clarice, and Hinata, since she was a camper at Camp Half-Blood, Naruto felt she should know his decision, was at Tsunade's office, with Tsunade, Jiraiya, Kakashi, and Sakura. There was also a small but elder toad that stood up on his hind legs, wearing a cloak, and had grey hair and moustache. Jiraiya introduced Naruto to the toad known as Fukasaku, who was like a higher-up leader than even Gamabunta. Well, boy. Fukasaku asked. What's your decision? At this point, Naruto had gotten so used to talking toads that this one didn't surprise him. I decided to take up on your offer, as long as I can attend the Chunin exams a month from now and can return to Camp Half-Blood, Naruto said. Very well, Fukasaku said. I also talked to Percy and Grover and they will move into the Hyuga compound until the week is up and they go home, Naruto told Tsunade. Very well, Tsunade responded. I suggest you say your goodbyes, Naruto, Jiraiya said. It'd be a year at least until you see THM again. Naruto nodded. Annabeth was the first to say goodbye with a hug. You be careful, Naruto. I will auntie, Naruto said in a joking tone. You just make sure everyone survives until I come back. Next was Percy. Try not to destroy any schools while I'm gone, Naruto told Percy. I don't think your mom can keep you in New York if she runs out of schools to put you in. Percy chuckled. You don't have to tell me twice. Grover, good luck on finding Pan, Naruto told Grover. Grover blot sadly. I sure will. Thalia, I help you get your second chance in life, so I expect you to make good use out of it, Naruto said. Because if I find out Kronos turned you into the demigod that will destroy Search Olympus, I will hunt you down and deal with you myself. Thalia chuckled. I'll keep that in mind. Clarice, don't let your dad get to you, Naruto said. You're stronger than he thinks you are. Whatever, legacy boy, Clarice muttered. And Hinata and Sakura, I'll be seeing you two again when I take my Chunin exams, Naruto told them. Well, if that's all, we better be going, Fukasaku said. Fukasaku made the hand signs. See you guys next summer, Naruto said before Fukasaku slammed his web hand on the ground. Seals appeared around them, and there was three puff of smokes that covered Fukasaku, Naruto, and Jiraiya. When it cleared, they were gone as Naruto was on his own new journey. This is it for the movie.